get a little one on one on that camera there. Oh, Yeah. Less than that time frame. No? Hello. Hello, everybody. Good morning. So we're going to go ahead and get started in just the next couple minutes. Uh, feel free to make sure you grab a coffee and some food and then find yourself. As we kind of wait for folks to uh, grab their cup of coffee here, if you all have a mobile device or a laptop, please go to www.menti.com. And when you go to that website, either on your phone or on your laptop, um, you should see this same, same screen. And we're just going to do a couple opening, welcoming questions and do some polling of the audience. So once you get to that uh, menti.com, you're going to use that code 84518007. And I see we have a bunch of folks who are already logged in and who are letting us know where they are traveling in from. So we're going to give you a couple minutes to get that on your phone or on your laptop. All right, looks like lots of folks are joining in. I can see 16, 17 folks. I see more of you out there, so we'll give it just a minute. Once we're all logged in, it'll go a bit faster. Menti, www.menti.com. So are the last of us are logging in. Uh, Aloha, Ekomo, Mai. Oh, Kerry, you know what? Atayaka. Welcome. We're so happy to have you this morning. Good morning. My name is Kerry Lampier. I work for the Sika Tribe of Alaska and the Southeast Alaska Tribal Ocean Research Network. And we're so happy to welcome you to day three of the conference, Wednesday. Looks like we've got 34 folks signed in. So, what this is doing is creating a word cloud of where folks are coming in from. So, the more people from a place, you're going to see that be a little bit larger. So, of course, with Southeast Conference being held in Juneau, we see lots of folks from Juneau in. But as we start to look through who we have here today, we're seeing great representation. We've got tribes from our northernmost area, Yakutat. Who's from Yakutat today? The back corner here, welcome. And all the way in our southernmost area here in Southeast, not like Hat Lab. Yeah, Taylor, I didn't quite see you. Thanks for joining us, Taylor. And of course, everyone in between, right? We've got Skagway. Yeah, we have Ruben, Pluckwong is Daniel, Puna folks, Ricky. Yeah, coming down. I don't know if I see Brandon yet, but I know Petersburg is here. We got the Wrangell crew here, folks from Sika. All right. Can we go to the next question, please? All right. So our next question is how many Southeast environmental conferences have you attended? Is this your first? Have you been to two or three? Three or four or more than five.
All right. So it looks like for the majority of us, many of us, this is our first environmental conference. So thank you all for coming. As you saw on the last slide, we're coming in from all over. As Tony Gallego pointed out yesterday, there's a lot of new staff that have joined the tribes and that are here networking together, learning from each other. And for the folks who are in the more than five, who's in the more than five? More than five, yeah. Oh, I, I hand that up. I was just talking to him. I'm in the four to five. Um, I know the folks that have been here for more than five years are so grateful and so happy that those folks in uh, their first year are here and we're so happy we get a chance to work together. All right, here we go. Favorite way to prepare fish. What do y'all think of you doing fresh crack, eating it fresh as poke, like sir likes? Lindsay doesn't like poke though, so don't ask her to go to poke for lunch. Strip. Nice. Whoever wrote smoked correctly, when I first wrote that, I absolutely wrote smock. <laughs> and I was like, you see? That's, I spelled that. Grilled, baked, anything I can share. Love that answer. Thank you. All right, so far it looks like smoked. Uh, the most folks in the audience like to prepare with smoke, but we got a lot of baked and grilled. Um, one thing that I'm seeing up here is there's not just one way to prepare fish, yeah? Lots of ways, yeah? So we're all doing it slightly different ways. Um, you know, and one thing that we see is through language, right? Like some of these may be very similar preparation styles, but we call them something slightly different where we are. So our families are something different. And there's a lot of that through line here at this conference. And because we're here together, we get to share those connections and we get to make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward. Um, that's a big part about what Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday have been. And that's going to be a huge part of the Guardians Network on Thursday and the Cedar Workshop on Friday. So we hope that you're able to continue with us for the rest of the week. If not, uh, we'll still be on Zoom, so we'll be able to connect with you. All right, so this was just a fun warm-up activity. I wanted to make sure everyone was introduced to this software. Um, we may find ourselves using it a few more times in the week. So if there was something about this that didn't work and you want to participate, uh, go ahead and flag me down and we'll find something that works for you. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce our MC for today. She's my coworker at the Pacific Tribe of Alaska, Elizabeth Truman. I hope nobody's sick of hearing from me yet. Um, so this morning, we're gonna start off with a great conversation about capacity building for environmental programs from uh, Chris Whitehead from Ocean and something. It, or the other thing, the thing we're standing on, sorry, that was the word. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Ray, and Cookie and Ida for inviting uh, me and everybody. It's really good to see everyone. Um, I'm in the above five Southeast conferences, I think 10. Um, I know most of you, and it's great to see faces. Um, yeah, there you go. Do I know? Okay. Um, and yeah, just really excited to see everyone face to face today. We spent a lot of time on Zoom and uh, different calls, and I think. Um, is it not working? Oh, there you go. Uh, better? Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to go over a couple um, ways that we can build sustainable environmental programs. One of the things that I've really worked on over the last 17 years of my career working with tribes, not only in Alaska, but in Washington, is building program sustainability. And one of the hardest things to do is to sustain long-term program success. Um, things that we've done in the past are building large networks and collaborations that really help support a lot of the environmental work you guys do. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm originally from Southern California. I lived in Hawaii for a long time going to school. Um, worked in Washington with, with tribes doing a lot of aquaculture, um, setting up uh, shellfish farms, um, and then came to Alaska in 2013 and been working with Ray ever since. And one of the main things that him and I have been really focusing on is um, building these programs like this conference, like the Cedar Network, like the Guardians Network, um, to unite a lot of the tribes together to create kind of a one voice and to get some of our policies and uh, environmental priorities um, seen through. Um, so 
So I've got five kind of key things we're going to talk about when we talk about building programs to success. Um, one of them is identifying um, environmental priorities. So a lot of you have already done that. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, another thing is developing a program plan. And the key things with the program is you're really going to want to focus on what funding is available, what your staffing looks like, and how you're going to implement any of your projects. So these are three critical components that we'll talk about with planning. And then consistently secure funding, right? That's the name of the game. All of us are on soft funding, most of us. Um, and until appropriations or other things happen, that's going to be the name of the game for a long time coming. So how do you consistently secure funds to support your programs? And then integrating your projects. So a lot of people have different projects, um, but how can you integrate different funding sources to all kind of connect to your different environmental priorities that you want to see succeed? And the last thing, and probably one of the most critical, is how you're going to collect all this information and share it and be able to manage all these projects in a way that um, is sustainable. So as you have turnover and, and people come and go, how are you going to keep continuity with your data collection and your project management? Who out here has had uh, people come on and get hired and start a project and the data just lives on their laptop on the cell notebook and is gone after they start it for a beat? Yeah, right, lots. So that's that's one of the main things that we've been focusing on is how to build that continuity so you don't have to recreate the wheel and how you can leverage some of those projects. So we start with environmental priorities. Most of you have an ETEP. Raise your hand if you have an ETEP already done with EPA. So most, most of the tribes. Another thing you can do is engage with the community to decide on what those environmental priorities would be. Um, you're going to want to look at what the short term, what the long term priorities look like. So, is it something that you can tackle in the next three to five years, or is it 10 years down the road, or even longer? Um, so, identifying those, those timelines with your priorities is critical in moving forward with your planning stage. And then, are they feasible? Can you actually do these things? And what are some actionable steps you can take to, to move forward and move the needle down the road? Can you actually implement some of these, these projects, these priorities? And then uh, one of the things to note throughout this whole presentation, anything you see highlighted in red is kind of a takeaway from the slide. Um, so one of the things for this one is really uh, finding those regional um, concerns. So for example, with the Cedar Network, you know, PSP and, and have monitoring was a regional effort that everybody's kind of contributed to. And that's gotten uh, a lot of traction and a lot of support. So identifying those concerns and partnering with uh, other tribes in your region is going to be critical in moving forward and, and having that sustainability. So we move on to program planning. You know, it's really, again, kind of, there's a lot you can do with, with planning out a program. And if you really had to tease out three main things to think about, it's the funding, your staffing requirements, and your implementation. Without those three components, you really can't do much. And like I mentioned, all the soft dollars that we're all forced to, to use to implement programs um, really makes it kind of a consistent um, goal to constantly find grants and finding new funding sources. So with your current funding, it's really good to look at, you know, what are your timelines, what are your objectives, um, what are the limitations with the funds you currently have? And then after you kind of assess that and figure out where your gaps are, what are some new identified funds that you can tackle? Um, building an overlap. So you want to make sure that your funds overlap one another and you're constantly looking you know, three years down the road for the next funding source. You don't want to start a grant that's uh, or a project that's three years long and then on year three, start looking for more funds to, to continue. You want to always be thinking three years ahead. And this is for, for management and for admin um, and for folks maybe not on the ground that are doing some of the work, but for a lot of you uh, coordinators and leaders out there. And then if you can find funding sources that address two or more of your priorities, that's the idea. We'll talk about how to integrate those here in a little bit too. Um, and this will never stop. This is something you're gonna always be doing. Most of you that I've known for 10 plus years have always been looking for grants, always trying to uh, move it to the next step. Um, and I don't see that really stopping. I wish we could just get appropriations and those hard dollars to fund a lot of the great work we do, but as most of you know, everything is soft money. So. Um, and then the staff, like you have the right staff in place. One of the bottlenecks, it used to only be funding was one of the bottlenecks, but now we're finding that staffing is becoming a huge issue. Who has open positions at their community right now? Right, almost everybody. 
So it's one of the hardest things right now is finding qualified people to do some of this work. Some of the creative ways that we've been discussing with different groups is um, really teasing out a lot of that workload. What are, what are stuff that can be done on the ground? Um, what stuff that can be done remotely, some of the administrative work? And um, can you hire some seasonal or part-time? Do they have the right training and tools needed to, to complete the jobs? And then moving on to implementation, once you have your funding and your staff in place, you have a, a system in place to track how you're actually going to do this project. Can you track the milestones? Can you track the budget? Can you track uh, the timeline of, of completing the project? Um, and then are you able to adapt? There's going to be changes. As anybody knows, if you have a, a three-year project or a five-year project, the way you write it in year one might not really be how it turns out in year three or four. Do you have the ability to change? And can you adapt? And is there a plan B? What are you going to do when staff turns over? What are you going to do if, uh, if you know certain policies become in place and you can't complete the project? Um, so those are critical to think about when you talk about planning. And then, like Tony mentioned yesterday, you know it's it's really important just to keep moving forward, um, no matter what. Even if the project seems like it's not going to go anywhere, or you run into a lot of obstacles. Completing the project and being able to leverage that in the future is critical to, to gaining that success. Okay. Is that better? Okay, I'll shrink down. The rest of them are uh, broken. Or you can take off the stand. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, this is probably the most important um, piece to any of the work we do is funds, right? It's money. How do we continue to do a lot of this work? Um, it's all with these soft dollars I mentioned. And again, if you look at the, the bold pieces in red, it's really this consistent funding from multiple sources is going to give you a success in the program. Um, as you know, 17 years of doing this, this has been one of the main focuses of, of the work that I really focus on is trying to find uh, integrated ways to maximize your funding. And that's you know, funding from agencies to pilot projects to universities to partnerships um, to private donors to anything you can think of. And really, it all kind of starts with your IGAP program to build your capacity. And then as you move down the road and you start collecting more funds and build more projects, these are just some examples of uh, agencies that I've used and uh, our groups have used to find um, support for their projects. So the, the key part of this is once you kind of step into the million, you know, couple million dollar projects, you really don't want to build partnerships to, uh, to support a lot of that. As you get more funds and more, uh, uh, more support from different agencies, having those partnerships um, really plays a valuable role in, in your success. And then, Integrating your projects. This is probably the one of the other critical things. If you get a lot of these projects off the ground, a lot of these funding sources, you don't want to have to do a ton more work for everything you get funded for. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only two or three people in the office to do this work anyway. Maybe there's more, um, but you don't want to actually keep adding workload, even though you're bringing in funding. So how can you stay focused on your priorities and then identify funding sources that overlap to these different priorities so you can constantly support some of the work you want to do. So for example, um, if it's salmon habitat res restoration is your priority, you know, there's wetland program funding you can look at, there's water quality program funding you can look at, you can engage with tribal youth. Um, if you're doing enhancing subsistence resources like Hooligan, um, like for example, on the catch or catch a can with Yakutat, um, you know, you can look at doing VDNA projects, you can also look at water quality, you can look at developing a climate adaptation plan that speaks to it. All of these different pieces of funds that can come in to support um, your program are really critical as if they can overlap. It really streamlines and makes it more efficient for you guys to operate um, in that way versus going after individual projects for individual, individual granting sources for individual projects because you're going to just create a bunch of extra work. Does that make sense? Okay. So another example of integrating a project that we talked about, um, catch a can with Yakutat. Um, this one is actually up in Chugach. So they wanted to do enhancing their, their shellfish population and having more access to shellfish resources, uh, similar to what we've done in Southeast. 
So they've gotten some projects off the ground that um, since they do have a hatchery in the sewer, uh, they looked at growing some um, some seeds, some little neck and, and butter clam seed, and then setting up shellfish gardens at certain sites in South Central. Um, they also realized that the PSP and, and biotoxins were going to be an issue similar to what we have in Southeast. And so they've also set up a network with uh, bringing in all the, the communities, the seven communities in South Central to do phytoplankton monitoring and set up a laboratory in the sewer. So this is an example of how they really the focus was more shellfish opportunities for subsistence harvesters, but they really needed to address all these other things. And these are the different funding sources they could pull in um, to do that. So again, it's integrating projects focused on those priorities. So now you've got your funds, you've got your staff, you're integrating your projects. How are you going to actually manage all this? Um, one of the biggest things is data management and project management. So when you want to apply for more funds, it's really, really valuable if you've got a way to showcase some of the work you've already done. Either that's a, through some of your raw data that you've collected, through some analysis, or through some project management um, tools that you can set up. And so we've set up some, some of those tools and have those available. Um, but really, we're going to talk about the uh, phytoplankton monitoring that we're doing on, on Friday, where we have a new database for that that we're going to introduce. Um, but any, any data that you collect, if it's water quality, phytoplankton, invasive species, you want to be able to um, collect that information easily and accessibly and have it stored in a place where it's not going to go away when someone needs that project and share it with your community. So there's there's different ways to do that. And then tracking your project performance. Again, this is really valuable for you managers that are going to have the staff underneath you that are going to do a lot of this work. Um, you're going to want to track your objectives, your milestones, your timelines, your budgets, what staff you have uh, involved in each of your projects, and what the deliverables are. And for granting agencies, this is really valuable. So when you go to turning reports and projects, um, you have a place that um, you can pull from. So we have a great tool for that too that we'll talk about um, later this week as well. And really, again, it's to leverage all of this data. So when you apply for your next round of funds, you have a place to grab stuff from and you're not scrambling to pull all that together. This really just helps with a lot of the efficiencies. Um, moving through as, as you start to scale up with uh, more than just your IGAP program or just one or two other, other projects. So Ocean and Earth, this is the team at o &E. um, Most of you know a lot of these people on the screen, um, which, is, which is great. Um, John Harley is going to be talking next. He does a lot of our data management. Um, Liz Tobin, who uh, worked here for a bit in Juneau and now at the Jamestown Tribe. Uh, she's an oceanographer and helps with a lot of our projects up in the Arctic. Um, Esther Kennedy, who a lot of you know, she does a whole slew of stuff between grant writing and, and uh, water quality. Um, Spencer Fire, he's a, a chemist out of actually Steve Morton's lab back in the day, um, and helps with a lot of our analytical stuff. I uh, heard from Meredith yesterday about EGMA. She's a fisheries biologist. She does a lot of great trainings and work uh, throughout the state. Um, Jeff Moskowitz, he's our GIS analyst and um, can help pull together a lot of the spatial data for you. Uh, and Megan it does a lot of our work with uh, traditional foods and, and um, cultural policy and, and different work with that. Um, so it's a great team to work with. Uh, you don't, you know, it's not just me, <laughs> which is good anymore. Um, and so we're able to help a lot of communities um, gain this um, this capacity. Um, some of the services that uh, some of the processes we just talked about are some of the services we do work with a lot with. And again, these. Uh, ones bolded in red are really the focus. You know, we do a lot of grant writing and management, um, helping go from that first stage of IGAP funding to building more long term um, sustainability. Um, a lot of technical support, so providing input on projects and doing trainings um, and different courses we can offer, um, helping set up traditional food security programs. So. Um, integrating uh, traditional foods program into your environmental program so you can utilize uh, staff time and, and efforts when you're out collecting samples for water quality or things to be able to um, bring back traditional food and distribute to the community. Um, we do a lot of adaptation planning, um, vulnerability assessments, so things that you guys have probably all started working on. Um, so all the great work that's gone on in SICA and the Central Council with developing different templates. Um, and then again, the data management and project management, um, anything you're collecting, if you have uh, 
species or you want to start working on different projects and collect data, either water quality or fisheries or invasive species, um, we have some programs set up to do that. And if you have something um, new, you know, we can also set up custom uh, databases for you. Uh, some of our project partners we've worked with over the, the past uh, few months um, stretches all the way from uh, the Bering Sea, uh, that little dining island, all the way down to central coast California. Um, and this is really great to see. I mean, most of the communities we work with are, are tribal organizations or um, First Nations in British Columbia. Um, we do a lot of the work with uh, the Guardians programs there um, and trying to unite um, all these groups together. Uh, in an effort we're calling Boat for Tabaha, which uh, Ray and I talked with uh, Aaron Poe, who is he here yet? Mara, okay. So I didn't come up with Boat for Tabaha name, that was Aaron who gave him props for that, but uh, this is something Ray and I have been talking about for a long, long time, is building um, these networks uh, throughout the state and then eventually stretching out uh, throughout the West Coast. And the goal is to, um, you know, as you guys come together and we've seen with the Cedar workshops and the Cedar network, and we see this happening in South Central um, and some other of these groups that we're working with. Um, there you go. There you go. Um, you know, we're starting to see that there's really a lot of value in not only these regional and statewide initiatives, um, but now with you know linking these together throughout the West Coast, this really helps to move a lot of uh, policy changes when tribes come together and it's one voice and one issue. Because the communities down in central uh, California, the Tribal Marine Stewardship Network, have the same issues, or maybe just a little bit different than Washington, British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, South Central Alaska. But all of it, everybody can share their stories and share the, their projects and figure out ways to assist each other. Um, and one of our big goals is to find some funds to support this type of network. Um, so we're hoping to be able to host some sort of training where we can get all these groups together and talk about. What goes on in you know Heidelberg versus what goes on in uh, Nome versus what goes on in uh, Santa Cruz, California. Um, so it'd be really interesting to have you know these folks all come together and, and you guys um, be uh, on board with a lot of this work. So so yeah. So with that, I'll answer any questions. But I appreciate everyone's time. No question. All right, Chris, get off easy. <laughs> you can mop it after, like at lunch or something. Really, really take up take up some time. Um, up next we have John Harley. I know I'm really excited about this presentation. Um, because herring are such an important resource for for all of our communities. Um, so up next, we have the environmental drivers of variability in herring spawn timing. And here you go. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here at the um, Southeast Environmental Conference. I know I look forward to this every year. Um, I recognize a lot of you, but for those of you that don't know me, my name's John. I'm a researcher at the University of Alaska Southeast. Um, and I uh, want to start off by acknowledging that I'm uh, blessed and fortunate to um, live and work on the Blinke Ani and uh, the um, traditional lands of the Akwan peoples, um, University of Alaska Southeast. Um, and hopefully we'll have this presentation coming up here pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some work that I've been doing with uh, the Southeast Alaska um, Tribal Ocean Research Group, um, and as well as a couple other um, agencies from around the state of Alaska and um, uh, British Columbia First Nations Group. Um, and uh, you can go on the next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to start off by talking about harmful algal blooms um, instead of pairing. I tricked you. Um, so I've been working with the, 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 the Cedar Network for, for a couple of years now, and I'm specifically looking at some of their um, shellfish toxicity data. 
And so um, I want to start out with just uh, explaining, I don't think we've had uh, enough talks about harmful algal blooms over the years. And so I'm just going to explain <laughs> what a harmful algal bloom is. Um, it's this, uh, these, these proliferations of these single celled um, uh, cyanobacteria or phytoplankton. Um, they can cause these big, you know, discolorations in the water. Um, but but um, in, in the Cedar Network, um, a lot of what we're concerned about is their ability to produce toxins. They produce things like um, paralytic shellfish poison, um, demolic acid, Okadaic acid, things that make your tummy not feel very good, but also um, might be lethal. So um, Alaska has had more than 150 cases of paralytic shellfish poisoning um, since 1993. And um, if you pull up that graph, um, you'll see that uh, they kind of come and go in, 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 in waves. Um, sometimes we have major outbreaks, sometimes we have um, just a few cases a year. Um, but uh, it's important to recognize that, um, that Alaska natives, as part of a of subsistence um, harvesting lifestyle, are more than 10 times more likely to um, have uh, and show symptoms of paralytic shellfish poisoning than, than other people. Um, and so if you uh, scroll through this next couple, a lot of these um, uh, cases and outbreaks have occurred in um, uh, traditional, or excuse me, in um, Alaska Natives over the years. There was a big outbreak in Metlakatla in the early 2000s. Um, There's a couple um, cases in Haines, a couple people died. Um, and so this is something that we're actively dealing with. Um, it, is, it is an issue that we need to be, be mindful of. Um, and um, it's something that that uh, that we're concerned about. Uh, oh, and uh, so the, the Cedar Network, um, uh, in kind of response to to this um, concerns about shellfish safety, um, Alaska Native tribes came together to form a monitoring monitoring network. Um, I believe it was actually prior to 2016 that kind of the the um, the, the inception of that idea. But um, Nick Ray and Chris and Jen can probably speak more to that. But. Uh, this photo is actually from, I think, 2018. Um, this is a, a part of the Cedar um, workshop that we had in Sitka. Um, I believe it was in 2018. And um, amazingly, we all look younger and more handsome now, I think, uh, than, than we did even four years ago. Um, but you'll recognize a lot of the same faces in this room um, today that were, that were present at that, that meeting um, even back then. Um, except for this guy. I don't know what happened to him. Um, <laughs> should, should get uh, next slide. Um, so, so over the over the past couple of years, the, the Cedar Network has collected a lot of data, and I'm eternally grateful to everybody who has, you know, gone out and sucked a net in the water or gone out and touched gross shellfish in the inner tidal. Um, I'm not gross. I think they're delicious. This is an example of just of blue mussels um, and how much data that the Cedar Network and the Sitka Tribe of Alaska Environmental Research Lab have generated over the years. They run literally thousands of samples um, through, and using that data, we have um, just these. We've gained these uh, really valuable insights into spatial and temporal patterns of harmful algal blooms um, in our region, in Southeast Alaska, and in our communities. And one of the um, things that's come out of this research, um, in addition to collecting uh, the shellfish toxicity data and doing these phytoplankton net toes, um, the Cedar Partners also collect environmental data. So one of the things that we look at is sea surface temperature. Um, and as you can imagine, this shows a very seasonal pattern. We have really warm temperatures in the summer and really cold temperatures in the, um, in the winter. The other thing we collect is salinity. And these two things together, um, we, I, I use to kind of plug into my, um, some, some models using some machine learning and, and stuff that's um, kind of boring unless you're a nerd like me. Um, and we, we use them to kind of predict when and where these um, how harmful algal blooms are going to happen. And it turns out that um, the, the important drivers of these harmful algal blooms in Southeast Alaska that we see are a lot of these variables that the Cedar Partners are collecting. Uh, um, so air temperature, sea surface temperature, SST, um, uh, and then salinity are kind of like the three main drivers of, of these harmful algal blooms in terms of prediction. So we using those three variables along with wind speed here, um, which we can get from, from NOAA or the National Weather Service, um, we can actually um, make pretty good models at predicting when you're where these harmful algal blooms are going to happen. Um, now, the traditional knowledge systems of um, shellfish toxicity are, are something that really interested me um, because I was curious, um, okay, how, you know, this is, this is how I would do it. I would plug in numbers into my computer until my machine explodes. Um, but how, how, like, how else can we approach this problem? Um, how else can we, can we look at this? And so I, I, uh, I did some reading and I came across um, some traditional knowledge of shellfish toxicity, um, which according to the, the, uh, the southern or the southeastern Tlingit, um, they would use the timing of the herring spawn as a um, environmental signal to stop harvesting shellfish. They would call this um, plant month in the sea. Um, and if you uh, have been around for either a herring spawn or a um, harmful algal bloom, uh, or, or an algal bloom in general, not necessarily a harmful one, 
uh, you might notice that plant month of the sea is a pretty accurate description for what we're seeing here. It basically turns um, the ocean green in some cases, um, which is kind of interesting. Herring spawn obviously is also a very um, apparent ecological indicator. If you've ever been down near the beach during a herring spawn, you probably know it before you see it. Um, or, or if you're flying above it, it's just this very um, apparent indicator of, of, of what's happening just under the surface. And so, as I said before, CEDARS collected a lot of data, um, but one of the things that I was most interested in is what happened before 2016. So before we have this really, really cool record of, um, of, uh, of, of shellfish toxicity, what was going on before that? How can we um, kind of back calculate um, what was happening with harmful algal blooms before 2016? And so one thing to know about me is that like I get really kind of twitchy when I don't have a bunch of data to play with. And so it made me really nervous going back before 2016. Can you even imagine? Um, so I have a blog about data science. Um, so that just shows you how much I like playing with numbers. I talk about things like Wordle, uh, how last their summer of 2020 was actually the rainy summer in Juneau. Don't believe the lies from the National Weather Service. Is John here? <laughs> Good, because I was about to call him out. Uh, downtown Juneau, definitely the rainiest summer in 2020. And then I also write about um, doing the ultimate craft beer crawl, uh, which you can hit 25 breweries in the span of six miles. Um, but uh, so that that's that's where the herring come in, um, is, is uh, trying to peer into this pre-2016 era, the ancient time. Um, so, uh, hey, here comes the herring. Uh, go ahead. So um, uh, I took these images uh, uh, from the um, EW Mirror Collection at the Sitka National Historic Park. Um, they don't know exactly when these photos were taken, um, but early 1900, so uh, somewhere between 1900 and 1930 um, is when they believe these pictures were taken. And I'm, I'm showing this just to illustrate that um, people, obviously herring um, is an extremely important uh, resource um, for, for, for everyone, not just the, um, the, the, the wicket, um, but also, you know, uh, people that harvest commercially and, and uh, recreationally. But um, here we have some herring spawn drying on the trees. Um, and then there's a close up image, I believe, um, of some, some herring row. Um, and uh, there's a tradition or an image of the, the Quinca community that was living in Sitka at the time. Um, these images are really cool. If you haven't looked at them already, they're, they're online. You can access them through the Sitka National Historic Park. Um, there's like hundreds of images um, from this early 1900s period that are really, really interesting um, to look at. Um, so one of the things that I was curious about was, okay, you know, we have uh, obviously the, this, this insanely rich history of, of herring harvest. Um, where are these the herring spawn areas? And um, if you look at sort of where the Alaska Department of Fish and Game is monitoring herring spawn, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect um, historically where the herring have been spawning. And so one of the things I looked at was uh, some work that was done by um, Tom Thornton um, uh, back in 2010 um, and, and his group um, looking at um, some herring uh, uh, archives. And um, they show that, okay, we know that, you know, herring spawn, we, we monitor traditionally like in places like Sika Sound, in Huna Sound, um, down in Revilla Channel. Um, but uh, we, we know that the, the herring have traditionally spawned in more places than just that, or a broader range than what we currently see. And so I was uh, really, uh, it piqued my interest to see that a lot of these places that we're now monitoring harmful algal blooms, places like Juno, um, places like Sitka, places like um, uh, uh, Peter, or, um, down here in, in Ketchikan and, and, and Saxman, um, we also have a, a longer history of herring spawn. Uh, and herring spawn data. Um, and so this is the, uh, the, the data that I assembled um, with the help of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and um, the Department of Fisheries um, in, in Canada. Um, these are my uh, co-authors that I'm working with here. Um, some folks at the, uh, Kyle Hebert is here at the Alaska Park Fish and Game. The other folks are from um, uh, DFO in Canada. And so we have this really, really cool data set of um, herring data from all along the, the Northeast Pacific. I say Northeast Pacific, this is the Eastern arm of the Pacific Ocean, a little tricky. Um, but uh, we have all of these uh, sites that people have been monitoring herring spawn at for, um, for, for many, many years. In some cases, more than a hundred years um, worth of herring spawn data. And one thing that's important to point out is um, uh, if you look at the average spawn date, um, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about Julian Day a little bit. Julian Day is basically just like July 1st is one, um, December 31st is 365. So one, two, three, four, 365 days a year. So you can kind of think about, okay, maybe like 50 would be, what is that, like mid-February, um, and then 150 is, uh, is May. So we see this pattern of, okay, as we go from, from um, south to north, 
the herring spawn uh, uh, later in the year. So we have herring spawn down in, Fe in February, like in Puget Sound and, uh, and down in Vancouver Island, all the way up to like our, our April and maybe May herring spawn um, up in uh, the northern reaches of Lincoln Canal. And so that's kind of the pattern that we see here is, is we have this earlier spawn down south and then um, we have later spawning herring um, up north. And this has led to um, something called the silver wave hypothesis, which is that a lot of our migratory animals that we see come up in the summertime are actually following this herring spawn. So things like that are foraging on herring potentially um, or foraging on herring spawn, things like birds, um, seals, marine mammals, um, other fish, predatory fish, um, they're actually following this herring spawn um, along this latitudinal gradient. And so that's uh, kind of an interesting uh, uh, hypothesis. So the answer of when, or so to ask the question of when did the herring spawn, um, we follow this north to south um, uh, gradient, um, typically in this area that I'm looking at between February and June. And um, it appears to be uh, driven by um, the length of the day. Um, and this is uh, research been, been previously published, but it appears to be driven by the length of the day, um, some genetic component, and also like ocean temperature. Um, and there have been uh, uh, seasonal patterns that are, are, are being are, uh, driven by this herring spawn time. So we have the silver wave hypothesis, the migration of birds, the migration of seals, um, things like that. But what if we look at an individual area? Um, so we see that latitudinal gradient from north to south. But what if we look at a single area? So I'm going to show you some data from um, Sick and Sound, um, uh, some, some herring spawn data going back to the 70s. And uh, if we look at this single area, we see that the herring don't always spawn on the, on the same day. Um, each year. So sometimes uh, they, they spawn, you know, like in, in, uh, in it was mid March, sometimes they spawn like in early April. And so if you calculate the average day that they spawn, um, you get this number, which is, uh, which is, you know, some a Julian day that's somewhere around, around 84. And then um, what I'm going to calculate uh, uh, going forward is something called the anomaly or the spawn date anomaly. And so the anomaly is basically the difference between the spawn date for that particular year. So in this year would be 2011. The spawn date on that particular year minus the average spawn date. So we look at the entire year's worth of data that we have. We look at this. The, we calculate an average spawn date, and then we look at that spawn date anomaly. And so on the y-axis here, I'm going to show you the spawn date anomalies. Um, and these are averaged over every single site that I showed you on that map. So um, over 70 um, sites that we have for, for hearing um, spawn timing. And the first thing that um, I wanted to look at was uh, how are these patterns driven by these large scale oceanic processes? So this is something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Oceanic Nino Index, um, formerly the El Nino uh, Southern Oscillation. And so um, and what you can see is that there is a pattern here, um, both, 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 both the PDO and the Oceanic Nino Index, that's showing that in the colder phase of these, um, these big oceanic patterns, so when, the, when, when generally when the water is colder, um, either in the Gulf of Alaska or locally, we see that the herring are spawning later, so we have a positive spawn date anomaly. Um, so the herring are spawning later in the season. And then the warmer years, um, when we have a positive, like a really strong El Nino or a really positive PDO, um, herring are spawning earlier. So we have a negative spawn date anomaly. And so this is the pattern that we see across these big oceanic patterns. Now, these big oceanic patterns drive a ton of things. They drive, you know, prey distributions. They drive um, age distribution, size distributions of these, of these uh, forage fish. Um, but they also are kind of just dependent on, or they're measured by, um, by things like sea surface temperature anomalies. And so one of the things I looked at specifically was the sea surface temperature um, where I could get it um, in these places where the herring are actually spawning. So these are in situ sea surface temperature measurements. And as you can see, we also see this pattern of, okay, when we have a negative uh, sea surface temperature anomaly so that it's colder than we think it's supposed to be, um, we see a, a, a positive um, spawn date anomaly. So in the colder years, the herring are spawning earlier. In the warmer years, the herring are spawning later. And so this kind of uh, matches what we see with those big, broader oceanic scale patterns. So in colder years, when the sea surface temperatures are colder than average, we see the herring responding a little bit later than we, than, we, than we anticipate. And in warmer years, when the water is warmer than we're thinking, the herring are actually responding earlier than we're anticipating. Um, and so these are uh, sort of the important factors that are affecting sea surface temperature, or affecting spawn timing. Um, sea surface temperature um, is, is number one, and then we have those uh, large-scale oceanic patterns, the, the Oceanic Nino Index, or the ENSO, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, one of the things that fell out of my model, actually, was that um, spawn date from uh, last year was actually uh, a really important factor, and also spawn date from two years ago. 
And so these are things um, in, in, a, in modeling, we call this autocorrelation. So when something from the, the previous observation actually affects the current observation. Um, uh, so we, we plugged in, okay, when did the herring spawn two years ago? Was it earlier or later? That actually influences the, the timing of the herring spawn um, in, the, in the current year. And this is just due to the, the, um, the, the nature of herring, how they, how they spawn um, uh, and, and their age class um, distribution. So if, if you were born in a year where the herring spawned later, you're more likely to come back um, with a later spawn timing. Um, uh, they have a, a, that um, pattern sort of like salmon where you know, you're born two years, or pink salmon, born two years later, you come back. So if I was a herring, I was born a little bit late, I might come back a little bit later. So what's gonna happen into the future um, well, this is uh, sea surface temperature from the Gulf of Alaska, um, and this is specifically looking at May through October, um, these summer sea surface temperatures. Um, but as you can see, since 1900, this average sea surface temperature has clearly um, indicates a, a positive trend. Um, and we're seeing a warming of about half a degree, this uh, axis is in Celsius, but um, we're seeing about half a degree Fahrenheit per decade. Um, so that's the projections for the Gulf of Alaska. That's likely what we're going to see here in Southeast Alaska too, at least on a broad scale. And so one of the things that um, you know we, we I'm, I'm working on right now is calculating, um, okay, we, were, we know that the sea surface temperatures affect the timing of the herring spawn. Um, how is that going to affect herring spawn you know, from 2020 to 2100? Are we going to start to see, on average, the herring are spawning earlier than we think that they should be um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a trend? Um, so by the, you know, maybe by the end of 2100, we're seeing herring spawn in March when typically they spawn in mid-April. Um, I would love to be able to go out seven generations with this, um, but unfortunately, the, the, even the best climate scientists in the world can't anticipate what's going to happen in 2210, um, uh, but 2100 is, is the best that I can do for the moment. Um, so this is obviously raises some interesting questions. How will this affect fisheries, subsistence fisheries, herring spawn on kelp? Uh, you know, herring in general fisheries. And then another uh, question is, um, how will this affect kind of the silver wave, this other migratory species that are dependent on the herring spawn um, and, and maybe travel further north um, along that gradient with the herring spawn? How is that gonna affect their timing? Um, now, bringing a full circle back to harmful algal blooms, um, we also know that harmful algal blooms, the season in which we could possibly see them is expanding as well. So harmful algal blooms um, are occurring earlier than anticipated globally, so that that possible bloom window um, is expanding in both directions. So we see them earlier in the year. We also see them later in the year than we've seen them in the past. Um, and this has been seen all over the world with increasing sea surface temperatures. And so one of my, my main research questions and, and what I'm working on right now is, are these things going to co-vary going forward? Um, are we going to continue to see this linkage between the timing of the herring spawn and the, these harmful algal blooms since they're both dependent on sea surface temperature. This is a, a not real data. This is, um, I squiggled this line on PowerPoint last night. So don't, don't think that, don't, don't, get, it, don't get it twisted. Um, but this is, this is uh, the, the question that my models are hoping to answer um, uh, very soon. Um, this is actually what I'm working on right now. So in conclusion, um, these herring spawn date anomalies are driven by um, sea surface temperature changes and large scale oceanic patterns, as well as that autocorrelation I talked about. So the, the time the year before, the time of the year, two years before. Um, this changes in timing uh, may help to inform models of future projections of both herring spawn timing and, and harmful algal blooms. Um, and it kind of just illustrates the robustness and the value of these traditional knowledge systems um, and uh, just to support the, the Western science and the data um, that I'm looking at. Um, it's, it's been uh, really a valuable perspective for me. And with that, I want to thank my, um, my funding agency, which is the Climate Adaptation Science Center, and also my, uh, my department, the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center. Um, uh, you probably saw me wearing that sweatshirt yesterday. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and then I'll take any questions. Like the, the geographic range of herring. That's a that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, you know, it, we do see a lot of, especially here in Southeast Alaska, we do see a lot of um, uh, the, the, the space of um, sea surface temperatures specifically is, is really heterogeneous. Um, so 
uh, here in, in northern Lake Canal, our sea surface temperatures are typically much, much colder than what we see down in Prince of Wales or in Metlakatla. Um, and because of a lot of in the summertime or in the, in the early spring, there's a lot of glacial influence, a lot of um, uh, really, really cold water being pumped in. And so, yeah, you know, maybe maybe the, the like colder areas um, would be sort of a refuge um, for heron spawn. I actually saw a really cool presentation about that at the um, Extreme Events Workshop that was in this room back in March. Uh, somebody was talking about how colder areas, I think it was in Tenneke Inlet, um, or maybe somebody who was here can correct me, but uh, colder areas might serve as these sort of like um, refuges for, for salmon spawning areas when other streams get too hot. Um, and so it, it might be that there's something like that. Um, I, I'm not super familiar with um, sort of changes in geographic span of, of herring spawn, but um, that's a really good question. Yeah. It, uh, sorry, it, so is your question is, is that that have an effect on the temperatures or, or hearing radiation or, or both? Um, uh, the, the, this temperature of the ocean, I mean, because the temperature of the ocean, of course, it's going to affect everything, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that the, um, the 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 temperatures, the changes in temperatures that we're seeing um, have been occurring uh, for for a long time now. Um, since since basically the the um, they've sort of tracked this to um, to industrialization, um, you know, back in the eighteen hundreds, and um, the 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 pace is, has has probably accelerated um, in in some areas, especially in the Arctic. Um, in Alaska, where we're seeing larger increases in temperature than than anywhere else on the globe, really, um, in the in the polar areas of Alaska. Um, but uh, but I think that the, um, the 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 main drivers of this change in temperature are uh, warming due due to climate change, um, and it, it is probably not going to Fukushima. Thanks for the great presentation. I was wondering, and this is a question for Jen. Hamblin and Chris and you and we've heard number number of times um, the need to make the link between the uplands, the terrestrial forests, the rivers and the oceans. And I was wondering if there's part of that in your research, just to better understand the geographic influences of the terrestrial environment on and whatnot. That's a um, a great question, and um, and it's definitely something that I would like to look further into. Um, I I did some um, uh, modeling work with uh, with Dave Dumore um, at the Forest Service um, that we're trying to get published uh, pretty soon about doing some watershed scale analysis of inputs to the marine environment, uh, which then I would then use in my my hump for modeling. Interested in is uh, the um, heterogeneous environment between um, southern and southeast Alaska, um, you know, Prince of Wales, Ketchikan. They don't they don't really have any large scale glacier influence. There's there's glaciers coming from the Unic River, but um, in those areas. Um, there, you don't typically have a glacial influence much more exposed to the open ocean, whereas here in northern Lynn Canal, we have a ton of glacial influence. Our water in Haynes and Skagway is basically a giant river of glacial water. And um, as we see climate change, we see glaciers receding, we see these large-scale patterns in terrestrial um, uh, land changes. It would be really interesting to see what happens with these harmful algal bloom dynamics, um, especially in these heavily glaciated areas like, like Lynn Canal, um, Icy Strait, Glacier Bay. Um, I would really like to set up these long-scale studies to see um, how are these harmful algal blooms going to be changing um, in those sorts of environments. Um, but as to how they're going to affect herring specifically, um, it's a great question, and, and uh, I, I haven't given that much thought um, to those the, to the idea of the terrestrial land use um, or terrestrial land changes affecting herring spawn. Yeah. Yeah, my question is uh, uh, about PCP, the uh, uh, anatomy and physiology of cockle, clams, gooey ducks. Um, I've harvested gooey ducks and cockles all year round, but clams, I've, I've actually stopped harvesting that because of the our families that have been passing from the uh, 
Um, but also understanding too that when I'm out in the field, the shells are breaking. They're, I can't even pull up a cockle without breaking it, even if I go down and try to do it with my hands. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, that's um, that's uh, uh, yeah, you brought up two two really interesting points. One is When we look at the, the toxic data for shellfish, um, uh, uh, have the same patterns of, of shellfish toxicity. Um, things like cockles, um, uh, we, we do see them occasionally are, are toxic during harmful algal blooms, but they also excrete the toxin really quickly. And so in the wintertime, um, cockles are much more likely to, to um, not have high concentrations of toxin. And butter clams, on the other hand, um, they are infamous for retaining the toxin for a really long time. Um, in some cases, several years. Um, as uh, Sir and Lindsay can attest, um, the butter clams uh, at our uh, monitoring sites have now been over the, the limit for human consumption for several years now. Um, and so, as said, and that was generally following some big, big harmful algal blooms we had in 2018 and 2019. Uh, but uh, as to your question about um, the, the shell uh, uh, strength. Um, that's really interesting. At, um, one of the, you know, as you may know, one of the um, the changes that um, uh, that we're predicting sort of globally is uh, uh, with with increasing carbon dioxide temperatures is ocean acidification, and that's something that the Cedar program is is also monitoring. Um, and uh, one of the sort of predictions of ocean acidification in the broad sense is that these organisms that produce these um, calcium carbonate shells, um, things like mollusks. Uh, and crabs, um, they they won't be able to sort of produce as strong of a shell um, because of the chemistry of the ocean um, and is changing. Um, and so, um, it, as far as I know, um, we I don't I don't I think that there's there's a postdoc um, over at UAF that might be looking at this um, up in northern um, in, in New Haven, Skagway, and um, I'd love to get his perspective on this, but. Um, I don't know if anybody's looking at that on the scale of shell hardness here in Juneau. Um, it's really interesting. But was it at every beach or mm -hmm. specific beaches? Because they, they, to me, that kind of shares maybe something's going on in that or just in that one environment. But uh, just to show you another thing about the cockle, is I'm really cautious on making sure that the cockle they like fresh water. But we really got two that they, they have different areas. So when I harvest those, I go out to the river. I go to the river knowing that. A lot of the the uh, PCPs are out of the you know and it's like that just like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a that's a, a a good point as well as um and it's something that um certain Lindsay can can attest to is um. We do biomass uh, surveys on these beaches, and there's there's definitely patterns of where we find certain species. Um, and some of them are more freshwater tolerant, like cockles, so they can they can occur, you know, at the at river mouths and at stream outlets and things like that. Um, and other ones we find in in more specific places with more more marine influence. But yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I all right. Well, thank you, everybody, and feel, please uh, feel free to approach me um, if you have any more questions. Thank you. 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 I'm going to ask everyone to stand up, please. Uh, if you don't know me, I can't sit still for uh, this long a time. And so, um, and I want you to pay attention to what we're going to say. So I'm going to make you do some morning calisthenics. Um, it, it's the, it is the uh, end of the field season. If you haven't looked at the weather, even if you still have work to do, um, too bad. It's, it's getting towards that. So we're going to do some field calisthenics. So if you answer the question is yes, you reach up high. If you answer the question is no, you reach down low. Okay. So how many of you guys did screen temperature monitoring this, this last season? All right, quite a few. That is awesome. ESP monitoring. Yeah, good, good. Um, more quality samples, like beach sampling or anything like that. Excellent. Uh, how many got to do actual stream restoration? There's some awesome. That is great. That is great. 
um, fish sampling or fish counts. Bone count. Yeah, good, 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 good. Um, all right, so this one's horrible, but I have to ask it. How many of you checked your email on a sunny day? Shame, 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 shame. Uh, All right, and then the final one, we've all gotten to have fresh fish, right, this summer? All right, good, good. You can stand or you can sit. It's totally up to you. Um, first off, just one on a and Paula. Thank you very much to the Auk people for letting us uh, be on their land. I live and work here in Juneau. So not just this conference, but life in general for me. Um, and also thank you to the Central Council staff, Ray and your crew. Um, you know, I, I do remember when these meetings were 30, 40 people. And it's still the same amount of work for me to come to this meeting, but I bet it's a lot more work for you guys to organize it now that it's so big. So just thank you very much. Um, we are going to talk about uh, a, a variety of different projects, just a subset of what the Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition does. Um, and kind of give you some uh, avenues for putting pieces together. Sorry. So my name is Rod Cadmus. I'm the director of the Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition. Uh, I've lived and worked in Juneau on watershed sustainability and conservation since 2006. Um, my background is, uh, well, I have a master's in coastal restoration, but honestly, I don't do that for my job. What I do for my job is take big, challenging uh, goals that tribes and community groups have, and I break them down into bite-sized chunks. I'm Rebecca Belmar. I'm the science director at the Watershed Coalition. I've been there for about six years and lived in Juneau just a little bit longer than that. Um, and my background's in watershed ecology and um, water quality monitoring, and I have a PhD in environmental science. So just so you know who the Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition is, um, we're a nonprofit organization, we're based regionally. Um, you all may have remembered once upon a time, there was a Tolwak Watershed Council, a Cape Watershed, or the Sand Watershed Council. Uh, there was one in Skagway, or still is, one in Haiti. They all kind of formed the Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition back in 2005, or joined forces and became one group. Um, and we work on a variety of different things, everything from large scale stream restoration, where we're, we're using heavy machinery to put wood into the stream, to smaller scale stewardship projects, um, science projects, watershed assessment, uh, quite, a, quite a number of projects around the region. Um, and we're a nonprofit. We're not an agency. We're not a tribe. We're not in the whole land. Um, our way of working is with and through you. Um, we cannot do anything we do without our partners. Um, so every project we do has a partner in it, many tribes, many agencies. Um, and honestly, just uh, thank you all for uh, being a part of what we do. And as such, every photo that we're going to show today, every example we're going to put on the, on the screen today, I can't say we own. You know, we, we uh, really our partners own many of the projects that we work on and just want to give them credit um, it, before we even start. But the things that are happening that you're going to see today really belong to other people as well. Thanks, um, and this slide here reflects a lot of what Chris was talking about earlier, um, and it, it shows the, the process of getting to on the ground projects on the ground restoration, and we have to go through, you know, an assessment process finding out what the issues are and where and why prioritizing the next steps based on um, uh, community desires and expected outcomes and feasibility design those projects and then get on the ground and do that implementation. Um, and through all of that, we really need to have um, workforce capacity, both doing the work, um, funding is obviously key, and then that science and planning and logistics just to um, inform all of that work. And so the Watershed Coalition has really been focusing on those three kind of key um, supporting aspects of these projects for the last um, many years. And so uh, the next couple of things that we're gonna talk about kind of highlight how those fit together and um, I'll put all these pieces together. So we're going to give you a few examples of the different projects that we've worked on in the region. And um, I, I last a couple of slides ago, I said that our partners were the most important part of what we do. And so for most of these examples, we have partners in the room or online who are going to join in throughout the time. So um, I've got some folks from the uh, Metla Catla Indian community online, I believe Dustin and Eva and Taylor right here as well. Um, we're, we're, we're going to give them the chance to say something and then uh, towards the end, we're going to actually um, hand over the whole presentation to Ed DeVille, 
with Sean Seat and the Co-op and Digital Stewards Board Partnership to give uh, their perspective as well on the projects that we work with. So my first example is on that island. Um, and uh, we, this is a project that we've been working with the Metlakadla Indian Community Department of Fisheries and Wildlife on. How many of you have been to Metlakadla? It's like another country. And it is in fact another country there. It is a reservation, right? Um, but it's also like another country in different ways. There are some unique uh, geographic, geological and ecological aspects about Metlakadla that do set it aside from Southeast Alaska a little bit. Um, and uh, back in 2019, um, there was, if you guys remember that summer, it was great from like the sunbathing perspective, but not so great from the fish perspective. It was low, low water flows. Um, and many Metlakalan uh, systems are very rain fed, so they were having very low returns of fish. Um, and the Metlakalan Indian community, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, um, uh, of course, the Southeast Alaska Fish Habitat Partnership, which we're on the steering committee of, about uh, what can be done with some of those low, low fish returns and the habitat. Um, is there anything we do in terms of habitat? That's fine. So, as a result, uh, we work with uh, MIC to do a quick assessment of a creek called Mazahin Creek. That was the area that was the, the main concern. Um, and during that assessment, we found sort of trends. It wasn't just Mazahin Creek that was experiencing some issues. Um, but island-wide concerns related to declining salmon and climate change impacts. Um, as a result, uh, we see, uh, went out and found some funding. Um, you know, in, the, in the graph that Rebecca showed you, there's, the funding seems to be pervasive in, in making things happen, but um, this was a program uh, called WaterSmart. They're actually gonna do a presentation after us. Um, and so this is like the prelude to their presentation, something you can use uh, use their uh, grant for to accomplish what we need to do. Next slide. So uh, with that funding, we were able to help develop a watershed plan. And when I say watershed plan, it's really kind of like your roadmap. You know, it's what you know, what you don't know, uh, what your goals are, and how are you going to get there. And uh, for Metlakatla and, and that island uh, plan, uh, there's four main aspects that we're working on. Uh, survey and assessment and mapping. I'm going to talk about those two in a second. Um, Climate, so uh, we're going to end up doing a fair bit of climate modeling because of uh, the uniqueness of their streams being all largely rain fed and being susceptible to climate change. Um, and then uh, community engagement. I'll hit on that one a little bit more. Um, we started a, an advisory group for this project um, with MIC and we'll post a, a listening session and we will host more. And then um, a little story. Uh, we started doing surveys uh, of, of elders and others, and the surveys have been really interesting and fun. Um, we uh, mostly done by Eva and Spencer. I think Eva online. I'm not sure if Spencer is. We you'll see photos of them in a second. Um, but we were out at this site right here. This is called Hemlock Creek, and we were trying to figure out when they logged. It, it had obviously been impacted. We couldn't figure out when. What did they do exactly? And uh, well, as soon as we got down at down the town. Spencer called his great grandfather and we talked about that and found out some of the answers, right? So some of the community engagement is broad scale goals, and some of it was like, what happened at this site? What happened here? And how do, and, and, and that really helps us figure out the next step, the next plan to move forward. Next slide. All right, data collection. I'm going to hit on this one a little bit because I think it's integral to how we are going about creating these watershed plans. So the first thing we did was just created this online ArcGIS map of all the data we could find. Where are the roads? Where are the culverts? Where are the, the harvest boundaries? All these sort of things. And then we took, uh, um, and, uh, through this WaterSmart program, we had enough money to essentially pay two of the, um, two of the MIC staff to do the data collection. So we trained them up on stream surveys, road condition surveys, culvert surveys, a lot, how to do the work. And then we equip them with these iPads and we send them out with tasks of what they're gonna look at. And they can go and take photos of, of uh, the culvert that they need to go through. The iPad runs them through the checklist. How, how wide is it? Is it blocked? Does it, you know, all the, all the details and they record the data themselves. That data goes, then gets synced online and we can see it. And we talk to them and we go through and we, together we identify what's the priority, what's not a priority, what do we need more information on. And then at times, SOC file just come down and start helping uh, kind of fill gaps that need more investigation. And so, next slide. 
So the, the key there that I think is really important in these kind of projects is that it's MIC that is doing the assessment. They own this assessment, and by the time we're done, they really don't even need us. They can do it on their own. Next one. So um, watershed plan is still being developed. Um, so I don't have like results to share with anyone yet, but I can guarantee there's going to be some restoration opportunities. Um, we're actually already looking at uh, some funding funding for some culverts that we think are going to float to the service as being fish passage barriers. Um, we're definitely going to develop a lot more information on climate resiliency and some modeling of climate that might impact uh, um, harvest management. Um, MIC actually runs the largest uh, tribally run salmon fishery in the nation. Um, and so when you open and close uh, um, your harvest, it can have a big impact on your fish and making sure there's enough water to get into the stream is important. So um, with that, I'm gonna pause. And I think Dustin Winter is online and I know Taylor's on here and I think Eva's online. And I just wanna see Dustin, if you wanna have to say anything. Well, hopefully you can hear me, but uh, I don't really have too much to add, Rob, but, um, you know, other than appreciation uh, for, for what you guys have done and helped us to achieve here in, in Metlakatla, I mean, this is this has been something that we've been uh, really grateful for and interested in in a long time. So um, a lot of our salmon creeks, we haven't had, you know, a, a habitat reassessment done since the 80s. So um, this has been a big help for the tribe. Uh, it's been a help for the staff. I mean, uh, opening the staff's eyes uh, as to what other opportunities are out there. Um, so it's been a really good opportunity for for the whole department. Um, and I do appreciate it. And we look forward to uh, the steps moving forward. So next, I'm going to provide a little update on this moon temperature monitoring network and some new applications of the data that are coming out that are hopefully really helpful for um, like climate adaptation planning and frustration prioritization and um, even you know some management um, applications. Um, so I have to put up our map of our, our network here. Um, every year we get a few more dots up there. I think at last count we had about 74 active monitoring sites around the region thanks to all of the groups that are doing all the hard work um, on the ground, maintaining and monitoring those sites. Um, and uh, they've been installed for quite a while now. We have a lot of years of data piling up. This diagram just shows the time frames where we have data for all of these sites. Um, and we're getting a lot of years of data, which is really great. Um, and we're actually, um, because we have so much data now, we're able to start answering some questions about climate resilience um, in these systems. And so thinking about their thermal suitability for salmon now and going forward, um, hypoxia risk and uh, and potentially effects of extreme events on salmon populations in these places. And so I'm gonna share some um, updates on some projects and efforts to kind of try to address these uh, climate issues using this, this data that everyone's been collecting. Um, this map shows some actual data from the network. These are uh, peak summer temperatures at these locations. Um, it's the, the maximum, weekly maximum temperature, which is kind of a, a metric that, that folks use to look at an indicator of thermal stress for fish. Um, and, and as you can see, some of these, um, well, if you squint a little bit, we see warmer temperatures further south and further west, which isn't really unexpected given what we know about the landscape and the climate here. Um, and I also want to point out that some of these streams are already quite warm, getting well into the 20s in the summers, um, and, and that's, you know, could be uncomfortable for um, juvenile salmon. Um, and we do, as I showed, we have a lot of years of data. And so um, one of the things that we're diving into is trying to understand how those um, temperature patterns are changing year to year. Um, and so this, this figure shows the, the distribution of those peak summer temperatures at all of the sites. And what I just want to point out um, is that there's a lot of variability at some of these sites. So in Castle Creek, for example, those peak summer temperatures were only 14 one summer and then up to almost 25 another summer. So there's just a lot of variability on some sites. Um, oops, go back one. 
And then at other sites like at Herman Creek up in Haines, it's it's super stable year for year, no matter what's going on with the weather or whatever. Um, and so um, we're starting some analyses to try to understand um, why are some sites variable? Is it responding to the weather? Is it snowpack? What's going on? And and hopefully we'll be able to understand going forward what to expect in the sites and if they'll continue to be um, suitable salmon habitat. Um, and so another uh, project that I want to share with you is uh, related to hypoxia risk. I think there's a lot of concern, you know, as air temperatures are warming and we're experiencing these little mini droughts, um, are we going to be having higher risk of hypoxia or low oxygen conditions that can result in fish kills? Um, and, and so Chris Sargent has been working um, with us and, and colleagues on a model of hypoxia that includes um, water temperature, so like the data that everyone's been collecting, and stream um, morphology and, and flow. And so, you know, we're thinking about like faster water tumbling down a steep stream is going to have more oxygen than a, a slow flat stream. Um, and also uh, salmon density. So there's a biological component to that dissolved oxygen too. And we have more salmon breeding and more oxygen concentrations can go down. Um, and so Chris has um, applied this model to all of those stream temperature monitoring sites that we have enough data for um, and, and come up with a, a metric of hypoxia risk. And what that metric is, is basically how many salmon you need to stuff into a square meter of stream to result in oxygen concentrations that are starting to get harmful. Um, and so if you click, we can see um, this risk is really variable across all of these sites. Um, and so a higher number of salmon, um, like at, at Goose River in Tenneke, um, we're looking at like 150 salmon you would need to squish into a meter square to get low oxygen, which is unreasonable. It means there's a low risk of hypoxia there. Um, you can compare that to like the lower Chilkoot River, where that number is more like 15 under these conditions. And so that's a higher risk of hypoxia there. Um, and, and one of the things that's come out of this is that um, it's not just stream temperature that's important. The local channel morphology and conditions um, are also really important. And so um, in some places, increasing the temperature isn't really going to increase your hypoxia risk all that much. But in other places, that's not the case. Um, and so I think this will be a really great tool to use to understand locally, like, are we going to expect hypoxia risk to be important for us in our streams? And so um, this is something that we can can use going forward um, to, in, in, you know, uh, climate assessments and things like that, where we're trying to understand um, locally what to expect for salmon uh, runs. Um, and then I also wanted to give a quick update on the salmon life cycle model. I know I've shared this with folks at past meetings. Um, and this model really focuses on the role of stream temperature and flow on salmon populations, um, focusing on their freshwater um, life stages. Um, and, and it's up and running for coho and pink and chum. Um, and we've been able to explore some extreme event scenarios, so some flood and drought scenarios at um, many of the stream temperature monitoring locations and looking at um, if we have a, a big winter flood or if we have a summer drought, like what is that going to do to uh, a pink a pink run? Um, and so I'm gonna, um, there's a lot of data because we ran that for many sites and many years of stream temperature data. And so there's, there's too much to share here. And so I'm gonna give you a few takeaways and then tell you not to take them away for your own stream. Um, but, but generally what we were finding is that uh, the coho populations were typically more resilient than pink and chum in terms of um, the hit to the population and how quickly they bounce back after um, you know several years. And, and a lot of that can be attributed to their later spawn date and shorter egg incubation times where they're just less susceptible in terms of time to these events. Um, and then also um, a juvenile freshwater life stage that helps compensate for losses during um, like egg mortality. Um, and we were also seeing that oftentimes rainfall dominated systems were um, having bigger impacts than snow melt and glacier fed systems. Um, again, that's not always the case. It really depends on the context of the local um, stream type and channel morphology and just um, what's going on with all of those factors combined together. Um, so some, those were general takeaways, but I really want to stress that um, the local stream context is super important and for mediating um, how these extreme events ultimately ended up um, affecting the salmon populations in these uh, model runs. 
Um, so I, I'm really excited. I know we've been all out <laughs> running around collecting stream temperature data for many years now. And, you know, the initial idea was, you know, we want to be able to track climate change. We want to be able to understand impacts. And I think these tools that are coming out now um, are, are going to be really useful for going beyond just generalities for the region. And when you're interested in your salmon runs that are important for your community, I think you can take some of these tools and um, really use them to to dive into that and get a better sense of what we might expect. And um, so we're, you know, these are available. We're, we're happy to help folks use them and um, apply them um, going forward. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Rob. All right, I'm gonna give one last example of a kind of a class of work that I think is really applicable to this audience. Um, and before I jump into it, um, just wanna say, like, as I said in the beginning, our role is often more to help, to help figure out the logistics, help figure out the funding, help make the project happen. So I'm going to show a bunch of pictures here. Really, the projects are owned by, I think, you know, there's, there's folks, there's photos here from guys from Buddha, uh, from Cake, from Bar, from Ketchikan, um, and really those guys own these projects. And, and I see it as us being, like, I, I come up, I'm like, honored to help make some of these projects happen, more than us own these projects. And, this class of work um, is really, uh, well, it, it boils down to um, using tribal work crews to do on the ground restoration work and on the ground assessment work. And, and it's been going on for quite a long time. And I want to say that too, before I jump in on it, is that, uh, you know, I think the guys in Huna at the Huna Native Forest Partnership have been doing an awesome job for uh, almost a decade now. I think folks in Heidelberg have been collecting uh, stream survey data for over a decade. Um, and I think before, well before I even came to Southeast in the 90s, there was uh, the Kowak Watershed Council was doing some of this kind of work with the help of Central Council and Forest Service. Um, so uh, we don't own it, but I've been stoked to be involved in it. This is the point I'm trying to get across. So next picture. So essentially, uh, uh, kind of around the region, there's a series of different work crews and different different uh, tribal efforts where, you, where they're doing a variety of different actions. So this is uh, watershed assessment. So taking, having tribal crews do the assessment work, like I, like I was saying, for the MIC crew in the Tala, um, conducting stream restoration themselves. So this is the scenario, the pictures you're seeing are, uh, these guys are taking um, second growth trees they're cutting them and they're putting them into streams that have been logged over and are lacking large moving debris. So they're doing hand tool restoration of logged over salmon streams um, for fish habitat. Um, and we couple that with riparian enforcement and forest enhancement and wildlife enhancement. So when you log over uh, a, a stream, uh, what happens is the trees come in really, really, really thick. And that's really bad for uh, both salmon habitat and wildlife habitat. And so there's prescriptions. They can come in and bend those forests, and then they take the bigger slab and they use that for the stream restoration. So it's, um, it's a series of uh, work that really the crews are doing. They're doing the assessment work. We're helping them identify the streams that need restoration. Then they go out, they do the thinning work, and then with the byproduct of the thinning, they're restoring those streams. Um, Coupled with that, there are some other stewardship things that, that these crews are doing, things like, uh, you know, making sure people don't dump in garbage and um, clean up some of those things. So, next slide. Um, it's been awesome and super fun. <laughs> these, so we've got, we've had some work happening in Balak and Ketchikan um, and uh, a few other places. And It's on the ground, uh, you know, we're actually um, we're providing local jobs for these crews. Most of them, I mean, all of them are locals that we're hiring. Um, and it's building capacity for bigger projects. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story. Um, I'm, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ed DeVille with the Kowak Indigenous Stewards Forest Partnership. And one of uh, their staff members is a guy named Quinn. And Quinn and I were reviewing all the areas he needed to uh, go and do assessment work with his crew on this summer. Um, it was like a two hour meeting. And when we were done, I was like, man, Quinn, by the time this is over, you're going to own this place. And his response was, Rob, I already do own it. And uh, he wasn't meaning like physically own it. And he wasn't meaning like because of the indigenous connection, he owns it. He meant it from a personal standpoint of like, he knows the land well enough that he wants to take care of it. It's, it's his responsibility to do it. And I think that's like ultimately 
why I'm finding this kind of work so invaluable and really would encourage others to uh, consider doing it. Next slide. So um, some examples of what we've been doing in the last couple of years. So first off, we just hosted a couple of trainings. So last year and this year, we brought folks from the US Forest Service who have a lot of expertise in this realm. Um, so we, had, we had a training in Kowak um, last year and in Ketchikan this year. Um, so the training was Forest Service folks, tribal groups, tribal, uh, um, and I think there was eight different tribal groups right, um, at those different trainings, um, and uh, as well as uh, some community groups ourselves and some of the other watershed councils. Uh, we hosted some capacity exchanges. So we brought the Kuna Native Forest Partnership guys down to Kowak to teach them how to do it. And then we brought the Kowak guys over to Ketchikan and we brought the, there was a new Pequon group from Cape. We brought them down to uh, to walk. So the idea being to intermix some of these crews, let them share experience, share knowledge. Uh, it's, and it's super fun to do that. It's, it's great. Um, another success I just want to say uh, this year was the first year for a, a, a KIC uh, uh, Ketchikan Indian community crew, and they went out to Margaret Creek. Um, and I think this is kind of a noteworthy project because Margaret Creek was a Forest Service priority restoration project. And um, it was a great example of the Forest Service integrating a different subset of work and a different level of engagement with the tribe into a forest service project. And it went really good, I think, for the, for the KIC crew. It went really good for the forest service. I think it just opened up new opportunities if we just think about, well, how do we do some of these projects a little bit better so we get our bigger bang for the buck? And um, so just great. Um, there's interest, I think uh, YTT has done some similar projects uh, with the Forest Service and um, uh, interested in doing more. Uh, Kutsu Incorporation is hoping, interested in uh, partnering with us to do some on Admiralty Island. And I guess what I'm getting at is I, I see this as a rising tide lifting all ships. I don't see multiple tribes doing this as being competitive with each other. There's been a lot of work to do and a lot of room for growth. Um, and uh, would just be, if you're interested in knowing what you could do in your region, um, check out this, this story map. Uh, it'll give you some details of the different projects um, that we worked on, uh, the different partners that are involved, what they're hoping to get out of it, and great pictures of what's involved. So if you want to go ahead and uh, write that down and um, you know, it'll give you some great, great insights. So next slide. So. Um, what is it building to, you know, uh, I, I mentioned building capacity for bigger projects, you know, these are great projects, we're pointing a few people to it, but honestly, like, where does it yield, where does it go to, and I think there's two big, two big, big things that it can yield and go to. First off, it can yield more work. Um, this is a project that we supported with the Forest Service uh, at East Olmer Creek, so we have heavy equipment moving, uh, doing stream restoration in an area that was essentially the stream and the floodplain was mined, and so, we are adding large woody debris with heavy equipment. Next picture. This is a, a road on National Forest land on Admiralty Island in the Cube Cove parcels. Uh, it needs to be decommissioned. Um, there's over 50 of these culverts that need to be taken out. This is a big one inside. Um, that's a lot of work to do. But this is a, another project that SOC supported um, for the for, with the Forest Service. So um, provided a, a fair bit of funding. And we're ripping out that road. It's in a floodplain. Um, but it's gonna, that road's going to be removed. So I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, you know, in some cases you can start these start small. These are the angel projects I mentioned here are are manageable bite-sized projects that we can tackle and we can do together, and then we can build capacity to take on bigger things. And here's some big ones. Um, there's another thing that I think these projects really build towards and help yield, um, and that's uh, Kind of a broader concept, you know. The more you know, the more experience you have, the more authority you have. I know there's a lot of talk about co-management, about sovereignty, about natural resources, and so forth. And um, those things are connected, I think. And I think I'm going to stop there and not talk about that much because my next, uh, the person I'm going to pass it to, if he doesn't uh, have it in his presentation already, I'm sure we'll speak up to it. So um, I think Ed Deville is our one. Ed, do you need to share screen? No, not right now. Thank you, Rob. Could you all hear me? Yes. Well, I, I really appreciate the time that was cut short from your presentation to, to talk about the KISS FIP. 
Um, I really apologize for not being there, um, but I, we do appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Ed Duvel. I'm the president and CEO of Sean C Corporation. Sean C is the host and the managing entity for the Kowak Indigenous Stewards Forest Partnership. I know that's a mouthful and I apologize for that, but it sounds a lot better when you say KISFIP and that's what we call it. So you guys could all call it that. Um, what we are doing down here is, is trying to create restoration and local workforce development opportunities. I know that no, most of you probably don't know Sean C. We're a village corporation from Craig on Prince Wales Island. And our history is steeped in logging. So this is a big transition for us. Sean C., like many other village corporations, has really been hit by the boom and bust industries in Southeast Alaska, logging, fishing, um, you know, just, just to name a couple. Um, and we really want to take a more sustainable approach to the way that we do business and you know providing the local workforce development opportunities in these green jobs is is crucial for our board of directors and our community you know logging at the end of the day was only ever a job it was never a career with a future and and we really see the the workforce development that we're doing here um, not only helping the environment that we live in, but also providing those sustainable careers. You know, I, uh, we know from experience that you can only cut a tree down once, but you can measure it a whole lot of times. And that's, that's a more sustainable approach to what we're doing. And, you know, I would, I would just like to take a second and think um, a few of the partners and introduce the partnership uh, um, in this moment. So the, this, this partnership is primarily amongst landowners and that's, it, it, it differs in, in a little bit of the other forestry partnerships that we have in Southeast Alaska. Uh, although it's hosted by Sean C, the, the partners that, that are in the partnership are Coaquina, Sean C, C Alaska, the United States Forest Service, the Watershed Coalition, the Kowak Tribe, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Prince of Wales Conservation District. Now, as, as a partnership, we were able to get a lot done this year, and, and we're really proud of that. And like I said, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of this with you. Um, this is the start to co-management, and this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. This is the, the nitty gritty, the hard work that, that is behind the scenes that a lot of you are familiar with but don't get to see up close. And because of that, you know, we, we have taken a special approach to training local workforce development and, and the work that we're doing. The work that we're doing is primarily focused around the Kowak watershed. And the reason that we started this whole thing is that Culturally, we have strong ties to Kowak and the Kowak watershed and the sockeye salmon specifically that come out of that watershed. Over the years, we've, we've experienced a 90% decline in sockeye salmon to the point where it was almost non-existent. And today, I'm really proud to say that, you know, we're taking major steps with our partners to make sure that our culture in this area could be maintained in the way that it was for thousands of years. And, and that's, 
that's the big picture of of everything right now. I know that um, over the years with Sean Seats logging, we created a lot of damage to our environment. And this is really taking that ownership that Rob was talking about and taking it back. And the guys that we have working for us are very, very passionate. You know, he mentioned Quinn. Quinn, I'm sure a lot of you in the environmental world know Quinn. And Quinn is a firecracker. He is, he's the guy that you want driving your team. Uh, he's an old Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he's very, very um, fair and demanding of, of his crew. And because of that, you know, we were able to go into places and do things that um, normally we wouldn't be able to do. And also with that, we've been able to perpetuate the program by taking on other contracts like the, um, we'll be doing the Wolf Board data collection that I'm really excited about because uh, as you know, the wolf, the wolf thing is a hot button topic on Prince of Wales Island. Um, you know, we would like to be in the position to collect the data that our lawmakers are looking at to make these policies later on. And that's, that's really the co-management part that, that we're talking about. And in doing so, you know, we'll be collecting data in areas this year that have never been done before on the outlying islands in unit two. The KISFIP area is 282,000 acres, which goes all the way out to the outlying islands, up to Shinniku and all the way down to Trocadero. And it's a big area. And our primary, our primary, primary focus for the next two years is going to be in the Kwok watershed, but we're going to be going outside of those areas in the next few years to provide these types of services to uh, our federal and state partners. And, you know, we're really excited for what the future has to bring. Um, you know, a little bit of what the guys are working on right now, stream and recon survey, salmon monitoring, GSI mapping, carbon verification, timber in inventory, uh, safety and first aid training. Um, and also when the snow starts to fly this winter, they're gonna go inside into the Votech Center. We've been talking to the new director there uh, at the Prince of Wales Votech Center. And we're actually creating the curriculum for our own forestry academy. And that's something that can be perpetuated throughout the years. We could use as a model, um, just like the other forestry programs have, have been to ours. And, you know, we're really excited about those opportunities as well. And the new um, Votech executive director, he seems like he has a lot of ideas that are, that are really good. So um, in closing, again, I'd like to thank, thank Rob um, for being a great partner and, and facilitator and the rest of the Watershed Coalition for, for their hard work this year. Um, I know that, that Rob has spent a lot of time in the field because every email that I've sent him has kicked back with a, I'm in the field message. So I'm hope, hoping to, to get a little bit more time with Rob and um, I'm excited to plan for the next year. And uh, like I said, I just like, uh, like to say thank you to the Watershed Coalition and the rest of the partnership uh, it really couldn't have happened without all the partners' involvement this year. So thank you, Gunas Chi, Shawa. And 
Uh, again, I apologize that I couldn't be there in person. Thank you for the time. I, I, I personally want to say that uh, I, I agree with a lot of the stuff we were, we were saying, but that uh, I want to make a correction with no, with, uh, with absolutely no disrespect. But there there has been a, a wolf study that's been going on for, I mean, probably like five or six years now. And with the uh, Heide Corporation, what I worked with, and I personally worked that wolf project. There, there is a wolf project, and we do, we do a study on on them, and we we make these wolf boards, and they have barbed wire on them, and we collect data from their hairs, and so we do, we do do a wolf study. And just so with with absolutely no disrespect, but there there is a study on Prince of Wales Island that is being taken care of with the wolves. Well, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, what I was saying, and and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And I want to be clear about this. This will be the first study on the outlying islands in the Craig area. So in the Craig area, I know that a lot of them have been on the road systems. And that's what we're really excited about is going off the road system. So um, I just wanted to clarify that and, and thank you for your comment. Yes, and, um, and, this, and it's not just a wolf, uh, just not just a, a hair study too. We, we, well, we do, we, we do talk with all the trappers on the island too and, and get an estimate of, and they, they help us out lots, especially letting us know how much wolves were, were trapped in a season and how much, and, and then the hunters too, you know, the hunters are a really big part of it too, of uh, giving us an estimate on how much wolves they really took on the island and that helps with the deer population, what we should do about it. But, on, on um, off topic though too, um, in your in your previous slide, this is something that I I seen that was uh, it was it was something that was a little bit disturbing to me. Was you, you guys want to restore these rivers and all of this and help get the trees out from landslides, whatever? But I mean, you're bringing those big tractors and stuff and putting them in the river beds. I mean, you're that's, that's just ripping them apart. It's ripping all of all of those eggs up that all the salmon that like like you know it's it's they have a hard enough time in general. And then you bring big big machinery in there. And then how do you get the machine the machinery there? Like you have to rip apart to some degree you have to rip apart a part of the woods to even get into the river system. And it's like you're you're doing more damage than like good. Like, that is a great question, an absolutely great question. So we call it open heart surgery sometimes. It is, seriously, and it can be nasty. So every time you do a project, so these are the logistics and the, and the um, like getting to a project that you have to go through. It is not a straightforward question of do you go, or do you not go, what do you do? You have to analyze it, you have to evaluate it, and then you have to have a, like a, a go, no, go point. Like, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? And so we take that super, super seriously. And with all of our projects, we we really sit down and have like a, a red face conversation. Should we do this? Should we not do it? Is it worth doing? Is it not doing? And so that's that watershed planning process. It's super, super important. So specifically about taking machines into a stream, um, we never put a machine in the stream when there's fish eggs in the stream. So we have a timing you know, that limits where you can bring machines in. Um, so there aren't any, there aren't any uh, fish eggs in the stream. Now, there's always some juvenile coho in the stream. That's a salmon stream, right? Because they last, they stay a year round in the stream. And so you will have, you will have, you will hurt some fish if you bring So that's where, even though you're, you're taking those mitigation members, there's impact that you've got to judge and gauge and those sort of things. And access is another one. So part of the reason I love the hand tool work that we're starting to do with the tribal crews is access is so much easier. We're carrying all that gear in on a backpack and you bring it into the site and then you can use the machinery to pull that trees in and you have much less of an impact than when you're bringing the heavy equipment. But sometimes the streams are just too big. So you've got to choose, you've got to look at the site. Where are the roads? Can you get in there? How big of a how big of an access point do you have to make? 
when you come in, you put this, we call it punching trip. You put down, uh, uh, when you clear a road, there's a bunch of alders. So you put the alders down to prevent, uh, prevent rutting and so forth to get in. So it's a big operation. It's super expensive to enter places that are hard to access. So your point is super well taken. It, and, and we call it open heart surgery for a reason. because you, you have the potential to do damage when you come in there and do it. So it's really important to take uh, those steps very carefully. And if not us, have an expert involved. Um, you know, we oftentimes will get to the point where we're like, okay, this is too big, too questionable. How, how do we take that next step to move forward? And so one of the roles we play is we try to pull in those experts. Like when we don't know it, we will uh, we'll go to the US Forest Service or we'll go to the US Fish and Wildlife Service and we'll go to others and pull them in on it and uh, try to get the advice from them. Okay, do we go, do we not go? So point well taken. Okay, well, I, I've, I've seen lots of your experts and 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 like seriously, like all of all of your experts, they it's not it's it's not a reality. I'm only 21 years old, and I've watched your experts come to my rivers down on Prince of Wales Island, down towards Hyderabad, and some of those rivers don't barely have any salmon left. So it's like they supposedly they are experts. Yeah, they're they're supposed to know more than I do, they have, they're 60 years old, they have degrees, they have all this and that, but how come they're experts and they said everything will be fine. And now there's no salmon in some of those rivers. Like, and and they keep exploiting people down, in, especially Hyderabad. They're exploiting us like, like they did like, it's almost like, it's like they don't care about our salmon down there. We have, so we have, we have, we used to have huge sockeye salmon runs we had huge runs. I mean, um, Rob, 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 Dad would tell you. I could talk to. I, I talked to my old uncle back in the day. He told me our our river our river system that I, I worked at is they had a special like they they logged that area and they had experts go there too. It, it went it went from uh, his 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 dad talking about there used to be three hundred thousand sockeye going up that river to. Now there's a few thousand going up on a on a very 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 good year, and this year it was it was decent. We we probably have about four thousand sockeye go up. Last year we only had nine hundred, and the experts say this, they say that, but it's just. And so I have another name for the same scenario you're talking about. My last one was open art surgery. This is Humpty Dumpty. There is Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, and all the kids' horse, all the. No one can put them back together again, right? It it is totally true. At some point in time, there's only so much you can do to restore a system. It's been damaged enough, or if there's other impacts, other things they're also doing. And so, Kowak is another example as well. If we've been doing restoration, people have been doing restoration work in Kowak since the 90s, right? And salmon runs are still low. And what's the causes of those things? Oftentimes, it's multiple different factors. You know, it's fisheries harvest, it's habitat, it's factory, it's so it adds up. And so there's so many different impacts, it's hard to it's hard to take that next step. And so, you know, in some cases I agree with you. Yeah. It's I yeah, I it, it, that's agreeable, but it almost seems like a little bit avoiding the question, a little bit like, like, um, like, yeah, you did, you did put it in perspective. There is, there is those different factors and stuff. So why, why isn't like anybody being really held accountable for coming into these, especially rural areas? It's not just Heidelberg. This is, this is something, something that is happening in, in lots of small communities. That's. It's not really being talked about a whole lot. I've seen you guys bring up, uh, especially yesterday, you guys brought up lots of the bigger river systems, but there's not a whole lot being talked about in the smaller communities that, that really actually benefit from subsistence living. Are, are you talking about our projects or, or just like broader in general work that's occurring? No, just, um, just, just like, uh, I mean, like, it was. Uh, I'm not necessarily your work. I can't. I can't just 
white niggas. Like, you know, like, because, you know, like, I can't, I can't point my finger and say, yeah, you, you, I was going to say, I was going to say, most, 100% of my projects are in rural areas. So, <laughs> I know, I know, I know you're not one. I mean, it's just, that's, you know, well, I guess, I guess my, my, I'm going to take it from, say, uh, you take charge. I, I am not the guy in charge. I never have any of the projects, right? 90% of the projects I run, I'm working for a tribal group or a community group. And so if, if you're concerned with your streams and what you want to see there, I encourage you to flip it on itself. And if it's not me, don't you don't have to work with me. You can work with whomever you want. You can do it on your own. If this is about managing your own water streams, about taking pride in it and taking ownership of it. And if you don't want us involved, you do not have to have us. And there's you can do it on your own or you can have others do it. And so I I that, that's the hope with most of these projects. I'd just like to make a point about kind of intersecting with both with what both of you are saying. And there is a lot of focus on restoration right now, but I think um, getting at what you're saying, what what is the objective of the restoration? That needs to be clear in terms of changes. What is it? Do you want um, changes? What are the changes in hydrology that you're aiming for? Because there, it's important to show that there is a change because of restoration. And sometimes I have seen restoration where the, the sizes of the wood that are put in are kind of on the small side. And, you know, maybe that's not making significant changes in the hydrology. Are you aiming for larger pools? And is that being monitored over time? But these are these are key things to look at. And the monitoring subsequent to restoration is, is really important because looking at the fish numbers alone is so complicated because you, as Rob was saying, there, there's, there are issues with over harvesting and whatnot. So the fish numbers aren't necessarily gonna tell you what you need. So it, it is really complicated, but um, just to get back, I think as well, it's, it's, it's stupor when you actually do see changes in hydrology. And now I'm gonna pass it on to. Okay. Um, I'd just like to make a suggestion. In the lower 48 in a couple states, they're actually using horses. Um, and that's been very successful in sensitive areas to keep equipment out. I don't know a piece of equipment that doesn't leak oil. You got diesel, hydraulic, and everything else. So they are using horses. Um, I just wanted to bring that up. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I believe I believe you guys. You guys, but um, like you said, uh, what what communities are are you guys restoring the river systems in? Okay, so it's it's to me it, it seems like monitoring and and just all talk and and if, even if you guys are doing restoration in these small communities, why 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 is my community getting left out all the time? Heidelberg, especially like Heidelberg, like we always get left out of everything all the time all the time and there's 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 nothing for restoration for our for our rivers nothing like your tribe should have to for their tribes yes we do we and we try them but we don't get a whole lot of help from from the state or nothing like this it's, it's like they almost kind of just overlook us and then they come and log like they they log all of our areas too and then and then they say oh it'll be all right and then it's it's, it's never all right like i mean i i'm only 21 years old i've watched I've watched over a dozen rivers get ruined from all the logging, and they say, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna help you guys this way and that way," and then it just it just never comes. They completely disappear and they ignore us. And there's, I no, and there's no such thing as rest restoration for our our community. That I means like they look at us like, okay, there's there's only two two hundred and fifty people there. Okay, they'll be all right. Like, I'd be stoked to come to Heidelberg, come see your streams. And um, I generally just, FYI, I generally don't just barge into the community and, and get involved. I usually have some in, invite or some uh, previous relationship with somebody before I come in. So um, I actually have talked to folks from Heidelberg about what's going on there. 
And honestly, we I think some of the efforts that are going on have learned from Hyderberg in terms of um, like I mean, you guys had that string team going on for ages, just kicking butts with it and doing really good stuff. And so to me, it's not my role to bargain with Hyderberg and say, hey, we 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 do this. I'd say it's somebody, it's I said I'd be stoked to come down and look at your stream. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Rob Sanderson, my son from the United Nations, uh, Heidelberg, I live, start to live in Ketchikan. Uh, you know, and thank you to the gentlemen uh, online that, you know, are talking about their, their um, corporation uh, taking initiatives to help uh, these things that were destroyed. But, you know, uh, my cousin and I, we go out and do sacred site tours and look down our sacred sites in the Kaigani area on uh, Hell Island. Long Island, uh, there are systems that you guys don't even know about that are gone. You know, uh, and I, I'll put it right out there. I don't mean my words. You know, it's we lost to do that. Hell, a lot of damage to Bell Island. There are systems on the outside of Bell Island that will never come back. These rivers are always bone dry. In this, in this last piece out there, um, it, it ain't coming back. And are the native corporations that are they are they partnering on this too? The large ones, you know, the last guys. We talked, you know, I and I talked to uh, Mayor Peel about Natsuni Creek. I knew that used to be a major overrun. Um, I know there's fish that may be coming back, but it's not like it used to be. I don't give a damn what anybody says, you know. There, that run in is never the same after Sea Alaska. Their buffer zone, you could walk through it in all 30 seconds. If it's even that in some of these areas, uh, all you need to do is walk across that bridge and take a look. That place used to be packed when you drive to Craig or Heidelberg. There's too much down in the river, ain't nothing there. And the list goes on. You know, uh, I'm, I was educated by a very knowledgeable man. It's hard to get things by me, at least on the traditional side. You know, you talk about going to your experts. Well, can you go to the experts in the village and talk to the elders? You guys, you know, you guys talk about, you know, how fast these systems tend to flow up in a heavy rainfall and they drop real quick and they stay dropped. How much down the inches were they logged in these areas? Have you guys talked about that? You know, it's just, it's just, so much that needs to be done out there and you know i think it's in we need to take ownership as well uh, as tribes and as corp mainly corporations you know uh, they want to start acting like tribes well let's start putting their money much where their mouth is and help us get hopefully get some of these systems up and restored that we're not talking about i could name a whole ton of systems that are pretty much gone on Dow island on the outside of Dow island long island North Rider with dog salmon string. That'll never probably never come back ever. Uh, too small of a system. I don't know even how you would even restore that. Uh, and thinking about all that's going on and what you know basically happened creating the rank study with native corporations, a failed experiment. I believe it was designed to do exactly what they wanted to do. They're talking about restoration of the rivers that were once healthy that were logged off by our native corporation. We need to take ownership of that. And as a shareholder, and, you know, I'm taking ownership of that. And all of my, my uh, native corporation, Heidekorp, and uh, Sea Alaska accountable. And I know Heidekorp is pretty much their sign. I don't know what Sea Alaska is doing. It's all about taking ownership and working with you guys and getting that right information on a lot of these systems because it's all good and well when you go out and go to the co-ops and trade and all that. It's good. I'm glad you're doing that. But, you know, I think the other tribes need to take the initiative and reach out for help. Identify some of these river systems in their area. In a lot of these places, too, you know, you don't, a lot of the river systems that are going, they're not on very large islands. You know, the, the water flow that comes out of the a forest goes quickly, especially in uh, uh, into a river and it stays low. In the lakes, you know, it's 
phthalo, all of the above. I mean, what I'm trying to get at, I don't know, but I just see that, you know, from, from where I, when I've grown up and seen healthy liver systems that were once mm -hmm. new and uh, once very vibrant, I thought, it, it's not always phthalogen either. It's other than drought. I've seen landslides for drought uh, systems on Long Island, Shaw Island. I don't know. How do you fix this? I have no idea, but going back to the Robert's uh, question about bringing big machines in the rivers, I don't know if that's a whole thing. I think there's other ways to do it. I don't know what that is, but I think it's going to take all of us that are concerned about our environment to actually get this done and really go out there and look at other new systems, work with the local tribes, identify. We got maps, we have coordinates to these different areas that are suffering. Just, just get it done. However, oh, I could I could talk a lot more. That's good. I, I just like to thank thank you, Robert, for that. I appreciate it. And I agree with you um, in terms of there's things that none of us really know about that have been impacted and and the reach is, is hard to reach. Our reach is hard to get to. I just want to note a couple of things about the way that we operate, just so people are aware. Um, we are not paid by any of the tribes or any of these corporations. We raise our own money. So, and in fact, we always go the opposite direction. We um, we try to make it so that we raise enough money that we give money to either the groups that we work for for them for them to do this work. So, just in terms of our motives and where we're coming from. Got it. Uh, and I do have another question. It may not be related to this uh, specific topic. Uh, you know, I could use the uh, fishing game. Uh, and the data that you guys collect and go through and, you know, monitoring the reserve system, seeing if they're making a comeback and this and that. I think to the tribal tribes that are here, be careful of the data you share, you know, because it could be used against you. That's happened to us in highways once, twice, maybe more. And trying to tell us their steel hooks are run low. Yes, they're healthy, telling us we can't fish in our own system. You know, um, and we asked them, have you done a study? No, they haven't. So, you know, you can't speak with two tongues. I don't, we'll hold everybody accountable and thank you. You know, and, and you guys are paying for this, or we thank you. But, you know, I'll do my part and reach out to the different people that cause a lot of this harm. You know, it's time to start putting your our foot down. So we're not putting everything on you, but you know, I don't come all knowing, but I do what I know and I my eyes see what I see, you know. I go out there and talk to some of the elders that are still alive before they're gone. Yeah, I, and I will say I agree with that as well, Robert. Um, and uh, just for clarification, the only data that we uh, collect with those eyesights and they, they get to decide what's still in it. And then uh, just real quick, uh, for this project, the Washington Indian Stewards Forest Partnership, there was a large amount of survey and we heard you uh, done with the community of Tawa, including elders. Thank you guys. We have time for one more question or comment from John, and then we have to move on to our next presentation. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I see this topic uh, really grabbed uh, everybody here in attendance, and especially me. A um, little bit of history, I'll try to be brief. Um, long before Sea Alaska and Gold Belt began uh, clear cutting our timber, my dad was a logger uh, way back when he worked on the Alcan Highway. But um, to be building a log cabin like we did on the Taco River, you had to find the timber that were close to the river or the big streams. And when you harvested those trees, you were able to put them in the stream or the river and float them down to wherever location you were, you were planning to build your log cabin. That being said, destroyed a lot of salmon streams. We didn't know at the time what we were doing, 
but even CLS and Gold Belt, after they began clear cutting, when we started doing the science on all of this, we learned that we had to put buffers along the rivers and the streams to to kind of help the help the streams and the rivers in the salmon runs. Now, um, in your presentation, um, I'd like to address the um, the low water and the warming in the streams. Um, I've worked with the uh, Douglas Union Association. I'm the past vice president, and in 2010. We began a program with Youth and Elders program where we took a lot of the students out into uh, field trips, uh, working with the Forest Service and the fishing game. And on Douglas Island, Fish Creek, where at that that year was low water warming, and so for restoration, what we did, we put small logs in the stream so that the water could flow over the over the logs and create oxygen. We also took uh, heavy branches to put in the stream to put for hiding places for those little tiny fingerlings that can uh, have a chance to survive in there. Uh, the picture that you showed with the big black culvert, um, we worked with uh, Rick Edwards from the uh, Forest Service uh, way out the road where there was a culvert in like that. But what we found out was that the little tiny fingerlings that were only inch or inch and a half long could not make it to that culvert because of all of those little, um, I don't know what to call them, but they, you know, you know what I mean. They, uh, they didn't have the strength or the energy to make it to that culvert. So what we had to do was we had took some of the, our young folks and go into the culvert and put little rest spots uh, for those little fingerlings to to, uh, to be able to have a rest spot to get get to that collar to get back up in further up in the stream. So uh, that was just some of the stuff I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I'm going to end this and really note on on this note really quick that we are seeing that turning of the guard in regards to our ANCSA corporations here in Southeast, working with our tribes, working to do stream restoration, as Ed pointed out in the Sean C uh, presentation aspect of it. it you know, we're seeing it in C with Sea Alaska as well. So there is a turning of the guard with that. We're seeing our ANCSA corporation work to enhance our streams throughout our region. And, and they're doing it with the tribes and with our organizations such as SOC. So uh, I just wanted to end that on that note. There are positive notes we're seeing right now with our corporations and our tribes moving into that area. Nishish. Hi everyone, so I know it says we have a scheduled break, but in order to keep on time this morning, I think we're gonna bring up um, Catherine and Nikki from the Bureau of Reclamation and begin our Reclamation Water Smart presentation. Um, if everybody could, if you do wanna go get a drink of water or grab another coffee, um, please feel free to do so. Just be a little bit quiet about it. We can listen to our presenters. Um, additionally, if everyone wants to go pick up a raffle ticket from Lindsay at the back table, um, we're going to do that during this little time um, as we transition as well. Thanks so much. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thumbs up. From groups of my people. All right. Well, I would like to start out by thanking you all for joining us. It was a very interesting presentation that we caught the very end of. Um, as you will notice, there are quite a few of us here today from the Bureau of Reclamation. My name is Nikki McKeon, and I work in the Denver office for the WaterSmart program. I'm joined by Catherine Tucker, also from WaterSmart. We also on the line have Melinda and Jessica as Bill Case, and they are going to be the Native American Affairs for the contacts in this Columbia Pacific Northwest region, as well as Leah Meeks is on the phone with me today, and she is our Water Smart Coordinator. So we have a number of people here from Reclamation interested in helping you guys be more familiar with the Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart program. The first thing you may ask us is, well, who is the Bureau of Reclamation and why are you here in Alaska? 
Um, so we are the Bureau of Reclamation. We typically operate in the 17 Western states of the 17 continental, um, of the continuous continental states. Our big picture here on the side that you'll see is Hoover Dam. That is what we are most known for. So Hoover Dam is one of our projects. We were established in 1902, and we are best known for the construction of dams, power plants, and canals. So our mission is to help develop and manage and protect water related to resources in the environment in an economically sound way. Essentially, we provide drinking water and irrigation water for uh, the 17 Western states. However, in 2019, the state of Alaska and the state of Hawaii were added to the definition of reclamation states, which now makes the state of Alaska eligible for water smart funding, which is what we're here to talk to you about today. All right. So quickly, just some interesting facts, since most of you probably have no idea who the Bureau of Reclamation is, because we do not operate um, as a government agency in Alaska. Um, we are the largest wholesale water supplier uh, for the United States with uh, 338 reservoirs and a storage capacity of 148 million acre feet. For the farmers in the Western, uh, Western United States and irrigation companies, we provide one out of five Western farmers with water, 10 million farm land acres of irrigated water, 60% of the nation's vegetables are grown with reclamation provided water and 25% of all of the United States fruits and nuts are provided with reclamation water. And then we are the second largest producer of hydropower in the United States with 53 hydropower dams um, operating approximately 40 billion kilowatt hours uh, produced annually. So that's kind of about reclamation, but we are here specifically to talk about the Water Smart Program. So what is, we consider water smart. It is an umbrella program that covers a number of different types of programs. These are all going to be competitive funding opportunities that provide financial assistance to do um, either planning or on the ground projects. Today, we're specifically gonna talk about our um, environmental based programs, but we just wanted to bring to your attention that we do have another set of programs that are eligible in Alaska as well. Um, this one being this blue item here, the Water Smart Grants are used for water conservation and energy um, and efficiency. Those are eligible within uh, Alaska. This is predominantly going to be canal uh, municipal metering, SCADA and automation systems for your water delivery systems, uh, turf replacement, things that would conserve uh, energy or conserve water. The other one that we want to bring to your attention is our drought response program, which we won't be touching on today on, on, in detail, but to let you know that we do provide funding for drought resiliency, whether that be on the ground projects um, or any assistance that you may need for making your communities more resilient to drought. But we are going to specifically talk today about our environmental programs. We have three or four three of them that we're gonna to discuss today in detail um, and how you guys can get involved in receiving funding for uh, Water Smart programs. So the first program that I would like to talk to you about today is gonna to be our Cooperative Watershed Management Program. This is a great opportunity for people to get involved in uh, Water Smart. It is so far the only successful projects we've had in Alaska are associated with the water uh, the Cooperative Watershed Management Program. This program has is a planning program. There are a number of different types of activities that you can do within this program, including watershed group development, conducting outreach activities to develop that watershed group. And when, when we're talking about watershed groups, what we are discussing is that we're looking for a grassroots group so not something determined by an agency or state that you have to be in place. We're looking for people to come together that have concerns about their watershed. And we want that to be a diverse watershed. So we don't want you to just have an environmental concern. We wanna make sure tribes are included in that. You guys can apply as a group to this, but we wanna make sure that those people from the forest, from industry, that everyone who has a seat in that watershed are part of this watershed group. 
So we're looking for you to make bigger group decisions about that watershed. In doing so, you can also gather data about your watershed and develop restoration plans are the big activities that we see through this. We've also expanded that you can come to this program if you have some project design work that you need to do to develop, let's say, river restoration, like we were just recently talking about. You want to do bank erosion, you have some sort of project that you need some assistance in developing that funding. If you have a watershed group, they can apply for that design, that project design uh, component. This is the one water smart program that does not require any non-federal cost share. So it is 100% uh, free money if it is under $200,000. And we do request these programs are completed within two years. Hi, Nikki, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you. Yes. Guys. Hey folks, I just wanna kind of connect really quick. I know we didn't get the break, I'm so sorry about that. But we've got a couple of conversations we need to have. We do ask that you step in the hallway. We're having a hard time hearing Nikki, so if you wouldn't mind. Uh, go ahead and jump in the hallway and we'll let Nikki have the attention that she definitely deserves. So, so sorry about that, Nikki. Thanks, everyone. And I will try to talk louder. I don't know if it's just on my side not coming across or um, any of those concerns. Uh, so once again, this is our cooperative watershed management program, and I'm going to turn it over to Catherine, and she's going to discuss places where um, not only has Alaska been successful, but we've also had tribes successful in this program, and we're going to highlight one of those. Thanks, Nikki. So this map is a screenshot from one of our interactive online maps, and if you want to check out our website, we'll have links at the end. It covers the entire U.S., and you can click on the uh, recipient group, and it'll have funding amounts more information about the project. Um, but as Nikki said, these are the four cooperative watershed management projects that we've had um, awarded in Alaska since 2019 when Alaska was added to eligibility. And um, I wanted to give a special shout out. I came in towards the end of the earlier presentation, but the Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition and the Metlakatla Indian community, you guys have done a really standout job with your project and I've really been enjoying kind of hearing about what you're doing. So um, Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition, they received just under $100,000 in 2021 to launch the Metlakatla Watershed Advisory Group um, right here in Southeast Alaska. And I'm sure you know more about this project than I do from the previous presentation, but we just wanna say congratulations and great work and we can't wait to continue watching what you guys do. So next we're gonna talk about a new program we have launching hopefully this winter, and it's called the Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration Projects. And the difference between this and some of our prior funding opportunities is the scale. So these projects are supposed to really benefit multiple watersheds across a basin. And um, specifically in the authorization, there's language that involves improvement of fish passage. And this can be through a variety of interventions, whether it's removal of an actual barrier to fish passage, such as a dam that's preventing um, salmon reaching spawning habitat, or it can be to improve uh, a more like geochemical or physical barriers, such as improve water temperatures that aren't ideal or nutrient and sediment loading within a reach of stream. Um, we're still working out the criteria for this funding opportunity, but the funding amounts are going to be a considerable amount larger than some of our existing programs. Um, it's gonna be broken into sort of two phases. One will be planning and design, which at the moment, it's at least going to be a minimum of $2 million available for, for funding, but we are looking to potentially expand that cap upwards, especially if there's a dam removal involved. And for that planning and design phase, there is going to be no federal cost share necessary. So it's completely paid for through this program for all of the planning and design to hopefully get you up to 60%. And then we'll also be funding construction Hopefully, you know, we can take a project from the development and then give you potentially more funding in the future for construction. 
that component, there's going to be a 35% non-federal cost share required, which is still an improvement over the 50-50 cost share required in a lot of um, restoration funding opportunities. So we're really excited for this to be the first year and kick this off. And a couple unique things about this project, sorry. Um, we really wanna prioritize projects through this program that have regional benefits um, come as a component of a collaborative and multi-jurisdictional watershed plan and benefit an underserved community. Um, so we're really hoping to see some Alaska applications in this next funding cycle. Like I said, we don't have um, a set date for when this opportunity is going to be posted, but we are anticipating sometime winter 22 or 23. Thank you, Catherine. So the other environmentally based program that we want to talk to you about today is our environmental and water resource projects. This is again for on the ground construction of projects and you can request uh, up to $5 million in federal funding. Uh, this will be a 25 or 50% cost share depending on some of the criteria. So the types of projects that we are seeing within this, they all do have to have a ecological benefit, whether that is that they have, um, that it's to help mitigate drought relations due to ecological values, watershed management or restoration projects, once again, that have those ecological values, or projects to improve the condition of a, nature, a natural or nature-based feature. So these projects can look very, very different. Um, they can be anything from stream bank restoration to forest health concerns to um, developing or reconnecting floodplains that have been disconnected to um, some of our uh, nature-based features would be developing uh, beaver analog systems where beaver to encourage beaver to return to a specific area where they have been removed um, that provide those benefits. Uh, there are very, very large variety and um, in what those look like. For all of these programs, we do have eligible applicants. And as you can see straight out, that a category A applicant is an Indian tribe. Um, we also do have states and irrigation and water districts, uh, local authorities or organizations that have water and power delivery authority. Um, but we also do have this category B uh, where a nonprofit conservation group can act in partnership with a category A applicant. So if there is, um, if there is a tribe in the area and you don't have necessarily the desire to be the fiscal agent on uh, a document or you don't want to have to handle the federal funds but you want to partner with somebody who wants to help you do the project and they're going to help manage the reporting on the grant side um, you can partner with those nonprofit conservation organizations um, including that letter of partnership to be eligible for these activities so you can do it a number of different ways that make it easiest for you guys to do these restoration types of projects uh, with having that involvement. The other part of the environmental water resource projects is we do look for these projects to be supported by a collaborative planning effort. So once again, we do like to see that a lot of people are coming to the table, they're involved in the plan. If there is a larger support for what that plan looks like, and that this project is going to be a part of that plan. So. Um, hopefully that builds the trust within that watershed and everybody's acting um, the way that is best for the group. We do have bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, so that is something that everybody's been hearing about these days uh, based on what is the DIL. Um, a number of these categories go towards these environmental types of projects. So that first one, the Water Smart Grants, that is the funding used for nature and natural based features. We have cooperative watershed management funding, and this is how much uh, funding we have for the next five years um, that is being allocated, which we will show you on a graph on the next page. Um, 
We have our aquatic ecosystems restoration and protection projects that Catherine talked to you about. We have $250 million for that program in the next five years. Um, and we do have what is called our multi-benefit projects to improve watershed health. Um, this one is specific. You do have to have a reclamation uh, project. Um, so that is not a program that is going to be uh, an option for Alaska, but it will be a part of the same environmental water resource program. So as we mentioned, we did receive $2.1 billion to provide funding over five years. The items highlighted here in yellow are those four programs that we talked about that have environmental benefits uh, associated with them that we will be using these funding opportunities to distribute. And for a, a scale of magnitude, this is largely above what we usually get. Um, for example, if you see in this blue category here, our WaterSmart grants this last year, my pointer went away, um, here we go, um, received $160 million to be allocated this year in 2022. Um, we typically receive 45 to $60 million. So it is a significant amount of money above what we typically receive for these programs. These programs have been around since 2010, um, but they, like as we mentioned earlier, they are new to Alaska, um, that we started in Alaska in 2019. I will, uh, we, we, we do have five minutes left in our little session uh, for the presentation part. So I will cover some of the helpful tools that we have. We also included in our slide deck some uh, application tips for those of you who are ready to go ahead and make those steps towards putting in an application, but we'll cover some useful tools. The first one Catherine mentioned earlier today is our uh, data portal and our data visualization tool. Our data portal allows you to see all the reclamation projects that we have. We put our press releases up on there. We also have interactive maps. Uh, the data portal goes back through 2001. The data visualization tool will go all the way back to 1992 when we started our Title 16 program. And you can sort by the types of programs where things are located. Uh, you can learn a lot about the growth of the program and the types of projects that are funded through the Bureau of Reclamation um, using those two portals. Next, I will highlight that we do have a website as well. It's going to be usbr.gov backslash watersmart where you will find out about all of our programs whether you're interested in drought resiliency, you're interested in the environmental programs, or you're interested in applied science tools, which is also a program eligible. So if you're looking to get data uh, about your program, put it into a way to help you better manage your water, that is another tool that we have out there for you. You can also sign up for information about funding opportunities um, by sending an email to watersmart at usbr.gov or by filling out a form on our website. Uh, Lastly, all of our funding opportunities are found at grants.gov. So like I mentioned, we do have application tips, but I do also note that we have three minutes left in our presentation time and you guys did not get your break. So I'm assuming that you'd like to have your break after this so we can go to contacts and open up for questions if that works for everybody. Um, as I mentioned, we do have these all and you can get information. The last thing that I do want to note quickly is that um, we do have coordinators who can help you with any of this, the information that you need or to help you be more familiar with WaterSmart. You're also welcome to reach out to any of the contacts on our website to help as well. Um, you guys are located in our Columbia Pacific Northwest region. So Leah, who is on this call and Melinda, who is also on this call are going to be your contacts for your regional office, um, but you are welcome to and encouraged to reach out to anybody in the Denver office as well, which is where we are located. So any questions about WaterSmart? Any questions at all for us? For Melinda and Leah, is there anything you'd like to add to? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say big uh, how for allowing us, allowing us in your virtual space today. We really hope to be up at some point in person as we continue to uh, share about the funding opportunities that Alaska is now eligible for. Um, I also would love my teammates, Jessica and Evan, to turn their cameras on and just say a quick hello. Uh, we've got a big group of folks who are here to uh, assist as these opportunities are now expanded to Alaska. Uh, I'm here in Boise. Jessica works in the Southeast Idaho area and Evan uh, is up in the Yakima area. So just wanted to uh, let my, my team show, uh, say hello really quick and um, just offer our uh, assistance and, and thanks so much uh, for letting us uh, come onto the agenda today. And, and again, another congratulations to Matt LaCatla. Hi, thank you for having us. My name is Evan Hawkins. And like Melinda said, um, I'm a Native American Affairs Advisor for the Bureau of Reclamation working out of the Columbia Cascades Area Office in Yakima. Uh, so once again, thank you. I'm Jessica Asbocase. I work out of the Snake River Area Office for Reclamation down in the Hayburn area, so Southeast Idaho, as the Native American Affairs Advisor. And I'm very happy to be able to be able to be with the crew presenting to you. Thank you for welcoming us. And hi, my name is Leah Meeks and I, I coordinate the Water Smart program for this, this area of reclamation. Um, so I know I've wor worked with a few of you and also worked with um, some folks in, your, in some of our other federal agencies there in Alaska about doing some more outreach and all of that for Water Smart now that Alaska is eligible for all of these different programs we have. So I'm excited to for the opportunity to work with all of you. And I do understand that there is a bipartisan infrastructure law fair of some sort next week, and we will have a table at that um, for you to come and ask questions to anyone about Water Smart. It sounds like we will have someone there. No questions. Thanks, team. Yeah, it looks like we have a question coming in from the back. Okay. Sorry, this isn't a question. It's just a comment. Um, I just want to encourage folks here to explore this opportunity for funding. Um, I know a lot of folks have trouble, us included, getting funding for assessment work, and this is a super great opportunity without match and um, just allows a lot of flexibility in the kind of work that you can do. So thanks to BOR and I just encourage folks to explore this opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. It's always great to hear the success stories on our side. We, I, I work in the program office, so we do the funding opportunity and we select projects and then we never hear what happens to them. So I'm so glad to hear that we're, we're helping out where we can. Any more questions for the Bureau of Reclamation? Water Smart Program. Okay, well, thank you, team. I'd really like to thank you all for, for coming on and giving that great presentation. And Melinda, it's good to see you again. Thank you all. Thank you, Melinda and everyone. All right, well, um, looks like we ended a little early and that means we get an extra half hour for lunch. So with that, if everyone can be back seated uh, at one o'clock ready for the next presentation um, by Linda Shaw and her crew at NOAA, they'll be talking about the green crab issue here in Southeast Alaska. Enjoy you guys' lunch. Uh, hello. Uh Really quickly, if you haven't got your door prize ticket, please grab that on the way out. Uh, we will do drawings after lunch at 12.55, just to entice you to get back here a few minutes early. Uh, you have to be here to win, so uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. Nice, sir. I like it when you lay down the law. Oh, <laughs>
So what was um, Daniel wanted to do? Test something out. What role will they like you have? The role like the cops that you had, or so that the people in the room can come in. So the town, well, you can speak this one directly into the um, laptop so the people on Zoom can hear. Oh, no, I should send them a message saying they broke early for lunch. You want to take if you want to test, right? Oh, they did. Is that what they said? Yeah, check again. Welcome back, Zoom. Can you hear me okay on Zoom? Yep. Some thumbs up if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Awesome. Okay, so uh, before we get started, we're gonna do a couple of quick uh, door prizes. Uh, we have a few uh, giveaways that we're gonna do. Again, thank you, welcome back from lunch. Uh, this afternoon session is a great one, great agenda. So let's go ahead and do a couple of door prizes first. And those of you on Zoom, we do have your name in a hat as well. So you're included in the door prize drawing as well. All right. First up, we have number 6280405. Zero four zero five. All right, we got a winner, Meredith. All right, next number six two eight zero three seven eight three seven eight. All right. <laughs> Three seven eight. Exactly. All right, next ticket is for an online uh, Zoom participant, Ed Duville. Congrats, Ed. All right, next random number. Another online, Paul Cook. Are you with us, Paul? I'm here. Sweet, congrats. All right, a couple more. All right, this one is for here in the room. 6280438438. Are you with us? All right. Oh, oh, there we go. We got it. All right, last one for this set for this uh Opening of session for the afternoon is number 
377. All right, John. Feel free to see Lindsay back or Tia back there at the desk waving her hand. Um, those of you online, we have your information and then we'll be sure to get those to you. All right. Uh, for this afternoon's session, I'd like to introduce our, our MC for the afternoon, uh, Carol from Kassan. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself. And yeah, you. hi, folks. I'm Carol from Kassan. I'm the organized village of Kassan. I'm the environmental coordinator, and I'm so glad to be back here. Um, we'll let's uh, welcome Linda Shaw, Barb Lake, Natalie Bennett from NOAA on Green Crab Living on the Edge. Hi everyone, I am Linda Shaw. I'm with NOAA Fisheries in the Alaska Region. And I'm Barb Lake. I work with Linda Shaw at the Alaska Region here in the Federal Building in Juneau. Hello, my name is Taylor Sunk. I'm with the Metlakatla Indian Community Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, Natalie Bennett couldn't be here today, but she was our intern this summer um, with the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute STEM internship. And uh, she was Influential and super helpful this summer with all three of us and definitely part of our team. So she's here with us in spirit today. <laughs> all right, so um, we're just going to um, talk about our experience uh, working together as a team between Noah Fisheries and the Metlakatla Indian community. Um, we had a really effective and amazing relationship working together. Um, a, a good relationship and a good example of how a uh, federal agency like you NOAA know, Fisheries um, and a Native community uh, built on respect and trust, um, really uh, working towards a shared commitment, um, looking for these invasive crabs, uh, just was really amazing. And this summer in particular, after working together through COVID, um, was really great to actually get to meet each other in person and now be here together in person. So we're just going to share our story of uh, monitoring for this invasive crab, uh, the discovery of the crab in Metlakatla, and the outreach efforts that we are currently doing and are ongoing and future endeavors. Okay, so the um, invasive green crab is what we're calling it. It's also known as European green crab. Uh, its native distribution is in the Northeast Atlantic Ocean and Baltic Sea. It ranges along the coast from Northern Africa all the way through Norway and Iceland. So definitely not supposed to be here. Uh, it was first introduced to North America in the 1800s in ballast water from merchant ships coming over from Europe. So that's on the East Coast is where it first made landfall in the US. Uh, it's believed that it was transported to the West Coast in Dallas water as well. And that was the first uh, specimen was found in San Francisco Bay in the 1980s. So it took a while to make its way to the West Coast, but unfortunately made its way here. Um, it is uh, transported as well as in ballast water in uh, shellfish, uh, equipment, packing materials, and aquaculture operations. So um, if you're not aware, crabs have a life cycle where they go through a phase um, where they're super small and in the water column swimming around. And in those different phases, they can attach to different things. So not necessarily a full live crab moving around, but it could be its eggs or its larval forms. Uh, they can also disperse in ocean currents, so that's another way that they can naturally move around to places they're not supposed to be. So luckily for us, they're easy to identify. However, we do have some species that are somewhat similar. Um, so as long as you know how to identify them, it can make it really easy to know whether or not you've got crabs or your crabs are your natural crabs. So uh, the best way to identify an invasive green crab is by counting the number of spines. So if you find the eyes on its head, 
go from the eye back. Each side will have five spines leading from the eye backwards. And then in between each eye, they have three little bumps. And that's common for many species, but there are no other species of crabs in Alaska that have five spines behind the eye. Um, they're called green crabs um, in Europe. Their native name is just a green crab or a shore crab. However, naming things after color is never a great idea, and they are not always green. We have some really great pictures later on in the presentation of some orange variations. They can be splotchy or molted brown, um, different yellow patches and things like that. Um, and then when they molt, they can change colors as well. When their carapaces or just their shells are washed up on beaches, they can kind of fade to different colors of red. So don't rely on color. Those five spines are the easiest way to count. They only get to about four inches. So they're relatively small. Um, and they have this really unique carapace shape that none of our local crabs have, where it's sort of like this diamond shape. And they're considered one of the most invasive species in the marine environment because they aggressively hunt and eat prey. They destroy eelgrass beds and they outcompete local species for food and habitat. So this is just um, some really great pictures that we took when we were in that Okatla. This is, um, I think most of these pictures are from Tampa Bay. And this shows the habitat that they like, and also that Metlakatla has in abundance and just beauty. Um, Metlakatla's environment is absolutely pristine, and we want to keep it that way. And unfortunately, these little guys like to wreak havoc on it. So you can find them in rocky shores, cobble beaches, sand flats, and tidal marshes. They especially like eelgrass beds and other shoreline vegetation. They can tolerate a large range of water, salinity, and temperature, and they can also survive upstream of river mouths um, and in some estuarine environments as well. They're aggressive hunters, so they consume both plants and animals, and they're able to filter feed. They uh, eat shellfish, they uh, eat clams, mussels, oysters, they prey on juveniles of the commercially viable species that we have, including dungeon ass. And there's some anecdotal evidence that they also feed on juvenile phases of salmon. They outcompete dungeness crabs and other native crabs for food and habitat, and they overpopulate quickly. They destroy eelgrass beds and habitats. They literally shred up the eelgrass. And uh, that removes that habitat for our local crabs uh, and fish to hide from predators and grow. They disturb sediments and degrade and diminish eelgrass beds that support dungeness and salmon as well. And I'm going to pass it off to Linda. Okay, so um, I am going to share with you a little more on the invasion history. Barb um, has said they're from uh, Europe. They came to the Northeast U.S. Um, in the 1800s, jumped to San Francisco Bay in the late 80s, 1980s. And ever since then, they've been moving north, far direction. Um, but it was in the last couple of years that they really exploded in uh, Washington State. And um, in fact, Washington State, the Lummi tribe, and the Macaw tribes have all declared emergency situations with them now. Um, I'll just share um, one, one little uh, statistic related to that. In 2021, more than 102,000 European green crabs were caught in Puget Sound and along Washington's coast. Uh, this was a 5,500% increase from the 1800 caught um, two years earlier in 2019. So as we see with invasive species, they can have this dynamic of uh, population being present, but then something can trigger an explosion. Um, so you wanna get them early on in an invasion, it's called early detection rapid response. And um, so we um, recognizing this uh, and looking that forward to the fact that we expected green crab to show up here. It wasn't a matter of if, but when. Um, okay. Um, in 2020, we um, 
reached out to Metlakatla Indian Community Department of Fish and Wildlife um, for some potential partnering on getting some early detection monitoring going. And so um, we offered some funding and technical assistance and um, much to our good fortune, um, Metlakatla Indian Community Department of Fish and Wildlife has taken on early detection monitoring. Uh, and so I will turn it over to Taylor. All right. Let's get into what we've been doing. Okay. Sorry, guys. I got a text. Some people are having a hard time hearing. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Let's see. Maybe I'll just hold it. That might be more effective. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our trapping efforts. So Metlakala Indian Community Department of Fish and Wildlife started monitoring actively for the green crab um, in the summer of 2020, about halfway through. We were able to monitor two different sites and we set our traps from shore, monitor for these crabs um, at those two sites. Um, so that first year we only used the folding traps. Uh, the second year we continued to implement those folding traps. We started off by beach setting, but then one of my coworkers actually recommended, what if we strung them out on a line like a halibut skate and deployed those instead? Well, we were able to hit a lot um, more areas around the island, a total of six, and we were able to deploy a total of 30 traps. We did not find any green crab that year. Well, this year, we were doing the same thing as last year. We were also implementing um, some shrimp pots that we had recently got, and we weren't catching anything first half of the year or first half of the season through mid-July. We hadn't gotten anything, um, and that has recently changed, so I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Anyway, so as part of our sampling efforts, we have also, okay. as part of our sampling efforts, we have also been involved in eDNA. So for those of you uh, who might not be aware, um, eDNA is used to detect the presence of different organisms in the environment. So the idea behind this, is that we have Melicatla on this big island, net island, and there are so many different places where these crabs could potentially be located. So it's nice to go around that island take water samples, and then by analyzing those water samples, determine, is this a place where we're finding, you know, JAG markers for green crab? So uh, in previous years, we were taking those water samples um, from the surface, typically at the site where we sat. This year, we actually implemented a Van Dorn sampler so that we could deploy down at the bottom and collect our samples there. Okay. Um, Yes, thank you. All right, so this summer, like I said, things changed. So up until July 19th, we had not seen anything, but then um, Barb and Linda uh, came and visited and they also brought along Natalie, who is um, an intern with Sea Alaska Heritage. And we decided, you know, since we have more people here, let's just do a molt survey. Now, molt surveys are conducted by just walking along the beach, looking for, you know, any crab carapaces or really anything in general that you see and trying to determine if you know, any of those are green crab as a way of kind of like early detection. Um, so while Natalie and all of us were together, we went and did a carapace survey and we actually ended up finding one, Natalie ended up finding the first one literally right behind the awareness sign that we had just put up the week before. Yeah, and it was in the grass. So um, Natalie discovered the very first uh, carapace in the grass, extremely high from the tide line. Um, and Natalie says she was encouraged by her uncle to search these areas because they're the perfect collection spots after storms. So there you can see how she brought, um, you know, some of her traditional knowledge from her uncle to this situation. And that's how we were able to find these crabs. Okay. Okay. So what we did was we found those carapaces. There were third, there were three found on July 19th. On the 21st, we officially found some carcasses from recently deceased green crabs. So we were like, okay, this can't just be some freak event where a storm brought some in. Like we're finding carcasses. There might be live ones here. On July 26th, we targeted the area where the carcasses were found, which is this kind of traditional fish trap area. I'll point it out later. Um, and after setting traps in there for a full tide cycle, we actually caught five green crab that first day. So yeah, it's confirmed now that we have live green crab in Tamias Bay. So our current count 
um, as of 8-26-22 is 82 live crabs that have been removed from the field, 18 carapaces that have been found at different locations, and then eight dead crabs. Turn it back over to Linda Pumpkin. Okay, so um, in addition to the eDNA sampling, um, Taylor was also able to sample from 20 live crabs for population genetics. And the difference between these two methodologies is that with eDNA, you're sampling mitochondrial DNA and you're pretty much looking at just identifying a species. Whereas with this method of population genetics, um, the tissue samples, they'll be able to look at nuclear DNA, which will be much more detailed and um, give you allele frequencies that can be compared to other populations on the West Coast. And what we can learn from that is hopefully uh, some clues as to where these crabs came from um, by comparing them to other West Coast populations. Mm. Uh, yeah, and Marvin's uh, suggesting that I mentioned that on the east coast of Canada, um, this kind of information has been very interesting because they have found that um, crabs that are invading a little further north than you might expect because of, of temperature tolerance, so up into the maritime provinces of, of eastern Canada, um, have um, a, a, a genetics that is um, thought to have been invigorated by a second invasion of green crab that caused them to hybridize and become more robust in their um, tolerance of cold temperatures. So there's a lot of good information you can learn from the population genetics. And now, All right, so looking forward, um, we're trying to figure out what to do next, and it's pretty obvious, and that's get other communities in southern southeast Alaska aware of this issue, know how to identify their crabs, and then find out what to do if you do find out that you've got crabs. So looking forward, uh, we want to continue to expand our monitoring in the state, uh, strengthen our partnerships and outreach and education in these areas. So we produced um, a sign in partnership with Metlakala Indian Community, um, and um, we so we as Noah created like a base sign with just sort of like how to identify them, what to look for. Um, on the right hand side, there's like some of your local species so that you can compare and contrast and know what your local species. So if you find something that looks odd you have something to look at and say, oh no, that's all right. That's something that we're supposed to have here. Um, and then we also put all the contact information on who to reach out to. But when we're in that Lakatla, we don't have a NOAA facility there. We've never been there before. So it's not really right for us to put up a sign and just like wait for the calls to come in. So we work directly with the community to adapt the sign to work for them. So we didn't just slap their logo on, but we also put their contact information so that they are receiving the calls and that they can know exactly where the crabs are found immediately and then respond and go out and put traps there. So that was really important to us to make sure that the sign made sense for them, that it was gonna survive the crazy winds that they have there. And we're working to make different types of signs for different locations. So if it's somewhere where there isn't really a lot of space or they do have high winds, we're working on creating something smaller or um, you know more basic with just how to identify it and who to contact and not some of the additional uh, educational information. Um, we also have a uh, little like pocket cards that you can put in your wallet to help you identify it. So always looking for unique ways to get the message out there because it's really important that we catch them super, super early. Um, Metlakatla is also doing a lot. <laughs> so they are the ones that are out there doing all the trapping, doing all the monitoring, collecting the water samples, um, controlling all of that data, shipping things out. So that is a lot to ask of them. Um, and so we're always looking for ways that we can support them. Usually that's financial, but um, being able to get down there and actually be hands-on, see what they're doing in the community and think of ways that we could assist, uh, that's always something that we're happy to do. So having the opportunity to bring Natalie as an intern down 
just gave us even more ideas for how we can help them get interns into the future or partner them with other similar projects that are going throughout the state um, and, and try and create those relationships and partnerships. So we're going to continue monitoring for the green crabs in Metlakatla and then hopefully our new locations. So if you're in a community that is interested in creating some monitoring efforts, please approach us anytime this week so we can get your contact information and, and start making those connections. Um, Metla Catla is also very happy to share their experience with you and their knowledge. Um, one thing I think that we've learned a lot is learning from the others who have already gone through this. So obviously Washington, Washington State is going through this, Canada all the way down the West Coast. So seeing what others have done, what traps work, what bait works, we've kind of got it figured out hopefully. Uh, but of course, when you bring it into Alaska, our environment is different. Everything is slightly different. So we need to have that room to modify. And so Metlakatla has been really amazing at finding ways to create efficiencies um, or, or better ways of doing things that maybe we didn't think of or nobody's done before. So some of the easy things that you can do now um, is this uh, idea of citizen science, right? So you can get out in your inner, inner tidal and look for these crabs. They're easy to identify, five, find five spines. And it's, it's easy as taking some students out, some young kids. Um, even if you can't necessarily identify the crab, you can always take photos and then bring them home or bring them to someone that maybe is more experienced with identifying that they can help you. So this is something that anyone can participate in. Um, many eyes makes it a lot easier too. So in a lot of these photos, there are multiple people out there looking for crabs. So the photo in the middle is actually us in a Tlingit fish trap. And so there were tons of native crabs in these fish traps. Uh, and they were about the same size as the green crab, so it was really difficult, but there's probably like four or five of us out there, like picking through the fish trap, looking for these crabs. So it's it's kind of fun, it gets you outdoors, and I think you could easily add it to something that you're already doing. Um, if you're doing stream surveys or something like that, just spend a little time on the inner tidal. Okay, so just to give you a bit of an idea of where we have been finding these crabs, we have primarily seen them in the Tangus Bay area. So um, that area you see kind of highlighted there um, inside the inlet. So that area is very unique because not only is that where the hatchery is located, but there are also a lot of field grass beds. And while we have been monitoring in that area, we have been catching a lot of young dungeonettes. So it is very clearly a Dungeness nursery. Um, so we have found most of our green crabs so far in the traditional salmon traps. We think that maybe uh, the crabs are more likely to get stuck there and not have that ability to get out and move with the tide as a result of, you know, the native traps, they kind of act like a giant pit trap. Anything that gets in there during high tide will get trapped during low tide, basically. Um, so more, most of our fish traps have been found there. We've also been finding them kind of heading out towards Crab Point. So wish I could point to the map a bit more, but basically going north and south of where that yellow dot is located. Um, yeah, so we had monitored other areas on the island doing like carapace surveys, trapping. We didn't see anything along the south side at all. However, recently we did find some carapaces as well as a couple of deceased individuals over on the other side of Smuggler's Cove, where that other yellow dot is located closer to Metlakatla. So this was the first time that we have found these crabs anywhere else on the island other than in that bay. And as you can see, it is located directly on the other side of that peninsula. So, I mean, it raises a lot of questions. It makes us wonder, is there already a population of green crab over there? Because I mean, we found a dead individual, it's not just a carapace. Um, However, we have been trapping over there. We have yet to catch any live individuals. Um, I've also talked to locals who have told me stories about seeing, say, like a barrel over in Smuggler's Cove or in Tamias and watching it within the span of a day go around the south side to the other beach. So, I mean, it could be possible. I'm personally hoping for that. <laughs> but 
anyway, this discovery has made us uh, start to really wonder like where else could we have these crabs and we're not yet seeing them. So that's why we're really cracking down on our eDNA efforts and collaborating with others too who already have eDNA samples to see if we can determine if you know green crab might be present on other areas of the reserve. Okay. In closing, uh, we have a couple of statements from the Metlakatla Indian community. I'll give the first one. So the Metlakatla Indian community recognizes the significance of this landmark discovery. Now that green crab have been confirmed, it is vital that cooperative effort be made before the population becomes established and results in devastating impacts to the marine environment that supports the vital fishing industry in Southeast Alaska and potentially all of coastal Alaska. Malakala Indian community is on the front lines of this invasion and is uniquely situated to monitor and trap in areas on and off of an island reserve, including islands to the south, such as Duke, the Percy Islands, and other vulnerable salmon and shellfish habitat. Malakala Indian community also is aware that coordination with partners is the best way to address the impact. Perhaps this these invasive species will have on the ecosystem, economics, and the lifestyle that is precious to all who live in Alaska. Therefore, we look forward to improving the partnership we have, adding new partners, and learning as much as we can from each other in this epic battle. Thank you to all of our current partners. And with that, we will take some questions, and I'm going to put up the last slide, which is just a, a photo of the crab. So please take out your phone and take a picture and uh, bring it back to your community and let people know how to identify it by counting the five spines. And if you see something that you think is a green crab, or maybe you're not sure exactly, you found a piece of a carapace and there's five spines, but you're not really sure, um, feel free to get in touch with us. The state also has a invasive species hotline, which is one eight seven seven invasive I N what is I N V S I V. I don't think there's a V at the end. Yeah. So um, you can always call that hotline number as well. And there's an online portal. So if you have taken photos, you can submit the photos to them and they will verify for you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your efforts uh, to date. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm with Ketchikan Indian Community, so we'd love to partner with you guys on this. I'll talk further later. But in addition to monitoring uh, and the trapping, uh, is there a way to control these species? Are we talking eradication would seem to be impossible? Is it this invasive species? What kind of control techniques, uh, uh, chemical, biological, are, are even able to consider at this point? Yes, excellent question. I appreciate you asking that. <clears throat> so ever since we discovered green crab in that area, we have just immediately begun eradication. We are putting as many traps out there as possible. We currently have over 80 shrimp pots deployed in that one area alone, and we are in the process of acquiring even more traps. Um, there's currently no way to really control these species or to eradicate them completely since they disperse larvally. Um, so you basically just have to really get on trapping them right away. And I'm hoping that we have found them early enough that, you know, we could at least like slow the spread and control it to some extent. Does that answer your question? Hey guys, we have a question online. They want to know if the green crab graphic, uh, the graphic of the green crab awareness signage could be shared. So are you talking about on the screen or? I think maybe uh, via email. Okay, yeah, we could share that via, via email. And I'll also let you know, we partnered with the Washington State um, Native Program. That's what it's called, Native in All Caps. And they actually had that design already available. And they just said, you know, first come, first serve, who wants green crab, you know, signs. And we said, me, I want them. So uh, we were able to work with them to customize them a bit, you know, to add our logo, our information, even to kind of change some of the crafts that were represented to be, you know, specific to our location. So 
yeah, the believe it's um, Washington University of Washington um, Native Project. I recommend reaching out to them, and I can give you more information about that later if you're interested. Hi, what a great presentation. Uh, so just a quick statement, and then I'll go to a question. Um, if multiple tribes choose to work together or to do this work, like with eDNA or doing some baseline work, that would be considered as gathering baseline data that you could do with your gap grants. So, so just kind of keep an eye on this. This is a really, I've been watching these green crabs for like 20 years ago. We were writing newsletter articles about them. And then my question is, and I think I know the answer, but are do sea otters prey on these or are they too high up in the intertidal? Um, so they are, um, there are green crab in um, Elkhorn Slough in California, which has a pretty high otter population. And my understanding from what they have seen there is that the sea otters do prey on them. So, but that's, that's Elkhorn Slough in California where that information comes from. Yeah. Well, just wondering if you could explain the destruction of the eelgrass, what it looks like and how extensive it is. So what they do is they can bury into sediments and they stir up the sediment, which then can settle on the eelgrass blades and reduce the photosynthesis. And they also can actually physically shred the blades. So cut it up and shred it. Uh, I guess you'd have to ask the main crab that question. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, foraging for clams Taylor has offered, which sounds like a really good explanation. <laughs> yeah. They might also, you know, they're filter feeders and they might eat some vegetation as well. They're a, a pretty broad um, consumer. <laughs> they're not a specialist by any means, which is probably part of their success is that they will eat a lot of things. I have a question. Do they carry PSP? And um, if other animals eat them, does it affect them? So interesting you should bring that up because we were just discussing that at lunchtime. And I don't have like a definitive answer for you, but because they can filter feed, I suspect that they could. And if, if something ate them, I suspect it would, it would go on up the chain. Yeah. Uh, so would you need to use gloves to collect them? Would it be safer to use gloves than just your hand? I mean, just question. I don't think. So not, I don't know in regards to PSP, but I will tell you these crabs just stick out like a sore thumb. They don't behave like native crabs. They have pincers that I feel are just so much sharper. I mean, they're a much smaller crab, but I've been cut getting pinched by these crabs before. Um, so just all around, I'd say just, use gloves for the sake of making them easier to handle. And I don't know if it applies to the PSP situation, but it could be a good catch for that as well, if that's a thing. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, just a relationship. I know when I was fishing uh, that we always looked at the crabbing and the halibut because the halibut ate, and sometimes you can look at that and realize you're gonna either gonna have a good halibut season or a good crabbing season. So maybe it can answer a little bit to that. But also that you know I'm part of the the commission of uh, the federal commission CRAC, and data is a entry is is really important. What I'm I'm realizing and is there a program a a, a place where the community like myself or anybody can go on the site and actually share, yeah, I got 20 crab today. They're about this size. I threw away four of them. And even the relationship with the fish and game, um, I find that the uniform needs to be changed so they don't look so official that they look like they're more like us and they're just coming and more friendly ship relationships of more so of finding and getting the data on the table because I believe that's that that's key. 
So just just sharing a couple points. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you too. It's my understanding that um, we are collaborating to work towards having some kind of database where potentially people could contribute their own data or data that we have received from the people we can put in there. Yes, I agree. Um, with this effort, collaboration is important. Like just as a side note, um, I actually grew up on Prince of Wales um, for most of my life. So, you know, us finding these crabs on a net island has really been worrying me because, you know, my family was just a little bit north of there on Prince of Wales. And it's really like driven me to realize we need to coordinate, you know, this isn't, you know, just a separate situation. This affects all of us. It could affect all of us. Uh, Tony here again. Hey, uh, thanks. I just want to add some information, I think, related to a couple of questions. Um, fishing game, I've been working with fishing game on this. I actually thought I found one, but I wasn't quite clear in the Ketchikan area. Uh, so I did work with fishing game uh, reporting that. And they do have a good system for online reporting, but they're invasive species. So you could submit pictures and texts, and they've been very, they were very responsive of working with me on that. I froze a sample and sent it, took it to the local office. So um, there is a mechanism right now. It's more broad than just focused on green crab. It's invasive species, aquatic, but fishing game has been responsive here recently, um, earlier this summer. I Now I know better. Now I can identify them much more easily myself. <laughs> So it was it was a false alarm. I just want to clarify, or is that still being that was that was a false alarm? We we confirmed, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm just curious. Is there a time of year when they spawn where you might ramp up capture efforts or use that to your advantage in some way? Yeah, uh, I'll tell you off the top of my head, I do not know when they spawn. However, being in contact with the Lummi tribe and people down there who have been trapping, it sounds like they are more intertidal during the warmer parts of the year, so like the spring and the summer, and they've been noticing that trapping deeper in the winter, like close to 100 feet deep is actually more efficient. We're still getting them that time of year. Okay. I can comment on it. I, I don't, well, so this is the first <laughs> population in Alaska, so we can't really say, because we haven't documented when they might spawn here. However, uh, they're spawning like a lot of other species. It would be based on temperature and, and um, you know, duration of, of temperature that is conducive to that. And so um, in areas south of us, the, the spawning would be in spring into early summer and the trapping season is typically aligned with that. So April to September, because that's when they're spawning and more active. And then people would stop trapping in the winter, maybe because they go deeper and they're not as easy to catch and they're not as biologically active. Um, so just, you know, speculating, um, it might be that um, the spawning season here might be a, a little bit later than what is seen further south, but probably generally in that spring to midsummer time. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, folks. That was a beautiful presentation. Very informative. Thank you. Okay, let's welcome the Department of Environmental Conservation Division of Water Updates with John Wendell, Compliance Program Manager and DDC Division of Water.
Good afternoon, Randy Bates. Um, everybody okay? Do you need me to pick the mic up closer? Can you hear me okay? We're good? A good thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It, it's a real privilege to obviously be here. Um, it, it would be the one day we have this week, probably this month, to be outside. It would be, uh, we could have had this on a stage somewhere uh, near to this, but uh, good to be in here. We just walked across the street. We're at DEC just a, across the way and we didn't need sunglasses and we didn't need a raincoat, which are two uh, very interesting aspects of, of getting here. Very pleased to be here. I'm Randy Bates, a brief introduction. We moved here when I was uh, a young boy, 1973, before Egan Drive was in place, uh, long before a lot of the housing developments in, in town. Um, I grew up commercial fishing, grew up playing sports in Southeast here. So I got to visit many, many communities, both through my fish adventures and through sports. Um, gained a great amount of respect and, and certainly formed a lot of my opinions and, and, and cultural respect uh, moving around. There's nothing like playing basketball. Anybody from Angoon? Any, uh, any representative from Angoon? Incredible. Um, nothing like going to Angoon. <laughs> this is a good story. I'll tell you, this is a good story. Nothing like going to Angoon. Being welcomed by Ivan Gamble, the late Ivan Gamble. Can't remember which one it was. On the beautiful land that we live in. Um, on fond memories. I have a degree in fisheries at university. I got a, a, a graduate work in fisheries through the University of Alaska Fairbanks Juno office down here. I, I am continuing as a commercial fisherman, so I, I'm a, the director of vision of water at DC. I'm also fishing both the gillnetter and a troller. Um, long after I retire from the state, I will continue to be a fisherman. So it's it's a it's an important message I just want to share with you. I'm a southeast person. Home is Juno for me. The water that we manage through uh, a Clean Water Act and Division of Water matters to me. My livelihood has depended on it. It will continue to depend on it. And, and I respect that. And, and hopefully the decisions that I make are also reflective of that um, value and the importance that I believe in, in maintaining and protecting that water quality. I have worked for the state for 23 years at DNR, Natural Resources. Um, I was the director of Habitat for a while at Fish and Game, and now I'm the director of Water at, at DEC. So I've got a, a, a fairly broad perspective on things. 23 years, brings, I've seen a lot of different, uh, different situations. Very, very privileged to be at Water with folks like Gina, folks like John. Uh, we have a tremendous team. We have a massive portfolio of what we have to deal with as it relates to water, water quality, and the health of, of our waters for uh, both ourselves and the aquatic organisms that live in it. So um, I want to share just a few of the things that we're doing, some of the happenings going on at DEC in, in water. They affect you, they affect me, and, and you'll hear more about them coming up in the, in the near future. So in general, I would say our mission is to um, uh, protect and manage water quality as one, the first and foremost piece, and then second, second branch of our office, assisting communities improving in improving their sanitation services. Um, so we've got a, a big chunk of change and, and a big responsibility in helping our villages and our communities improve both their water and their wastewater delivery services for their health and, and, the, and the residents' uh, uh, capacity. Yesterday, um, I think I was up on stage yesterday with Rob during the, and, and Jill during the transboundary discussion. One of the things they raised was the human health criteria and particularly fish consumption rate. And Guy was right on. I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of things. This is, this is no kidding. This isn't real fish, but this is a plastic version of fish. If you do come up and take a look at it. They had a picture yesterday and uh, this amount 
This is 6.5 grams in my hand, this little piece here. I was right on, Rob was right on. That is the current fish consumption rate as identified in Alaska. This is a bite. This is what I, maybe a big fork, big bite. But this is what we currently have as the um, fish consumption rate in Alaska. This piece, which is quite a bit heavier, 175 grams, this is what Washington recently uh, implemented as their fish consumption rate. The amount of fish per day their residents eat on average. Massive difference. We are fully aware that this is inadequate. It's a simple discussion, but it becomes quickly complicated, no doubt about it, quickly complicated when you start looking at things like salmon, which is a major component of our um, of our diets up here for all residents. Um, salmon only spend a small portion of time in state waters. That's the only time we really consider what that harvest or that consumption rate is, is, is the time that that fish spends in state waters. Those salmon leave generally about this big. When they come back, they're this big. The time they spent gathering that mass was in federal waters. So we're not typically taking advantage of that in terms of what we consume. We only consume what's in developed in the state. We are fully engaged at this point with EPA, who is asking us to make progress on the fish consumption rate. We are committed to making progress on that, developing regulations. We will be going out with a, a public um, solicitation. Let's talk about this. Uh, we had a working group put together a number of years ago. There's great recommendations that came out of that. We will pick that up, dust that off, share that, go back out to the public um, and re-engage in this effort meaningfully in the next two years. EPA is issuing a letter probably in the next couple of days. Uh, the commissioner or I will respond to that and we will commit to dead, uh, deadlines, milestones and products so that we have a, a, a revised fish consumption rate at the end of the day. That's a, that's a big deal. It's a very challenging prospect. It's simple. It seems so simple, but it so quickly becomes complicated when you look at the, the formulas and the challenges and, and some of the other pieces. So um, just, I know that came up yesterday during the session. I look forward to making progress. And please pay attention to that one and engage with me on it. It, it, it is critically important. Cruise ship legislation, that's another piece that maybe you've heard about, um, but it affects us. How do cruise ships, both large and small cruise ships, how do they discharge? What do they discharge? Does it affect us? How, how should we be concerned about this? Um, our division, and John in particular, and, and whether he touches on it today or not, um, we are charged with the oversight of those cruise ships and their discharges. And so we do inspections, we do compliance management, we take a look at what they discharge. We're on board every vessel um, that comes into the state. We take a look at their systems, make sure they're operating correctly. It, it's, a, it's a significant issue for us. We, we provide probably more oversight for the cruise ship industry than for any other industry operating in the state, oil and gas, mining, uh, or publicly owned wastewater treatment facilities, anybody. So this is, we recognize that it's important to you. We believe it's important. The cruise ship industry also thinks it's important to be held accountable. Um, so there was a, an article in the Juneau Empire a couple weeks ago, front page, that was a good article. Um, we have a, an op-ed or an opinion piece that's gonna be coming out maybe this weekend, maybe next week, but I'll be submitting that to the Empire in the next couple of days. That'll give a rundown of what we've done this summer and what we're seeing in terms of cruise ship management, what the discharges look like and how their compliance is shaping up. So um, John's got a, a good handle on that too since he oversees that section. So, um, And we expect to introduce legislation again this year, uh, this coming session in January, February, to overhaul how we manage cruise ships, make sure that we're doing it appropriately um, and embracing the idea of uh, some, some changes that are necessary in both the statutory framework and regulatory implementation. So you'll hear more about cruise ships uh, in the next session. That's, a, that's hopefully gonna be a big deal. We have a number of regulations that are out there on the street. Some of you may know about them. Wastewater treatment disposal, that's a big chapter. We're overhauling that chapter uh, revising some pieces in there, cleaning those up, organizing them in a better way. We've got some historical regulations that are out. These are some pieces that we submitted to EPA. 
2003, 2010, they've been long-standing unapproved regulations. We're just cleaning some of those up. Um, and, and, and since EPA didn't act on them, we're actually removing them. So we don't have a, a conflict in our regulations. We have another package out there with some clarification pieces. Not, those two are not very substantive. They're not a big deal. They're just in, in many ways cleanup, just capturing current common practice. Um, infrastructure. This is uh, this is a major issue. You'll see front headlines all, all the way um, for the next several years. Infrastructure is a very, very big deal for rural Alaska. And fortunately, DEC and the Division of Water is, is just absolutely front and center and, and game in this. $2.2 billion coming to the state. It is a landscape changing moment for rural Alaska to be able to deliver water and wastewater in a, in a safer manner than we currently have. So this is a tremendous landscape opportunity to change. Um, we are partnering with Indian Health Service, uh, our normal partners, Indian Health Service, uh, ANPHD, um, and our regional partners that are, are participating. We're going to leverage all the available monies, 2.2 billion is coming in. We have a certain control over some of that. We will not leave a dime on the table, not a penny. Uh, we'll work with our partners to make sure that the money that's due to the state comes to the state, goes out to the communities to improve their sanitation facilities um, or better systems in those rural communities. So we're looking forward to working with all of our partners and, and communities on that to prove the service to the residents. Um, the last one I'll talk about very briefly, and this is, I'll, I'll share a couple slides and then we'll turn it to John for, for some additional information. Um, dredge and fill. Most activities, and so this is the dredge and fill program assumption. Do I just push the button? You want to push the button for me? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Apparently, I couldn't do that one first. So I went too fast, too far. Um, so we have a number of primacy programs at DEC. Primacy means we get to assume the authority that is captured in the federal regulations or federal uh, authority, and we get to implement that at the state level. We've done that for a number of programs, including the Clean Air Act, um, the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, and the Clean Water Act. There are others out there, including the RICRA or Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and, and we got legislative approval a few years ago, and we got funding to do that this coming year. So the Division of Environmental Health is working towards that. We also have the opportunity to take over the dredge and fill program, section 404. Back in 2013, we got the legislation to do that, but we don't have the funding to do it. And so that's what we're going to be pursuing this coming year is a fiscal uh, fiscal support to be able to man that pro person, that program, and, and advance it so that we have the authority in the state to uh, implement a 404 program. Thank you. It's massively important because uh, 174 million acres of Alaska is wetlands, wetlands that is controlled or, or permitted through the 404 program. Um, that is 65% of the nation's wetlands, 43% of our land mass, water mass is covered by wetlands. Critically important, um, almost every project that's out there, uh, go ahead, next slide. Almost every project that's out there uh, uh, driveway pad in wetlands, uh, a cabin, uh, Ted Stevens facility. Most projects out there, development oriented, are going to require a 404 permit. Uh, and that comes typically from the Corps of Engineers. What we're trying to do through this initiative is assume that responsibility, work with the Corps of Engineers, and implement that program uh, as a state program. So it'll become a state 404 program. Um, that's uh, it's it's a tough lift. It's a heavy lift. It's a it's a tough project. Only three states have done this to date. There's probably another 12, 15 states that are interested in it. But I mean, in the history of the program, only three states have done it. Um, you can you can understand the the tough challenge that we have in front of us. Uh, without a doubt, 65 percent of the wetlands in the nation, 43 percent of our land mass covered by wetlands. It's important for us to be able to influence and guide development on our lands um, and, and do it in a manner that is coordinated and consistent with what we're trying to do as a state through the development of our resources and protection of our resources. We'd rather do it than leave it in the hands of a federal agency um, 
that takes direction from from DC and rides a wave of policy. Next, next one, please. There's a number of reasons um, why we should do this. It, it's you know we want to be accountable to the Alaskans. So the legislature would would hold me accountable as an implementer. Um, we can integrate our dredge and fill program, a, a permit to, to put riprap in the bank. We can integrate that with uh, our 402 program that John will talk briefly about. Makes a seamless permitting effort. Um, efficiencies, cost savings, um, flexibility. Here's a here's a big deal. This is one of the main one of the two main reasons I think we should pursue 404. Every project, almost every project in the state that has a 404 permit associated with it have to provide what's called mitigate, offset mitigation. And so if you're gonna have an impact on wetland for one acre, the Corps of Engineers requires that you offset that through mitigation or you provide some sort of um, help for another acre of, of territory or so. There's a formula out there, there's regulations that control it, but compensatory mitigation means if you're gonna impact an acre, you have to do something to better um, the Corps of Engineers is controlling that, and, and we have seen some areas where um, corporations, uh, businesses, mom and pops are being held to a level that they simply can't develop their properties. If you've got a 20-acre plot that you want to build some some pads and some some uh, housing, you know, if, if you just own that and you're trying to build it and you're trying to create some opportunity for both yourself and some others that are in your community. The Corps of Engineers may require some compensatory mitigation that far outfeeds uh, your own property value. You may have to offset 20 acres somewhere else or purchase something else for $100,000, uh, uh, $500,000. So the state wants to get in control of that so we're not being held uh, hostage or, or um, uh, other by a federal agency who dictates what that compensatory mitigation requirement looks like. Time and cost permits issued uh, again, Alaska. We know Alaska better than DC knows Alaska. I mean, it's a common thing that we typically say as bureaucrats. Uh, we'd rather have local knowledge put into decision making here rather than, than somewhere that looks far away. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of politics that go into uh, programs like that at the federal level. We'd like to get them put into the state so that you can come to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm agreeing by this. Help me understand why you did this or help me get a permit because it's in our state and we need to, we need, we need this particular uh, resource. So lots of, lots of different reasons, but it really comes down to being able to guide policy, guide development in our state and reducing that mitigation requirement or making it more palatable for our own residents rather than being dictated um, on a cost by cost basis or an offset of uh, land basis. Where we're going with this right now, the, the legislature on the 404 piece, the legislature did give us a million dollars and said, okay, we'll, let's have a conversation next second. They gave us a million dollars and said, come up with a feasibility study by February 1st. So we're in the midst of that, trying to come up with a, how, how would we staff this program? Why should we develop this program? What would the state gain out of it? That's gonna be the feasibility study that'll be talked about in February with the, uh, with the legislature. We will, hopefully no one from the administration is here, probably not supposed to release budget items, but um, I'm putting in a, a budget item for FY24 um, for the 404 program. It'll have 28 staff at this point. It'll be about a $4 million program to run. Um, that'll be our ask legislatively. Uh, and after that, assuming that there is a, a positive response by the legislature, we'll begin that application process and within two years, which would be an aggressive schedule, we'd have approval and begin implementation of that program. So it's a heavy lift. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity. It's These programs are designed to be picked up and implemented by states. And, and it's just something that we think is a natural progression of how we manage our vast amount of wetlands up here in Alaska. So um, briefest of overviews on what the 404 is. I'm going to turn this to John Wendell, who's our uh, program manager for compliance and enforcement. The rest of my afternoon is free, surprisingly enough. Um, and if there are questions on any of this, uh, fish consumption rates, um, uh, 
infrastructure. I'll, I'll hang out a little bit. We can have side conversations, but I'm also here for questions in, in, in the crowd as well. So. Afternoon, everybody. So my name is John Wendell. Uh, like Director Bates mentioned, I'm the Compliance and Enforcement Program Manager in the Division of Water. Uh, I've been with DEC for about six or seven years. I came over in the Division of Air and then made the hop over to water uh, where I've been ever since. And so I'm going to spin off a little bit about what um, Director Bates was mentioning with the 404 program and talk about the 402 program. Um, they're both regulated under the Clean Water Act, um, but the 402 program DEC obtained primacy of um, back in 2012. Um, and so kind of like what was mentioned, assuming primacy of a EPA federally regulated program is a bit of a process. And so DEC originally uh, sought approval to assume primacy of the 402 program back in 2005. Uh, we got approval to kind of move forward. And in 2008, um, we got the um, House Bill 20, 149, um, which we put forward to modify some of the DEC statutes and regulations. And then we assumed full primacy of the 402 program in 2012. And um, the 402 program is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And within Alaska, um, it's referred to as the Alaska Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or the APDES program. And so what the APDS program regulates is discharges from industrial activities, um, such as mining from hard rock, plaster mining or gold dredges, uh, seafood processing and kind of shore base and offshore facilities, uh, stormwater from road construction or industrial activities, uh, like boat repair yards, things like that, uh, drinking water backwash, uh, domestic wastewater treatment facilities, which is probably what people most commonly associate wastewater discharges from uh, aquaculture facilities, which are like hatcheries, um, excavation, dewatering, oil and gas, and non-contact cooling water. It's just a couple examples of uh, industries that we have general permits for, but we also have individual permits. Uh, in total, we have about 2,000 permittees throughout the state, and um, we have an inspection regime that we go out and conduct on-site inspections of um, on a, a certain frequency. And so um, one of the questions that you know comes up is what exactly does this charge look like? Um, and so here's an example um, of two different types of discharges. Um, so the one on the right, as you can see, is just an end of a pipe. Uh, there's water coming out of it. Um, and then the other one, which is a little bit more uh, difficult to see sometimes, but in this photo it shows it pretty well, is off on the left side, you can see that kind of um, disturbance of the upwelling coming up. So there's some kind of an underwater marine outfall. Um, and so depending on what's actually coming out of those pipes, it may be regulated or it may not be. Um, in this example, the discharge on the left that's underwater is a regulated discharge. They have upwelling limitations and things like that. The pipe on the right is actually just stormwater. So it's just uh, you know road stormwater is going in a conveyance and it's getting um, just pumped out into the bay here. So that would be like fresh water. So what is the compliance program? Uh, we're about 20 staff spread out throughout the state. Uh, I have staff list here in Juneau, Anchorage, and Fairbanks. Um, we are one of the six arms that reports to the director. Uh, the other ones that you might be more familiar with are the facilities group, who has remote, remote maintenance workers, um, the Bill of Safe Water, and then our uh, technical assistance, uh, our water information program, which are our data people, and our admin group, which is our budgetary side of it, and then our water quality standards, which establishes um, ambient water quality standards, and then our permitting program. Um, and so we work hand in hand with all of those programs within the division, but then we also work with other programs within the department, such as environmental health. Uh, it is a little interesting when we get phone calls from the public who are asking questions about drinking water systems. Uh, the Division of Water doesn't actually regulate drinking water systems, environmental health does. Um, so it's you know building that relationship internally. We work with other resource management agencies such as Fish and Game, DNR, and then other state, federal, municipal, for-profit, nonprofit, and then individuals, permittees um, to help them. 
And so how we determine compliance is through site inspections, record reviews, uh, document requests. Um, and so CEC, like I said, we go on site, um, answer questions while we're there and, and look at permit requirements. Um, we also do compliance assistance through phone calls, outreach with the community public, um, and then also enforcement. And uh, DEC is no slouch in that realm. Um, since about 2020, um, we've enforced um, a number of facilities through formal enforcement actions. Um, and then we've also done informal, which could be um, anything from administrative violations of failing to submit documents to uh, more significant violations like unapproved discharges. Um, and then that goes all the way up to formal enforcement, which we do with the Alaska Department of Law through administrative civil orders. Um, and like I said, since 2020, we've assessed about $2 million worth of penalties to various organizations for violating the permits. And then we also do complaint investigations. Uh, we have an online complaint portal where members of the public can reach out to us and let us know about um, maybe bad actors in your area, uh, but then also if people have questions, uh, we have helplines and everything like that. Um, so sometimes we deal with it internally in the department, but we oftentimes work with other um, boroughs, municipalities, or cities um, to help uh, have people come out and look at things, uh, maybe when it doesn't rise to the level of uh, like a state enforcement action. And so kind of the big news for at least my program is um, the environmental data management system. And so the environmental data management system is um, a data replacement project that started back in, in about 2020 um, and was examining kind of a rehaul of our data system. Um, and so we were working off of some pretty old programs and then we had a lot of them. Um, so the environmental data management system kind of seeks to consolidate a lot of those but then it also is going to give the general public more access to kind of the inner workings of the department and what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there's a lot of information that the department compiles. A lot of it is publicly available, but there isn't a real great method to get that information out. And so the environmental data management system will allow you to do that. Um, things like inspection reports, enforcement actions, all those types of documents that public has access to, you can just go online and find yourself now. Um, so like I said, you know, document retrieval, um, you can go in and just pull off an inspection report and find out who the permittees are around you. Uh, a lot of times people just are unaware of who's permitted to do what. Uh, sometimes we get calls from the public saying, uh, you know, we see somebody out there dumping a bunch of dirt into the channel. Um, you know, for a core problem, but we would coordinate with them for uh, you know any kind of just information requests people have. The, the environmental data management system will also give you direct contact with the division. Uh, so if you're submitting an application to our engineering support and plan review for a septic system, um, the way we kind of explained it, well thought of it when we first started doing this is if you've ever ordered uh, like a pizza from Domino's, you get like the Domino's pizza tracker. It's just like your pizza's in the oven, you know, your order's been received, so and so is out for delivery. Um, you will be able to kind of track your submittals like that and see it as it works through the process. So it doesn't just go into this void of the department and then, you know, eventually you might get an email or a letter. Um, through the EDMS, you'll get, you know, direct notifications, you'll get uh, automatic reminders, you'll be able to see who's processing your plans and where it's at. Um, so it'll give you a lot more direct contact with the staff in, in the department. It's also going to allow the department to comply with um, some EPA reporting requirements. Um, EPA e-reporting rule phase two will go live in 2025, and that requires the states with primacy, uh, like Alaska, to allow permittees to submit certain types of information electronically. And I have a link to it. I don't know if you click on it. Oh, I have the click on it. No, okay. Well, there's a link. Um, so if you go in there, um, you know, we have a lot of development that we've done with mapping programs 
you'll actually be able to see um, hone in on a specific area and it'll just have little pin drops for where all the permittees are. So if you're, um, you know, in Ketchikan and there's a, a lodge somewhere that you're, you know, they discharge and you're saying, do they have a permit or not? You can pull them up on the, the EDMS site explorer and see if they do in fact have a permit. You can see when they were most recently inspected. If it's been recently, you can pull out the inspection report yourself and see what's going on. So it really um, is going to open up, you know, the department to, or the division um, to the public, and you're just going to have a lot more contact and the ability to find that information. Um, as always, though, if, if you do have questions, um, if you're looking for records, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to the division. Uh, we have help desks and help lines, um, and they can get those documents for you. And with that, um, I'd just like to thank everybody again for having us. It's a huge honor to be here. Um, and we will take some questions. As we as we ask questions, I caveat John's uh, two million dollars. That's a hefty that's a hefty set of fines. That does not go to the division. I want to be very clear. That goes to the general fund. We are not incentivized to be enforcers. We simply do it because it's the right thing to do. Thank you guys. Just a couple of questions. I don't want to take too much of the time. I have a, a whole slew, but I, I know there are some others out there that want to, uh, to ask and comment as well. Uh, in regards to the fish consumption rate stuff, um, I, I know Gay, Guy gave a, uh, a presentation and an overview on that. And just to remind people, uh, in regards to what a fish consumption rate is, yes, we are at a 6.5, but again, why we want to raise that fish consumption rates is, is to ensure that we're raising the human health criteria, meaning that if we raise the human health criteria, that also allows for pollutants to be less in our waters, which gets in our fish. So just a simplification for you guys out there. And my comment, one comment on that too is, I don't, in my opinion, and I, I know this is policy stuff, but I don't feel that um, the rates should be based whether it's federal in federal waters or state waters. They come in and out, so essentially it doesn't matter. It's still going to be in the state or feds, and it's still going to be in our systems. The other thing I wanted to say is that tribes. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, very please, quickly, right. and this is this is policy, and I'm not setting it right now. We have a lot to discuss, but when you do, and you made a very good point about um, fish consumption rate and the importance of it relation to, as it relates to human health criteria is the uptake of pollutants while they're in that system. And the reason the reason the federal side of things isn't included is that they're not uptaking you know, freshwater system pollutants. They're out in a marine environment that we maybe don't have as much control over when they're in the Gulf, right? So, True. so those are, we're, we're not walking away from the aspect of Fish is a major issue in Alaska. We consume an immense amount of it as a, as a state. We have to account for it. Marine mammals are also not accounted for in that calculation. Exactly, I was gonna get that. Okay, I'll, I'll pass no, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> we have to consider that. We have to talk about that. Seal liver, um, I ate it when I was in Huna. First, first bath of all trip I went to. Seal liver, herring eggs. Yeah, we have to account for that. How do we? That's not part of that calculation right now. So we're engaged with EPA on these topics as, as we go, and we look forward to um, engaging and being transparent with the public on these too. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and that's one of the things we're, uh, the tribes were talking about back in, I believe it was 2016, was working to have that, the title change from fish consumption rate to seafood consumption rate, because we eat more than just fish that comes out of the water. Um, and in regards to the tribes, I think that's something that we're all looking to pick back up again, you know, uh, with the, with the, the Trump administration that kind of went by the wayside. Now that we have the Biden administration back, we're looking into these things. And these are something that I think the tribes are looking to pick up. We're hoping to get, you know, I know Guy and, and Wrangell Cooperative Association and SEITC is working to do that, but we also want to be able to ensure that we're doing that on a regional level too. And because Alaska is so big and so diverse, I don't, we don't know, we don't know what the best approach is. And I'm sure you guys don't either on the state side, but when I talk to the EPA, they don't need.
for tribes to, to get involved in this and start gathering the data and higher statistics. Uh, the North Slope and, and whatnot. So um, I know that's something that we're all trying to figure out, but I'm hoping to hear what the state has to say in that regard. And I'll end there because I know Tony's got some stuff to say to you. Are you looking for a response? I, I'm happy to give a response so we can move to quite whatever. No, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah whatever. That's it. Yeah. And it's a simple response to be determined, right? I mean, we absolutely recognize the working group that did the work um, several years ago uh, identified regional differences in consumption rates. You know, somewhere, I think it was Western Alaska, was up around 350 per day. Um, yeah, and, and but we're basing our information on what we had at that time, and that is utilized. That's information that comes from the Fish and Game Department of Fish and Game through their subsistence division. So there's a uh, we have to dust some of this information off ground truth to gather additional information if we need it and then have a discussion of how we approach this. Um, and so we have not made those decisions. There's nothing that's been decided policy-wise at this point, but um, there's a lot of dialogue that needs to occur. And that's great to hear. I just wanted to say that with the tribes developing, developing their capacity and the development of our guardians program, I think these are great ways to really update that data and work collaboratively together. If, if I could, the, another issue that I've heard that I, I'm not, I, I don't have a handle on, I'm not sure how to deal with it, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with it, is with the declining runs that we're seeing salmon-wise, just, let's just take chum or king salmon on the Yukon. Um, what I've heard from, from some folks in, in various conversations I've had, um, the desire to eat as much salmon as possible is not captured in these fish consumption rates because you're not allowed to capture enough salmon. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an odd conundrum we have right now. You cannot go fish because you're limited in fishing time. Does that mean that rate is a, a, a lower than it should be? Lower than it should be reflected. So, look, I, I'm, I'm aware of these issues. Like I said, this is a simple 6.5 grams isn't enough, but um, it gets complicated very quickly, um, and, and we just have to work through some of these things so that we all understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're going to move it forward. My mic's off here. Okay. Uh, uh, Tony Gallegos with Ketchikan Indian Community, and, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, I was fortunate enough to sit on that working group a few years ago. I uh, appreciate the work of the staff and all that. It's, it is a very complicated issue, uh, uh, and I hope that you'll really, really think about this seriously moving forward and get tribal input on that committee. Uh, which wasn't, or that working group, which really wasn't there. I sat in on, on it, but I wasn't a member. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of nuances involved with that. The formula could be tweaked a little bit too. There's a lot of different issues as long as the EPA approves the standard that we utilize. Um, so I know that's a difficult issue. I'm glad we're moving forward on, on that and collecting more data. Uh, which will be necessary. Um, so thank you for that. I want to switch over to uh, Senate Bill 180. This last summer, uh, Senate Bill 180 was addressing the Ocean Rangers program. And I heard your presentation uh, that you did one evening, uh, kind of sharing the, the state's uh, perspective on that. Uh, and Overall, I think most, just, a, just a general overview, Ocean Rangers program puts actual uh, employees from the state, your department, on um, the cruise ship lines to do some monitoring. And that was kind of set up by statute several years ago, but it hasn't been operating for several years now as well since the Dunn Levy uh, administration came on board. I think that was kind of ceased or put on hiatus for a while. Uh, but uh, the tribes, all the feedback I've gotten from the, the tribes is that they really like the Ocean Ranger program. It gave the community a lot of more assurance that uh, the state was actually physically present, uh, that uh, you weren't just checking at the ports, but you were, we had staff on somebody there doing some oversight during the entire cruise while they're in Alaskan waters. And that, again, uh, 
there was potential problems with the program, no doubt. But uh, one of the things, uh, the legislation that, that got stalled out this summer uh, was to officially eliminate that, change some of the funding strategies. I think you have recommended um, just doing a lot more visits at the port uh, and spot inspections, that sort of thing. But one of the things that we that was brought up, and I don't think it was really, really considered, was that Ray just mentioned the Guardians program. The tribes are really trying to staff up, and the Guardians program could be another methodology that wasn't considered in the legislation because it was kind of written and brought forward without a lot of chance for the tribes to have input on it. But uh, working with Carla Hart and others, uh, we think that the way that you know, Senate Bill 180 was brought forward um, and, and, and that formula needs quite a significant number of changes for the tribes could really be supportive. And it wasn't just the tribes, but uh, considering a tribal input on into that or even tribal uh, individuals that are trained to support that and physical in the future, whether it comes up through a legislative act or you make a staff recommendation for it um but that that is definitely a concern from the tribe so i'm more than a question comment it's just something that you can be aware of sure. the uh, other thing related to that which excited us in catch again was you were looking at redirecting funding to help with our uh, wastewater treatment plants which are uh, a problem uh, and i appreciate the fact that working with the tribes in the state uh, on our beach monitoring program that I think is going to be helping, uh, going from Ketchikan to some other communities uh, where the tribes are, are working with your state to, to get that bacteria um, data on our recreational beaches. We didn't know we had a program because the state really, the state, nobody was actually doing any monitoring for years and years. So we had water quality issues that we didn't know about because it looked pretty key, but we found out we do have bacteria problems that are significant, and that's led to an impairment status in, uh, in some of the waters in Ketchikan and the Narrows. Question, yes. <laughs> what is uh, the state going to be able to do with the next phases of doing some sort of trying to correct that problem by planning or changes in, you know, what's the state's engagement moving forward with trying to correct that impairment status? Sure, sure. Tony, thank you. And and I know that uh, uh, Ketchikan Indian Community partners with DEC and, and Division of Water on a number of things, the beach program, monitoring, and some others. So thank you for your partnership on that. Um, on cruise ships, I hear you. I understand the concerns you raised that I'm familiar with. I am also interested in the conversation um, with villages, with tribes that, that might be concerned. I'm happy to have an open conversation about what that legislation was. Um, uh, and, and, and gather more information and input as necessary. So yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, uh, I look forward to that conversation. On Ketchikan, yeah, you're gonna see, we just, I just signed a letter today to EPA um, for our 2022 integrated report, which is going to list two more beaches in Ketchikan as impaired. Uh, we knew this was coming. 13 of 13 beaches in the Tongass Narrows are impaired from fecal coliform. It's just at a level where you should not be harvesting uh, the clams um, and, and eating them because it's just unsafe for, for human consumption. Um, and the unfortunate part, one of those beaches is where I believe, Tony, there's a, a we're, we're, we're teaching the kids how to harvest from those beaches. And that's a, that's troubling to me. Um, how do we clean that up? There's a variety of reasons why uh, there's impairments out there, but it is fecal coliform. It is fecal coliform is the, uh, uh, how do you characterize it? It's, uh, it's the bad thing, it's a bacteria in your effluent. It's, it, it's in your poop, it's in your pee. It's that stuff that makes you sick. Um, there are anecdotal stories that when the dogs go swimming down certain beaches, um, they get sick, so do the kids. So. We've got to find a way to clean up Ketchikan waters. It's not necessarily in the state's hands uh, so much as it's a, it's largely in Ketchikan's hands to be able to recognize this as a problem and, and solve it to some degree. Um, some of it comes in, you've got small little enclave communities that, that have collective common collector systems that are inoperable now. You have a, a variety of um, 
uh, uh, unauthorized discharges of parks that are discharging there. You've got um, some other areas. There's a, there's a whole host of reasons. We did put out, um, Gina, were you, were you part of that? We put out a, um, our water quality group put out a Ketchikan watershed document that had some very specific suggestions, Tony, what you're talking about, many of which are Ketchikan community-based. Um, and, and it's going to take ownership and act, action by the community to recognize the challenge that we have there and help clean it up. John recently had a meeting with the cruise ships um, that fly the waters there and say, hey, quit, quit discharging in the, in, the, in, the, in the narrows here. I think it was through that whole narrows. We've got an issue. Your, your discharge may be compliant, but we don't want to add anything to the water that might further exacerbate or load the system. So we're certainly recognizing the problem. We're doing what we can. We've had this conversation with the legislature's uh, reportees, Senator Stedman, they're aware of the problem too. Um, there's just not an easy solution because you've got so many pockets of discharge and it's not a simple system there where we can capture it and clean it in terms of a, a wastewater facility. You've got Charcoal Point that's operating under a, a 301H waiver and that's their discharge in, in excess of around, if not in excess of 1.5 million people units. Um, that's yeah, well, you're, you seem to be aware of the problems for sure. And thank you. Uh, we, you as, go, as do you, though. Yeah, regret, I, regret uh, there is one thing that you mentioned you were, were in your uh, decision about uh, increasing uh, or taking on the 404 program from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and that you would be requesting additional funds and be adding a lot of staff. Uh, one area that I think I that I'm really disheartened over is the fact that our Alaska Monitoring Assessment Program, which monitors all our surface waters here in the state, it really only has like two people, or maybe it's 1.5 and, and a couple of people contracted. It's it seems very inadequate to do monitoring on all our streams with such a small staff that it's very it seems inappropriate. So when it comes to budgetary changes and priorities really beefing up our ability to monitor our surface waters is really key. And I think the state's been dropping the ball for a long time to only have such a small group and have so little data that the state's collecting on behalf of our surface water quality. Um, and then so looking at taking on 404, which um, it would seem to me like a misplaced uh, priorities from what I'm hearing. So this just a, a thought on that. I have one one final question. I'm going to give it to Guy. The um, and this is this is really related to the MPDES. You know, MS scores, the municipal separate storm sewer system. You guys don't seem to be doing a lot of work on. Tony, it's not a requirement. Oh, okay. no, you had it away. Okay, uh, MS scores, you're not really doing a lot with. And one of the things we're really concerned about that was mentioned here is temperatures, climate changes that influx of making our streams, if they're too warm, it's uh, not good habitat for our salmons, maybe even to the point where they can't survive. Uh, there's a lot of best management practices that have been utilized throughout the nation where we can uh, start to do some more work proactively to start to address some of the, you know, the pipe stuff from our storm sewer systems, our roadways, which could not only bring in pollutants uh, and metals and stuff of concern, but also uh, this temperature flux. So I would like to see the state start to address that and promote that and provide opportunities to do more demonstration projects and really promote in any of the design work that they're putting in stormwater best management practices. That's fair. Um, one second, Guy, and I'll, I'll very quickly, I appreciate those comments. I'll, I'll certainly take them to heart and take them back. Um, we've been in a declining budget scenario for a number of years, and so we've had to uh, trim, you know, I try and use the, I don't know if any of you are steak eaters, but if you have uh, uh, venison, whatever the case, there's no more fat to cut. I mean, we're talking about meat. We're talking about programs that we're having to cut because we've been in this declining budget scenario. It's just very difficult. And so we're as refined and lean as we can be. We don't have the opportunity and, and uh, the staffing to do everything we want to do. Um, so it, 
This year may be different. Maybe we have a, a, a oil price that's a little bit higher. We're not going to be facing cuts the way we have been in the past. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity. I'll certainly think about it, take it back, and have conversation um, and, and see what we can do. Guy, if, if we have time. Okay. Yeah. And I'll try to be respectful of the time. Um, I'm going to make it going to talk about the uh, Palmer project up above Cluck Lawn and Haynes. And I'm going to make a couple of observations, give you a quick question, should be a good yes or no answer. Um, you know, the one observation I'd make is that your department did not keep its promise to keep the residents of the Chilcat Valley informed in your decision making process when you approved a construction permit and then didn't tell them for over two months later. Uh, that construction permit allows the company to build the wastewater disposal system before your departments even come to any decision on the remand and any conditions that would actually allow them to use the system, but they're gonna get the constructed anyway. Your department also is refusing to allow a public comment period on this let's just say revised permit, although it's obviously a new permit. Um, and it is well within your discretion to do that. And you can comment on any of those as you wish. But my question is, does the Department of Environmental Conservation have any affirmative evidence that that wastewater discharge will not show up in the surface water of Glacier Creek at Salmon Bearing River? Do you have any evidence? Thanks, Guy. I, I certainly appreciate your perspective. I, I can you characterize it in a way I wouldn't agree with. I, I don't see it in the same way. Um, there is no obligation on our part to public notice a plan review. That's an engineer doing engineer review. That is uh, how the treatment works run. There has been no change to the permit. I will give you an update just for everybody's perspective. Um, the permit remains in effect for the Palmer project. They recently submitted a plan amendment, which is a, 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 an engineer to engineer review that we typically do hundreds of on, on an annual basis. Um, my staff approved that. And so that goes back in place. Um, that doesn't change the permit at all. There was no amendment to the permit. So that's an important reference. Those are separate, sub, a subset of the permit was that plan amendment. Um, there is an appeal that's uh, that's been requested right now. So um, the commissioner's office is looking through that. That also, I think there's a couple, a few more days to, to weigh in on that. There's also a pending informal remand decision that's, that's on my desk right now. Um, and so part of that remand is evaluating, um, are there changes to that permit? And is there, have we met through the issuance of that permit that, that functional equivalent test that there is no conductivity between the discharge of the groundwater and the surface waters of the of the systems there. So um, I will say that uh, uh, I'm going to wait a little bit on on the decision that comes out of the commissioner's office on that appeal request. But I do, uh, guy, you got to know, and, and those from Chilcat, I don't know if anybody else is here from Haynes. Um, that remand is on my desk. I'm, actively looking at it, I will be issuing that decision probably within the next week or two. Um, so be prepared for that. And that'll that'll come back out and, and it give everybody an opportunity to take a look at what those uh, uh, what that response is. And if there's permanent amendments, uh, it'll kick off another round of uh, public notice and comment opportunity. So. All right, guys, I, I'm terribly sorry. I know you guys, you have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions. Uh, I want to thank Randy and John for coming to talk with us at Southeast Environmental Conference. It's always good to see the state of Alaska here. Um, if you guys, you know, feel free to stick around throughout the rest of the afternoon. Uh, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit though too. Uh, I know everybody's clamoring for a break. Um, so we'll go ahead and give it a 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene at 2.50. And John Smith will be presenting on uh, the history of environmental impacts of time. So please come back. Enjoy your break. And thank you guys. Oh,
Come see me at the table if you haven't received a raffle ticket today. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Go ahead and give everyone a, a moment to find their seats before we get the next presenter coming. Thank you again for all the presenters today. Um, as you can see, you know, most people will be sticking around, so feel free to continue conversations, um, you know, outside of the conference. So that's kind of what we have this structured. So uh, if you need any uh, information, feel free to reach out to one of us staff here working the event. We'll be more than happy to help you, you know, connect or if there's any information you'd like to have, contact info, emails, what have you. Um, but yeah. We're going to get started for the next presenter. Uh, John, I don't know if you have a slide or presentation or, okay, right there. awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, turn the time over to John. Uh, John, thanks for being here. Great. Great. Wasayeti, how are you? It's good to see your faces today. Thank you for being here. Ho 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 ho. Uh Shikit Gay Nak uh uh Kana Wu Clay history name. Uh I have another name, De Kit Laten, the one who sees far. Um, uh, and then I my pet name is uh when I was growing up was uh Popeye. Uh Young Walk Ha. I used to like to pretend to be Popeye, and then during a party one time I dressed up like that as a goofy thing and and they started talking to me. Hey, do you, you want? Can you invite that Popeye to come and uh, join us th this next time? So later on down the road, it actually became a new name to the Kapwantan. So it's really great. Just want to share a little bit of my strengths so you understand who I am. I I, I see a lot of uh, great people out here and really uh, stimulated by all the information. Um, but just want to share a little bit of who I am. Um, thinking how to award for a uh, tribal caregiver, award for a NAMI caregiver, coacher and owner of the Huna Huskies Wrestling Club from 1990 to 204, partners with the University of Fairbanks 4 H program, a partner with uh, Darren Snyder. Uh, Juno Douglas High School wrestling coach for five years, member of clinic, Clinton Heide Community Council team. Just this year, I got on this year, um, and I'll share why. Uh, I'm in environment. I'm in environmental uh, in respect to the land, sea. Taking a lot of classes at the university, climate and energy, uh, four terms with the Juno Commission of Sustainability Energy Plan uh, grant for electric bus, electric charges, plugins, and my my main mission why I jumped on board was emissions. Uh, I actually went to school in, in Denver, Colorado, and received the admission. It's the biggest test I ever took in my life, and then come to Alaska and not use it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm also uh, uh, heating, air conditioning, hydronics, ASAA, gold certifi uh, certification, and advanced. Uh, auto diesel technician, uh, Denver Diesel Automotive College, associate degree. I'm a, a mechanic, welder, fabricator. I'm also a construction contractor, Popeye's working hands. Uh, and then also I'm a diesel technician, uh, Smitty, Smitty's Diesel and Automotive. Um, I've taken a lot of uh, support classes because I work with families. 
So I went to Hamilton University in Minneapolis and took a restorative justice, uh, which I found myself doing some teaching, which was really cool at realizing that was part of our culture. Uh, friendships and relationships with UAA, uh, child development. Uh, I'm a cultural specialist that worked with the kids and the students in the community, but also in Southeast of Alaska, all the way from uh, Yakutat, all the way down to uh, um, uh, Ketchikan area. And so, so I've been all over uh, supporting families and I'm a lifetime member of the a and uh, a lifetime member of the Huna Mount Fairweather, the oldest, uh, uh, I mean, it was president for four years under uh, um, Lily White and Alice Haldane. And I'm also, uh, um, of course, in Tom Guantan, but we have a nonprofit organization um, with uh, our, our group over in Sitka. Uh, so just to share a little bit of the, some of the things, my, my strengths, but let's get into the, to what we're talking about, the environment. Uh, uh, please understand uh, metaphors and similes for kids and, you know, always uh, understand that, that uh, we talk that way. So also to think about Greek mythology, uh, understanding uh, uh, that theory of, like take for instance, Poseidon, he was the God, he was the control of the, the sea and water. Just like some of these, you can see, these are uh, uh, Clinkett's uh, mythology up here on the table, and we'll talk some about that. So right now, I just want to talk about um, um, the word gal. Uh, our people say it's the drum. And of course, our Kampuantans, we have a drum house. We also have a bell house. But we relate the gal to the universe. And a lot of our aunties will will use Gao as a time on the, as, as the clock. But of course the clock, it's round. It's not because it symbols the drum. It's because it's related to time. Uh, the earth rotates takes, 20, takes uh, 24 hours to move the moon. Uh, those around the earth 30 days. You have 365, the, the, the moon and the earth go around the sun. Uh, this is what the Gao means. It's all related to time. And our, under, our people understood this, the time, and using it to travel and understanding it and connecting it to our stories and history and our stories and our history share about how we've fallen off of track and how we got ourselves back home uh, by using the stars and moon. So we understood these things. And, and of course, we lived out in the environment. So we we, we, we got to see and visually watch them and, and take notes and document. So I look at the Clinket mythology, um, just like the Bible, you can connect the two together in Gao, in time. And you can see that they had the flood, we had the flood. So we all share this, this history together. So speaking in, in, in um, collecting and where where we share things to, together, we call that ha shup, shup ka, and that's what we collectively collect together. Now, up on the board here in our stories, my wife was sharing a lot about uh, the the strengths of the story: eagle, hawk, petrel, you know, and who came first, the chicken or the egg? So. Um, in a way, I'm going to try to try to share that. Eagle's birth is, is physical. Each one of them have these traits of physical, but Eagle, that was his number one strength. He still had the spiritual and emotional and the intelligence, but his master was the physical. And he was the oldest. And then Hawk was the next oldest. He is, is, is the spiritual. And in the story Vicky was sharing, that was the fire. That was the element. And Gunuk is the emotional. The water is the element. And then Raven, he's the youngest. Many ravens were born before him. We're not sure how many, 
before this one raven was born from Te, Teyakuta, stone like heavy, stone boy, where he was, his mother was encouraged to take earth, heat it, to make it temperate, and then swallow it. And then raven was born, this raven that was born. Now, now he was strong enough to endure all the things that the world, his uncle, was going to put upon him. So you could see in a little bit of the stories, the science, the math, and the oral history. Uh, you're just connecting the, the elements that are connected to all of these Tlingit uh, 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 families here. When Eagle was born from the sun and the moon, Lord to earth, you know, the, the, his, his father was the sun and the moon is the mother. And then we're lowered, the men were lowered from the son, their father. And when they leave there, he says, hey, you're going to forget. So like you children, you were already sent to, and you already have a strength. And of course, it's your responsibility, he would say to you, to figure out what that strength was. And that's what you do when you're here on earth. You're trying to figure out what your strengths are. So uh, one day when uh, Raven was, our uh, eagle was born from the sun and the moon and he was lowered from his father to earth, he was learning and he was uh, learning about the earth and, and about his skills. And as he was a young man, he started to fly and he was starting to realize how high he can fly. But as he was flying and he was going along, he started realizing that here goes Mother Mother Moon going by and he's trying to fly and catch him. All of a sudden the moon uh, started to follow him. And you can see that in the morning sometimes when the moon, when you wake up in the morning, it's leaving and then you see the sun chasing it. So there's a relationship and then a vice versa. So it kind of showcasing the relationship. But as Eagle was flying, he was flying higher and higher. And as he was going higher, he finally realized and looked and he seen the star. He saw the moon and the sun. And they were all lining up in this strange balance called the eclipse. And this was the learning. This became a teaching. This became a, a, a knowledge that Eagle uh, absorbed and became the master of. And that's why he, he was put in Tao Earth House, the responsibility of Earth House. So Eagle was actually set right there on the Nas River. And this is the man that, uh, these are his brothers. So when he boxes these items into the box, just realize that he was a heavy, he was in the dark. So what he did was he was starting to put his mother, his father and all the children in there. And why did he become this heavy? It was actually, there was a, a time where everything was wonderful. Everything was beautiful. Everybody was living happy, but something happened. And that left uh, uh, Eagle in a jealous situation. He actually married his father's sister. So there's some history here and some story of why these things happen. And then the strength of what happened to Hawk. Um, of course, you heard earlier that his feet became really big. And so he had issues of uh, um, doing what he normally does. So here comes Raven. And make note, he's the youngest one. Every one of these, usually a lot of times in our cultural stories, like even the loon woman, where or the, the loon girl, where she disrespects the loon, and all of a sudden... Here comes, uh, she disappeared. So all the four brothers, four brothers come up there. The oldest one, hey, I got it, you guys step back. He already made a mistake. The second one had some other issues. This other one was busy doing this. But Raven kept sitting over here, the youngest one. And because he was the youngest one, he learned from all the other ones. So there's a teaching that's in these stories that share this, of how uh, a lot of times the younger one is the one that gets things done.
Now, just like I was saying that there was a time when uh, life was life was good. And there was a time where where things changed and got dark, just like what we're going on. So right now, I'm going to share in our in our culture of Northwest Coast Art and Design, we have specific colors. We have the black, we have red, and we have turquoise. And of course, there's all other colors. But our first color was uh, black. And black uh, represents the past. I need to drink the water, sorry. represents the past where people were environmental uh, controllers. They managed the environment. They took only what they needed from the water, the beaches, and the air, land, sea. The oral stories that this uh, shares the respect to the land, the air, and the sea. The one story that I share about the salmon, the bear, and the salmon people, where the bear weren't letting the salmon up the creek, so they had a conversation and talked, and they came up with the plan. Raven uh, releases the sea creatures. This is when uh, a spirit was uh, hoarding them and putting them away, and he went down and found the key and actually went down and opened them and released all the animals that were being uh, contained. And then Raven pulls the salmon house in. And actually, this is a actual location in Dry Bay in our history where you can actually see Raven's uh, foot when he planted it there, when he started to pull in the, the, the salmon house and releasing all the salmon. And then Salmon Boy, where a young man disrespects the salmon and then he becomes that salmon. And when he comes back, he has a different perspective and a different look and the respect to those salmon people. And the woman of the tide, the story of my wife, but my wife has that story uh, amongst the berries. And of course, uh, um, the woman of the tide lost her husband, of course, during this time. And then of course, her husband and them would walk down to the beach together. And as they walked down the beach, the tide would go out, they would harvest. And of of course, there was a time where the tide wasn't going out. And so Raven went to go see what was wrong with his auntie. And where did he find her? He found her in the woods picking berries. Why? Because she lost her husband. She didn't want to go down to the beach. It was too many memories. So she sat and ate up there. But then here comes Raven. He comes and he says, hey, you know, auntie, I'm sorry this happened, but everybody has, you know, needs to eat. You need to go down and and do what you're supposed to be doing. So and then, of course, that happens again, where, where, where this time he finds her. Later on, everything goes good, and she starts to eat again. But then later on, uh, Raven takes off and goes into the interior, and then ends up hearing, and now something's going wrong. The tide's not coming in. And so it's starting to stink and smell. Things are dying. So here comes Raven. Where does he find the woman of the tide? She went down to, to do her job and she started to eat, so the tide went out. But she started remembering her husband. So she sat there and cried. And Raven found her, that's where she was. So what he had to do was uplift her, get her back up. Come on, Auntie, love you, and walk her back up. And then the tide came up. And then he sat there. It's kind of showcases healing, but also the respect to our foods um, of being there and, and knowing that in our healing situation that we're always going to have to stand by and be an anchor, be a support team. And it's not over yet. It takes time to heal. So that story shares that, but it also shows a lot of respect to our foods. Also, um, the Helmet Book shows a lot of respect. Her Harold Martin, I want to give him uh, uh, a lot of love. He uh, wrote a document years ago, and that's what actually put the 30 hook skate on the table. And in his introduction in that paper, he talked about, well, you guys need to go to the museum. There is a knock, a uh, hook in there, and you need to carbon date it. And that was actually what helped him 
put the stamp on getting us uh, sovereignty to harvesting the halibut. And of course, the halibut is a respectful thing. It, ma it only catches a certain size of fish. Now make note that in my generation, I'm a fisherman and I'll share a little bit about that. But you see this J-hook? It's actually, they use uh, the theory of this J-hook, I mean, circle hook. When I was a young man fishing, I spent a lot of the time changing them because they used this technology and made this. And you can see it in the design, okay? And we used to lose a lot of fish with the chain hooks, but with this, you don't. Almost every hook, we would have something on it after we uh, did this. So here's some history, but also some love and some care to making sure I seen on Facebook where uh, a gentleman caught a really big hell of it. And as he was gonna go gap it, he let it go. And everybody on the boat was upset. And then he explained to him why, uh, how many eggs that these big halibut carry. And that's why he left and let that fish go because he was being a good steward. Yeah, you know it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of science, a lot of math, a lot of history here. Even, even knowing that uh, many generations ago, there was no spirit on there. It was just a stick, but it had the same. And then all of a sudden, they, they used to use a bone. And then the baleen, you can see this one has baleen. But what happened when they found steel? This item was actually supposed to float like this on the bottom. And there should be another line over here. You can't have the line going here, going up. This will just wrap around the line. And you need to have a rock here and actually another line of rock to up to the buoy. So when they put the steel on there, it just drops. And of course, the spirit, they bring it to the, 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 the spirit man. And he looked at it and he said, oh, I don't have a spirit. So he made another one. Of course, it made a bigger piece of wood and then it started to float. Yeah. So is that science or is that... You know, just to explain a, a little perspective, and you can see that the two different woods here is science. And this has to do with our boats too, our canoes in the kiln. You want all your weight right in the center of that. So you don't tip this way or that way, but it keeps it upright. And the, the one that's on the top is the lighter wood, the wood that's gonna float more. So you see the two different species. Harold Martin, two yeah, across the team. I'll see you someday, my friend. He's an amazing man. When did the gardens come into play? You know, uh, when I grew up, now make note, our, our people traveled and you know, the clinket potatoes ended up here. In the 17, 1800s in Sitka, there's documentations of huge gardens with huge vegetables. They had cows, chickens, horses, goats, you name it. It was huge. Haynes, uh, Club Juan, uh, Angoon had one of the biggest potato. Uh, in Huna, I grew up in Huna. Uh, uh, Richard Dalton Sr. He was uh, managed the garden right on Spasky Island. If you guys know where that is, that's in Icy Strait. Uh, right out here in Juneau, the Juneau Boy Scouts camp was another location. As a young kid, I want to, uh, it's not me that's standing before you. Mr. Whiting was one of our teachers in school that took us and taught us how to build a greenhouse. He showed us about uh, uh, rocks. We did a study on rocks to see how which rock would actually uh, retain heat and hold it longer than the others. So when we built the frame or the floor of it, we decked and put rocks inside there and then opened it and put a deck on the top where it was open. So, so during the day, the heat would come in and heat those rocks up in the evening and walk in there, it was warm. So I really appreciate uh, uh, the education that happened when we were kids 
uh, Yoris Sondland, he was one of the number one. Uh, I fished with him as a young kid. He put the record. You can actually look him up for catching some of the biggest halibut. Uh, I'm sorry that I wasn't a good steward, but I didn't know that then. And of course, I was hungry. I was. I needed the money. So today, I would definitely do that and release those those salmon. But I worked with your, and we caught a lot of big fish. Uh, so I share to try to be a good steward and uh, um, release those big ones. They're they're not as good eating anyhow. Uh, just to share a little bit too is uh, like I was sharing uh, your sovereign. He owned a boat, but he also uh, used a lot of his waste in that on his garden. Uh, he grew some of the biggest vegetables that, that I've ever seen. But one thing I noticed about him, even Lucianetti, he lived down on Lombago Way. And I used to run around and help him out and make a little money doing that. But I learned a lot about their mastering and what the key was to growing food was the compost <laughs> and the soil and the nutrition, just like many of you guys were talking about earlier. I like that. So I became a master of that through the years and I teach that here. And I truly believe in the hot composting. I've heated up a box in three days and keep it going for 30 days. And I can run, uh, I have pecs running through it where I can run water in 120 degrees. The water is coming out the other end. That's the cool stuff right there. We have another place at the re reuse yard. Uh, I have a group of buddies that we hang out there and we have some sustainable uh, greenhouses there where they're up on top that catches the water. You can watch inside and pull the string and it waters all the stuff inside. We have a compost pile right next to it where we have a, a pipe running through it where we have air and it's blowing heat into the greenhouse. Cool stuff, cool stuff. So, um, and these are things that I virtually believe our kids need to learn so that they can start composting at home and recycling all this stuff that's going to the dump. Uh, Lisa, I'm part of the Juno, I was for four years part of the Juno Commission of Sustainability. And for four years, the first year I was there, I didn't have to apply again. They wanted me to stay. And we did so many good things. You could see the electric bus, electric plugins, uh, the composting that's going on. At one time, we had all the, the bins that were out at uh, Thunder Mountain High School and other locations, but they were being abused. So, you know, regular garbage is being thrown in there. And I think we should have kept those. And I think we should have just made a plan of trying to help the community get, I know a lot of people don't have money to put garbage at the dump. We could help them. We should have opened the door for that and then keep those. I really think that was a really good thing. But those are just my opinions. They're up. Uh, I was a fisherman for many years, and I'll share some uh, Richard Bean Sr., the Donna Ann, Vic, uh, Richard Bean Sr., his dad, I was on, I fished on the Donna Ann. I thought I was in trouble when he told me to pack my stuff, but he took me down to his boys boat, the Western Queen, and I started fishing with him, Saney. Paul Rudolph, uh, uh, I went black conning with him, and that's when I was 10 back in those days. And, uh, Paul Rudolph was actually a construction man too. And that's where I learned a lot of my, uh, uh, my skills in construction, mechanicing, and welding and fabricating, um, even to where uh, uh, his, his brother, uh, Rudy had a two story house. And I don't know if you've ever been to Huna, there's a dead man's hill, it's very steep. And our plan was we put two, two logs on him and tied him up and we used a D6 and a 988. And we pulled it up that hill and all the way down there. And people weren't thinking we were going to do it, but we did it. It was great. It was a good history. Uh, also, crabbing. Um, I crabbed on a boat. And I'm sharing these boats because um, I fished with some very respectful people that honored and, and followed the rules. But I also fished with some folks when I was younger that I, I knew I needed to get off of there. We were, we were over harvesting. I actually worked with a, a crabbing back in the day. I think I was only like 14, 15 where I went down and I met the guy for my buddy. And the next time I came down and my buddy wasn't there and the guy took me out fishing and I ended up taking his job. 
but he had two boats. He had one that only went four knots, the other one went 21. And so I would jump in the one, we would go catch the other pots and then he would run me to the other guy that was only going four knots and then I would go on his boat. We had a live tank in Huna. It was some of the biggest crab, Dungeness crab, world record crab. They were posts, they were actually um, sending them out. We were actually have them live tank there where a plane would fly in and we would load them up on the plane and then directly go to Seattle right away. To the, these guys got rich where actually they left their boats when they left that they uh, over harvested. And I actually left that position because I, I really felt I wasn't doing good there because of the, the over harvesting that was happening. It put a lot of money in my pocket, but I didn't feel right at that time. So even uh, when a young man and a seal, when I remember seeing on the boats where there was seven, eight, 10, 15, 20 seal hanging and there were deer were hanging and uh, you know, this over harvesting of our foods, things change. And a lot of it had to do with money. So even uh, talking about the gardening and the, the respect to the garden, I was a logger. I worked for Whitestone Logging 28 years. I'm retired in Tungus Timber. Uh, I worked in a, I worked, started in the shop but ended up moving out in the, into the woods as a hook tender. And the things I saw weren't the same thing. It's just something inside of me uh, brought out to where I uh, was talking to Dennis Gray Jr. at that time where he was actually working for Huna Totem. And then Chris Buck before service, John Hillman uh, uh, and some others from some of the other corporations came out to visit. And uh, we ended up putting a tree planting uh, group together. Um, I just advised them and supported them because I was busy, I had my own business, but I helped them get, get started. And it was really good because we were looking at as young kids that they were taking, they, they logged all these other units and never went back. So then we were looking at that. So it was this young kids that stepped up to, to encourage that. And Dennis ended up starting a business and it went really good. And then it encouraged the other corporations to do it so. So now there was a program in place to where we logged the unit one year after, then they would come in and transplant. But I wanna talk about that. I wanna look at it different because they came out one time uh, Russell Dick was working with them and they came to visit me and I was busy. So I was a, a, a bullet and uh, I shared with them, I was upset with them that they were wasting what was going on out here, all the materials and stuff. And you're working us to death. And so I gave them an idea and I want you to listen to this. Um, what I noticed in logging in years that when, uh, there's a lot of saplings and they grow really good. This country is rich as you can see the watersheds that are here. So what I saw was when they would log those units that there were already trees growing there. They didn't need to go plant because when I finally went with Dennis to go in the field, he was walking and his guys were plowing. But there was one there growing nice and big. It was beautiful. The other one over here was just fine. So what were they were doing they were over planting there now. So then when I saw that and went out with them, they said, hey, you can't do that. They said, knock some of those down. We got the nice one there. Clean everything around that. You know, pull some other one. You know, look at it in a, in a different view. Um, so that kind of put more work for the, you know, they're going in. Now they have to go back again and thin again. We don't want that. So trying to make things better. But also logging, when we logged it, we would go and we would cut all this, this, this one 120 foot tree, beautiful, 36 on the, on the butt end, just beautiful. Just on the butt cut, you're talking $5,000 or so. But then they leave the top and leave all the other. Back then they, we had pulp. The pulp marking in situ was open. So we took everything, but when they did it, we started leaving everything. So when they closed, we stopped, we started leaving good materials out in timber. I was upset about that. When they came to talk to me, I told them, 
You need to drop that tree, no buck, get it to the landing, leave everything up there. Maybe we took all the luck, but we take all the wood off of there. Or we take the wood that we need to make us money, leave the rest there because we can make fuel, we can make pellets. There's a lot of materials you can do out there. It's not going to help out in the field. I know it's the carbon or the nitrogen that it might give out there, but it really doesn't need it. It's, it's rich out there. So I see a flaw coming in. They even drag the butt uh, on the ground, the stump, or not the stump, but the butt of the tree. As you're pulling it up there, you're like gardening. You're, you're opening up the ground. You're getting ready. Some of those seeds are falling off as you're banging it around and dropping down. They're getting planted. Not to mention you're just opening it up so you so things get ignited. And our people too, it's like at that point, if we took everything out of there, how about our tribe goes in there and they start managing that garden, that beautiful garden? Because what I noticed was they left all that stuff there. I was thinking I had this deer on there. Oh, I'll just walk out in the unit. It took me 10 hours to get down 600 feet where I should have stayed in the woods because all the bush and the branches that were in there and I was falling all over. Just imagine if all that was out of there and we have blueberries growing and then we had a farm. Our people could come in and harvest. We managed, we, we could grow blueberries, cranberries, huckleberries in there because that's what I saw. And I've never seen an owl. I've never seen a uh, a hawk before, but when they did the clear cuts, that's what we saw. I saw the first owl, the biggest, I thought it was an eagle. It was the first owl I ever seen in my life was because they were clear cuts and they were hunting and using that, that area. So those are just ideas of what I saw. So I think uh, looking at logging in a different field, uh, in a different way, uh, and holding them accountable to taking care. I fly over from Puna and other places. I have tears in my eyes because they're not taking care of them. So when I was talking earlier, so I'm sharing the past, the present, and the future. So I'm kind of sharing some of the things I've seen and what was going on before. But like I was saying, uh, many generations ago, our families were happy. They were they were being good to the land, the air, and the sea. And then things, I saw those things change. But I also want to look uh, to the red right now. Red is in, in our, our, around our ears, our nose, our mouth, because I'm talking to you right now. I'm sharing with you. I can smell. I can uh, sense we're we're talking about this information. So what is going on right now? Is the you know I really enjoy and shared a lot about the Juno the, the the Juno Commission and all the things that they're doing, um, the composting that's happening, the air control. Um, um, is that Randy and John? Uh, I work for the commission. Me and Duff Mitchell and the group went on board the uh, Queen Princess. I was floored uh, how clean it was. And even the brown water that they were swapping to clean, I, they brought out a cup, I was gonna drink it. And the guy grabbed it from me and he said, no, no, no. He said, it's clean, but I found a cup over on the floor. <laughs> so that's how the, the system on there is just amazing. And that would be cool to see. I know the brown water that you know I know there was issues with a lot of their system here, and I really encourage that. And I look for all of us to support Angoon. I've been going back and forth to Angoon for a while, and they don't have fresh water. Uh, I really encourage the support there that there's these people that are in here that can back them up and find a way to support them. Um, all the education that's going in the school, of course, I'm an educator. The first place I started here in Juneau was Riverbend Elementary School. Guess what the first thing I did? They have a garden there and it's very sustainable. Um, I started the garden there using the funds of Indian Studies and uh, Darren Snyder called him in and the group we got a good program going. And then two years later, I got called to Thunder Mountain. 
And then I got called back in a meeting to come back to uh, uh, Riverbend and they were saying, well, hey, nobody's doing the garden. And what I told them was, hey, you gotta get your coveralls on, get busy. <laughs> uh, it's a good way in many ways to teach a healthy living, uh, math, science, but it's a place for mental healing too. That's where I took the kids to, to vent and, and to get back their spirit and get control of their, and then they would share and you start building trust in there and they start sharing their feelings and then you're able to really help them then. So understanding that our education, uh, and then when I went to Thunder Mountain, we started one there, Santa Kahini. Um, so everywhere we went, we knew that that was a key, uh, a key for um, us to cut up to connect with our kids and then educate them in many different ways. Um, time is short here, so I'm going to step right into turquoise. Now, I really like this piece because it's an important piece of our, our history is the turquoise. Where is the turquoise? And you can see like right up here around the walk, the eye. And why is that? Of course, uh, where did turquoise come from? Of course, copper. We have the Tana, you see it right here. When it starts to decay, when it, what do you see? Turquoise. You'll see that, that material that'll, that'll oh, this isn't copper, this is, sorry. It's not my other one. But the copper, Tana, uh, shows wealth. Um, but also that's where the turquoise would come from. And there's a lot of other uh, materials that you can get them from plants, but also lots of rocks. So turquoise is around the eyes for a reason. It's, it's to encourage us to look to the future. So that's where I was going today, was black is the past and how it was then and what's going on now and what we're gonna do to the future. So I've given some suggestions to those things uh, time is short, and one thing that my brother, uh, Tommy Jimmy, that was here, was sharing about irreversible. When is the time, you know, the other day he was talking about the hippopotamus, first thing I was doing was like, hey, we need to get some up here, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, worrying about at a certain point that what happened here is, there's going to be some things that might not be irre irreversible. And that really worries me. We need to step up and we need to have our kids. I know our kids are, uh, I worked in the district. They're doing amazing, very smart, very intelligent. They have the ideas. We just have to, just like in the stories, that they have the answer. Us as uh, educators, we need to encourage them and push them more to their strengths. So I encourage that. And then of course, my, my uh, earlier we were talking about the Forest Service. I wanna thank them for everything they're doing. Uh, and I know it's not your fault that the, that the Forest Service and those things and the old history, we need to step aside for them, not to forget it, that those houses were burnt and those things were gone, but, we need to work together right now in the red and listen to each other, talk to each other, share our feelings with each other and come up with the conclusion that it's gonna strengthen our children and strengthen the future for them so that they're okay. Um, and I really, the data, we, I really like that. And I shared earlier, Globe uh, Observation, NOAA. I don't know if they, they're here too. Um, I did some classes with the envir environmental and they shared that with me. I think that would be really great to build more apps like that that we can have on, the, on there so that, that um, it's easier for us to, uh, as a, a person to help support the data entry. And the relationship between the fish and game needs to be more positive. I would hope that, that we can, um, some people, I was watching them the other day when I, uh, they came and asked me 
walked right up. He didn't even introduce himself, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not trying to start any trouble. But I sat back and watched. And even one gentleman to where he was like, oh, am I in trouble? What do I do? You know. So I was thinking that there should be a better relationship between the community and the fish and game. They shouldn't be looked at as a, being the law. Um, they should be coming more concerned on, hey, how'd you guys they go? You know, oh, can I check your, your license? Oh, you don't have one? Hang on. I got well, I got the papers in my, in my back pocket. Let me write you one out. You know, uh, a more of a service to the community and not um, bringing them to the dark. Data is, is the most important thing that we need right now. Uh, thank you very much, you guys. I appreciate your time. See you plus again. Oh, oh. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, any questions? Anybody? So really quickly, John, I just wanted to point out, thank you for your, your presentation. Greatly appreciate it. In regards to having the kids and the apps and, and all that stuff, that's something we're hoping to address in our guardians, uh, the work that we'll be doing in, in the future, but we'll have discussion on that tomorrow too. So uh, your input, uh, we appreciate you being a part of that too. Thank you. Thank you. I like what's going on here in the week once a month and then we meet like this on Zoom, seeing where we're all at, or even using a Google Drive rollover and that's how we communicate, then we can just scroll back. Maybe a thought for you guys. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Ellen Chenoweth, director of the Razor program of the University of Alaska. Uh, she is the Razor program mentoring students in environmental research. Welcome, Ellen. Um, hi, yes, my name is Ellen Chenoweth, and I'm going to talk today a little bit more about students and um, some exciting and I hope kind of inspiring work that they've been doing in um, several different communities around Southeast Alaska as part of the Razor program. So um, the Razor program. It is uh, the Rural Alaska Students in One Health Research Program, and it's a collaborative partnership between the University, the Sika Tribe of Alaska, and then the Cedar Network. So we have um, tribal mentors in different communities around the region working with our students. So um, I've lived in Sitka for 13 years, uh, but our program spans Tlingit, Haida, and Simshian lands and waters. And we hope that it's part of you know, a tradition of stewardship of these resources, bringing the youth in um, to the tribal environmental departments to help bring forward that work. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, just introducing the program. What are the students up to? How's it structured? How can students get involved in your community? Um, then I'm gonna talk about recruiting in your community. And then I'm going to bring up some mentors and we'll hear from them about how they've implemented the program in their communities in you know, different ways around the region. And then if we have time, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that we have in Razor. So we're actively recruiting community advisors, people that know their communities really well and can help us figure out the best way to reach out to students, um, the best ways to design projects that are going to be really interesting in the communities and just have another voice of support for students that's giving them um, some positive reinforcement and encouragement and curiosity about the work that they're doing. I'm also hiring for a communication specialist position in Sitka, so tell your friends, um, tell your Sitkin friends, I'd love a little bit more help. And then again, if we have time, I want to just talk a little bit more. This is a five-year grant. We're in year four right now. And so I would love to hear ideas about what we could do uh, with Razor in the future. So I'll, I'll kind of throw out some ideas and you can jump on them and tell me if those are good ideas or bad ideas or um, what I'm missing. So uh, we'd love to reapply for five more years of this program and to you know, use the first, the first four years as a starting place and then take it in a direction that um, 
the people in this room are excited about. All right, so again, RAZER stands for Rural Alaska Students in One Health Research, and it is a grant through the National Institutes of Health. So what's that health connection? How do we make that work with the CEDAR network? Um, well, it works really well because NIH has identified this idea of One Health through some of their zoonotic disease work where they're recognizing that human, animal, and environmental health are all interconnected. Um, which is, we you know, very consistent with indigenous ways of, of conceptualizing the environment for a very long time. But NIH is on board now as well. And so all of the research that our students do are within this framework of One Health. So our students are conducting environmental research projects with their mentors in community. And at the same time, they're taking courses and earning college credit and being able to both learn and actually practice those skills that they need to succeed in college going forward. So this is part of the team that um, is the administration of the program that came together to help design the program. And I'll focus a little bit just on my role in the program and then on Aurora's role as well. So Aurora is going to be our mentor coordinator. So she's kind of that first line of um, support for our mentors to make sure they have what they need to bounce ideas off of, to talk through, you know, different situations with students and how best to handle them. So we have somebody really dedicated just to support mentors so that if I get busy with students and I'm not checking in as much, um, there's somebody there who'll be checking in. And then my role is really to be the course instructor for the students. So. Through this program, we really want to give students their first positive college experience, and that means providing them with sort of unprecedented levels of support through the program. And what that looks like is I meet with students uh, individually several times during the year, um, but mostly I meet with them in very small community groups of one to five students twice a week, all spring semester long. And I'm able to just make sure that we're not miscommunicating, see how they're doing, figure out what's going on in there soccer teams and their volleyball teams and all this kind of stuff um, so that we can kind of catch any issues as they come up and keep students on track, keep them having a good time in the program, keep them from getting frustrated. But the real reason that RAZOR is a unique program is this partnership that we have between the university and um, our mentors in the CEDAR network. So, you know, while I'm working them through kind of the academic side of things, they're also getting a chance to go out in the field in their communities with their research mentors, get hands-on experience, have that personal connection. And so they're having their first research experiences, not in a university context, but in the context of their home communities. And we think this is really important in helping them connect their cultural identities and their individual identities and their personalities with this developing identity as scientists and as researchers. So here are some of the mentors that we've had working with us um, in just this past year. Um, so we have Miranda Hom, we have Shannon Isaacs and Craig, uh, Aurora Taylor and Sitka, Kim Wickman and Wrangell, Brandon Tinez in Petersburg, and Clay Helen Dangle in Sitka as well. Um, so we had a big group this last year. We had 17 students that went through the whole program. Um, so if you're a Razor mentor and you're not feeling too shy, would you raise your hand if you're or if you've mentored in a previous year and you're not on here, thank you very much. Awesome. Um, I just can't stress enough, like these are the people that are making the program work. They're the key to the program because of their patience, because of their creativity, because of their on the ground knowledge. I don't know every single community. Um, I can't know every community down to the logistics of students will turn their ankles if we try to get on this beach at this time of year. Um, and I don't know, the issues that are most important to different communities. So it's really, we try not to put the pressure of coming up with all the projects on the mentors, but in every case, the mentors have come up with stuff that's been really um, locally relevant. And we just try to figure out how to make that work for the course. All right, so um, who are the Razor students? So 100% of our students are in rural Southeast Alaska and about a third of them are Alaska Native. We work with freshmen through seniors and the whole year long program so far has just been sophomores through seniors. So we have kind of a little intro for freshmen and then they can get in the whole program after that. These are some of the communities that we've done outreach in um, or had full-time Razor students in. 
And I always like to point this out because um, we see a lot of maps that show kind of how big Alaska is compared to the, the East Coast. But I made this one for a trip to DC to explain the program and um, to show how big Southeast is compared to the East Coast. Um, and just remind us all of like the amazing work that the people who put this conference together are doing to bring us all together and um, how cool it is to work in an area that has so much land and so many resources. So another thing about our students is that they may or may not be oriented toward college. A lot of our students um, know what they wanna do. They're really excited to be marine scientists or they know they wanna to go to college, um, but we're also really eager to work with students that maybe aren't sure that college is right for them, but this is kind of a chance for them to try that out. And we really wanna get the word out about that so that we're working with a broad range of students. We think that we can serve a broad range of students. So why do our students do Razor? Um, they're curious about their marine environment. They want to do work right now that contributes to their communities. They're very motivated often to, to get in there and to help with some of these big climate change issues that they're very concerned about. Some of them are trying to decide if college is right for them. Some of them know college is right for them and they want to get in and be ready to go when that happens. Um, and others are looking at being really competitive for scholarships and other opportunities. And, and Razor can help with kind of that wide spectrum of, of academic preparation and interest. And this is a photo by Miranda. Miranda takes gorgeous portraits of our students. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through just what a year looks like for a Razor student so you can kind of get a sense of um, what they're doing um, in their communities. So we're recruiting right now for the program. We wanna get our students signed up by the end of September, and that's so that we have enough time to get their travel booked so that they can come to Sitka for Whale Fest at the beginning of November. Um, so we wanna get them started with their mentors as soon as possible, before it gets dark, before it gets cold, um, to start getting in some of those field hours and get used to what it's like to be out, out in the environment collecting information. Um, but once they come together in Sitka for Whale Fest, they get to meet each other, um, they get to, meet other scientists and um, travel a little bit. They get to do a tour of the lab. So that, that travel is a big uh, incentive and um, something that the students really enjoy about the program. And it's at that point where they've gone through their first one credit course that I meet with them individually and I say, how's it going? Are you enjoying the program? Are you totally stressed out? Do you want more? Let's talk about a plan for the spring. And then students can decide if they think a one credit, two credit, or three credit course is right for them. And we, we support them in that decision so that it's not overwhelming. Um, and what we found is that since we implemented this sort of check-in halfway through the program, 100% of our students have completed whatever they set out to do in spring semester. Um, so that means they've all gotten a C or better. We've had no withdrawals. The students all completed the program, which blows my mind and I don't expect that to be the case forever, um, but it's really, I think, important to be able to provide students with options that um, feel manageable to them and then support them through those options. So then they've got a, a online Zoom class. They meet with me twice a week. They go out with their mentors. They've decided on their research project at this point. They're collecting their data. And then as part of the class, I walk them through each step of how to prepare a research poster to present their results. And you're all welcome to come to their poster presentations, which usually occur in April. And they're a lot of fun. They're on Zoom. Um, it's awesome for the students to be able to present to scientists at the university and at NOAA, and also to their classmates and community members to have that connection over Zoom. It's something we started during the pandemic and we just kept it going because it was really important for the students. So after they're finished with the program, um, what do students go on to do? We've had a couple students who actually went to work for their local tribal and environmental departments. Our program provides stipends to the mentors to compensate the departments for their time. Um, sorry, the stipends go to the departments based on the amount of time that the mentors spend with the students. And so we've, I've heard of departments actually reinvesting that money into um, a salary for students to stay on in the summer and work, which is really exciting. I mean, we've had amazing support from the tribes in terms of youth and, and career development. So um, wonderful partners. And we've also had students present at the International One Health Conference. 
we've had students earn scholarships and continue research projects at uh, the university. Okay, so just to hear a few things from our students. Uh, this was a student in Petersburg who sent me this picture and it completely made my day and it makes me smile every time I see it. Um, but here's a, here's a quote from a student. The most surprising thing I learned with the RAZOR program is that scientists are really just human like the rest of us, which is, which is really good. Um, scientists should try to see more humans sometimes. Um, and then this is another quote. I really enjoyed the RAZOR program. I feel like it helped me put, helped put me on the right track of a career that I didn't even know I wanted at the time. It helped me figure out my decision, if I'm being honest. And to me, that just underscores that we're meeting these students at a time when they're really trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do. They're, they're just ready for an important experience like this to kind of give them a sense of direction. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is bring up some of our research mentors to talk about how they took this kind of framework of a program and applied it to their community and made it work in some different contexts. And is Miranda here? She was in demand this afternoon, so I was hoping she would make it. We might have to skip over her, and if, uh, if she runs in and she wants to, to talk in a few minutes, I will um, bring her up here. But um, if not, I'll come back and talk about her, her um, group a little bit. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to ask uh, Taylor to come up here, please. And Taylor's been a mentor for two years um, in Metlakatla. And I was really excited when Taylor took this job in Metlakatla because he, as he mentioned earlier, he's from Craig and his experience as someone young and excited about marine science and looking for students to connect with that were also excited about marine science had a big influence on me as I was developing this program. And so to be able to work with Taylor now in the um, in the capacity as a mentor has been a lot of fun. And so, um, yeah, Taylor, please tell us about your Razor students. Thank you, Ellen. Well, first of all, um, I've actually known Ellen since I was about 15 years old. So when I was in high school and she was a really good support back then. So she was cut out for this. It was meant to be. <laughs> anyway, I've been uh, living and working in Metlakala over the last two years, and I've had the opportunity to be a razor mentor. And something I like that Ellen brought up is that this is very much tailored to the communities that the students live in. Um, so when coming up with a project with these students um, seen here, uh, I just asked them about some of their observations that they've made in their community, because that tends to be a good place to start, right? See if there are any questions about what you're seeing and then, you know, investigate them. Well, this does kind of relate to earlier, but the students had talked about how in previous years, um, I believe 2018 and 2019, there had been a problem with uh, cruise ships basically dumping too close to the reserve and people were getting sick from it. There was evidence of this and the students were concerned. So I was trying to think of a way to tie this in somehow to uh, the Razor projects with which focus on analyzing shellfish, right? So we just kind of made it broad. And we said, okay, is there a difference between PST levels on the side of the island where there is cruise ship influence on that, like the side that isn't? It wasn't a causation, it was more of a correlation kind of question, but it got students to kind of think. Um, so this was a good way for the students to get experience with collecting data from the field, going out and like uh, digging up those clams, and then also creating graphics to just kind of, you know, show what they're seeing to present that data, and then to get experience with public speaking, even if over Zoom, to present that to a larger audience. So yeah, that's a really great thing about working in the RAZOR program is seeing those students, you know, come forward and then pursue what they're passionate about. Thank you, thanks so much, Taylor. Um, yeah, this was our, our second group from Metlakatla, and um, we're really looking forward to, I'll be going to Metlakatla later this month to try to um, get this other, this next group up on a running start. Um, but I'll move along to, oh, Taylor. <laughs> so do you want to talk about this? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'll just do a little introduction while I'm walking up here. Um, so I 3D scanned a dead humpback whale as a virtual 4D 
necropsy for students to participate in. And Taylor just ran with this idea and really wanted to make it as um, real as possible. So tell us how you did that. Thanks again, Evelyn. <laughs> So when I heard we were going to be doing a virtual whale necropsy for whale fest, I was like, okay, let's make this as cool as possible, right? So she already had a 3D scanned um, whale uh, in different stages of being necropsy that you can, you know, look at in order to get an idea of what you see. But having recently done like a couple of whale necropsies, I was thinking, you know, you don't really get that sliminess and you don't, I mean, you don't understand um, simply from looking at pictures, like some of the difficulties you might face in the field, like having to put on multiple pairs of gloves on top of each other, because taking them off and putting on another one is just too much of a task when you're all slicked up with like blood and, you know, blubber and stuff like that. So um, what I did was I got some paper towels and I got them wet in a bucket of water and then covered them on top of that with like some joy soap and had the students like practice, you know, putting on their gloves and how somebody would need to hold open the tin foil or the plastic baggie while someone else placed the blubber sample in there, you know, the wet paper towel. And it got the students to kind of learn about um, handling those biological samples in the field and a little bit of some of the things you might run into along the way. Okay. Yeah, and they love taping each other into plastic bags. All right, so uh, Aurora, if you're available, do you want to come up and talk a little? Sorry, <laughs> talk a little bit about your students. So Aurora was a first-time mentor last year, and she's going to be coordinating the mentors this year. So I think it would be really good that you've been in their shoes. Um, but yeah, talk about Carl and Kelsey. Yeah, hi. Um, so with my first year as a Razor mentor, um, I was a little nervous because um, I don't really work with high school students very much. Um, outreach is kind of beyond the scope of my job, um, and I didn't know what high schoolers like, and it turns out they don't like puns, and they don't like dad jokes. Um, they like to do Star Wars, <laughs> and it turns out we're on episode nine now, so uh, they keep me young, which is good. Um, I had a little bit of a different approach than Taylor, uh, where I'm a fishery biologist, so I didn't have like the most field work for them, and I really wanted them to have a good time and get exposure to like hands-on outdoor research. Uh, so I approached it by partnering with um, with some other mentors, and I got to get really close uh, with Helen in my community and really like learn about her job. Uh, she taught me a bunch of different new protocols. Um, we did marine debris surveys in the fall. We did a uh, microplastics lab. We kind of did like a smorgasbord of science in the fall. Um, and then I really needed help with the backlog of samples I had for an external um, shellfish aging project. Uh, so I kind of guided them towards that uh, measure project, and it was really cool to see how their minds worked. Um, they wanted to take it in like a COVID direction, which I um, did not expect, because um, they view harvesting shellfish as a social activity, uh, which is interesting. And I had a lot of fun with them. Um, for Kelsey, uh, she ended up doing a creative project and the poster. Uh, we went on Raven Radio and did um, a short talk about our research there. Um, and Carl ended up becoming our summer intern. Um, and he's at UAA now, and he plans to come back in the fall or in the next summer um, and work for us at our field camp. So it was a really great experience um, to watch these students grow and like learn how their minds work. Um, and there was talk about, you know, recruitment issues. It's a really great way to like find local minds in your community and get them involved. Um, I liked it so much. I'm going to be coming back as the mentor coordinator. So if you are a mentor or thinking about being a mentor, you'll get to hear my puns all year and it'll be super fun. Um, so thanks, Ella. Thanks, Aurora. All right. I think we can maybe get us back on track a little bit if I zip through these. So um, we've got all of our student poster presentations on our website. If you want to go straight to the Razor website, I swear I'm going to update it soon so it doesn't say student presentations will be next week um, because they're in April. Um, but you can learn how to become a Razor student, how to become a community advisor there. You can, like I said, view all of their posters, watch their presentations. And um, again, like, it would be awesome to have lots of people attend their presentations next um, April. 
Again, I'm hiring. You can apply uh, for this position at the University of Alaska Southeast um, site. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, just I like to kind of throw ideas out there and if they're bad, people tell me they're bad and then I get more ideas than if I just say, how should I run my program? Uh, so if these are bad ideas, let me know. But a, a few things that I've been thinking about for the future of Razor um, is getting a, a bit of a data course going, maybe for second year Razor students, we get a lot of juniors in the program. So maybe having a one credit um, course for students where we get dig a little bit more into Excel talk about data some more, talk about how data can be misleading, talk about what it's good for, um, how to outsmart your data <laughs> and not let it fool you. And um, so I think that would be a really fun course to develop for students. And um, I'm hoping it would be something that would be really useful for the environmental departments to have students come in that have a little bit of experience with Excel and a little bit of experience with data. I've also heard that a summer course might be um, helpful for communities that have um, summer activities for high school students that they could kind of plug in and have a course then as well. So that's something we can consider. And then my personal pet idea is that we bring in some younger students to help collect some data, maybe do a shellfish derby, look for the biggest shellfish, the smallest, the most different species, something like that. Um, and then get Razor students to develop a poster with all that information so that the students can see their own data points on these posters and try to make that connection that I find really valuable in Razor where students actually see their data on a graph and then look at a trend and understand how you go from making an observation or a measurement to actually being able to say something about your environment and draw a conclusion. And that seems like a really critical piece. And I'd like to try to bring that in a little bit earlier in the schools as well. If you're interested in learning more about the virtual 3D or 4D whale necropsy, uh, there's this code that you can scan for that as well. And it's available at the University of Alaska Southeast's website. And then finally, just uh, this is our first Razor group. And I always like to give them credit because they bore with me when um, we were still figuring this out. And they're as much uh, to blame or to credit for the development of this program as anybody else. Um, so thank you to this, our first group of Razor students. And if you have questions for me, uh, I'd like to take them or I can back off the mic. Thanks. All right. Okay, I'll be around for the Cedar Network um, workshop to talk a little bit more about um, just an orientation for people who are interested in mentoring. So um, come find me on Friday. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. All right, day three. Um, first of all, I'd like to give a round of applause to everyone here and thanks for being here again for day three. So thanks so much everyone for the energy. I'd like to give a huge shout out to uh, our partner tribes who came today and in with us. We have Liz Borman, of course, from this morning, and then Carol Fletcher. Carol Fletcher, yeah, in the back. I was like, Carol, yeah, Carol Fletcher in the back. Thank you so much. All right, so um, this, the end of day three is going to be a little bit funny. So we have what we're calling a special session. And what that is is Aurora Taylor with the Secret Tribe of Alaska is going to be sharing some results from the Shelton Biomass Survey that many, many of the senior partners have been doing. Um, over the last few years. Everyone is absolutely 100% welcome to stay. We do anticipate going over that 4.30 mark that we sort of had earmarked to end each day. So I would like folks who have other plans, they need to get home, take care of some business. This would be a great opportunity to gather your stuff and head out if you need to. With that being said, uh, I got staff, Cedar Partners, we really, really would like you to stay. Aurora's got some handouts to give to you, some flash drives with some of your data, some maps. So I got staff, senior partners, uh, please, please stay um, for that. So what we're gonna do is Lindsay in the back is gonna end the day with a couple of raffles. Once we have those raffle, raffles done, we'll give about five minutes for folks who need to get out of here to grab their stuff, they can be on their way. And then we are gonna ask Cedar staff um, if you don't mind, if you would, wouldn't mind coming up to the first couple of tables, we're hoping to have a little bit more of that round robin discussion, and it will be difficult if we're all the way back distributed among all the tables. So Lindsay's going to end the day with some raffles. We'll have about a five minute break, and then we're going to do that special session on the selfish biomass results. So again, thank you so much.
Uh, go out, grab some food, rest up because Guardian Day is tomorrow. We're going to need a lot of energy for that. We're really looking for a lot of input, a lot of ideas. Um, so tomorrow morning is a more of a listening day, and then tomorrow afternoon is this big sharing day for four folks. So I got staff, bring your e uh, because we're, we're diving in hard tomorrow. So thank you again, and Lindsay, wrap up, please. All right, we're going to draw three tickets. Two. Morgan Shy, still online? I don't see her. So we'll go to another one. Another online. Don Jackson. I don't see them either. <laughs> Six two eight zero three nine three. Nobody. All right, we'll draw again. This one's in here. Right Six. Here. Oh, I think zero three nine three. Yeah. All right. You can come over here and choose something from Tia. All right, the next one is 6280398. Anybody? All right, moving on. 6280366. All right. Next one is 6280379. Anybody? Okay, moving on. <laughs> Had one winner. 6280394. I know a lot of people left, but wow. All right, here's one online. Catherine Tucker, are you still online? Nope. <laughs> 6280401. Anybody? Take it longer than we thought. Six two eight zero three seven four. Yay, Val! <laughs> hey, one more. Six two eight zero four three nine. No. Aaron Cook, are you still online? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be present. Six two eight zero four zero eight. Yay! All right, there's our three. All right, five minutes, everybody, and then Cedar Partners be back up front. Yeah, thank you. And again, everyone is, of course, welcome to stay, but we want to respect your time on that 4.30 time. So if you need to head out, no worries. Oh. No one's going to be here for C4. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take to do uh, about 30. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. But one of them is the 
Also, last chance for food. So, if you guys want to grab some snacks, they're going to start cleaning up in about 10 minutes.
Hey everyone, so before we get started, I'd just like to call up one representative um, from our participating partner tribes in the 2020 or the 2021 shellfish biomass surveys. Um, I have some handouts for you so you can follow along with your data. So if we could get someone from um, Sika Tribe, Huna Indian Association, Klinka and Haida, um, and Kloa. We'll begin in just a few minutes. Uh, you don't have to. We can do it on a just so you know we do have a right. Huh? That's those extensions. And not I know. I look now two masks. Um, what about what about the you can do? Um, I thought yep. And then also, all right, the then we're going to set up another service at the stage. Um, I'm going to say the same thing. Right. Just like we did Saturday. But when you bet, they they decided to pull it on each side two more rows. And it's good thing she did that because a lot of them have to tune it up. Yeah, after. But I um Priscilla and I have to sit out all the lot watchers. Okay, I'll leave the bacon some more soon. Thanks. And then I think I have to really step in the front of my party. Hey, do you ever get paid yet? No. Oh, that's all. Well, I always have snacks and a closet and that box to put bars to. Oh, Oh, They have a thing of fish, dark fish, and that's all the small ones. Because they're very real. Can't too much. Uh, yeah, I don't feel like the right thing. Yeah. Then so you have to get up the ground and Oh. Okay. Yep. All right, everyone, I think we're ready to get started. Um, so thanks for attending this special session. Um, the format for today's presentation is we're going to do a brief uh, 10 to 15 minute overview of the project. We're going to get examples of what kind of analyses we're conducting. Um, and then we're going to transition into a facilitated round robin so I can get some feedback from you. Um, the shellfish biomass program is going to conclude in March of 2023. Um, so we're going to lose our funding. So while we still have our funding um, and are able to address this, I'd love to get your feedback um, so we can just transition really smoothly 
um, if you want to continue to do these surveys in your community. Um, I have it. Oh. Okay, this is me. Um, <laughs> it's great to meet you um, face to face. And I had a speech about myself prepared, but I will just tell you that I'm from South Central. Uh, there's a photo of me fishing um, out of Homer when I'm in middle school, and then me this spring um, on my boat in Sitka. And basically what you need to know about me is that uh, last night I was so excited for this awesome conference that I washed my clothes. So you guys wouldn't think I'm smelly and I washed my presentation USB in those clothes. So I'm back to the office at like 7 p.m., redid it. And that basically sums me up pretty well, so. So what about shellfish biomass? Um, I kind of did this mind map to just explain what it is to me, but you partners are already probably pretty familiar. Um, so this is a two-year program that began in 2018 and was renewed in 2020. Uh, because of COVID, we were given a one-year no-cost extension. Uh, so the program is gonna be concluding in March of 2023. Um, so I'm trying to get all the gears nice and greased so we can transition out of losing our TWG funding. Um, we're looking at shellfish biomass. So we're doing length and weight of all the clams that we find on subsistence beaches. Um, and it's really, I think, at the center of this program is the partnership. What I love about this is it connects me with CTOR. Um, and it's really you who are on the ground digging these holes and getting involved in doing this research. Um, so you should have a copy of your results for 2020 and 2021 in front of you. So we're just going to do um, an example, kind of a quick walkthrough of what kind of results we're looking at. But first, um, I think numbers are fun. So I quantified some of our successes over the last two years. Um, we did a total of 12 early mornings for these shellfish biomass surveys. Uh, we dug 400 holes across Southeast Alaska and Kodiak, and we identified, measured, and weighed over 4,000 plants. Uh, how did we do it? This is a brief overview of our methods. We use controlled chaos to dig transects uh, perpendicular to the low tide line, and we do a two square foot pod drag where we excavate every clam in that hole. We're identifying, measuring, and weighing it. And the angle here is to get the biomass of the beach. So this is kind of our end uh, goal is this biomass heat map where we're trying to see what's on the beach, quantify how much there is, and where it is. To break things out a little bit more by species, we also do abundance distribution maps uh, where we're not looking at the length or the weight. So we're not looking at the biomass, we're just looking at the count, so the frequency of species. Just to give us an idea, um, earlier today we were talking about how cockles make like fresh water more. So this is just a way that we have to do um, kind of a first step simple analysis to look at uh, what species are where on your beaches. And then uh, getting into Excel, which is what I do all winter long. Um, we do allometric length weight growth curves. Uh, so you might notice here that some of our graphs have orange curves um, and some don't. And that is because we have a target sample size of 100 clams per beach. And, and that's just to get us a good enough confidence interval. So um, on beaches where we don't reach that target of 100 samples, instead we do a regression. Um, and I would be happy offline to walk through any of your results with you if you have questions about um, where these curves come from and how I got this. So to quantify those clusters that we just looked at, we also do histograms that look at length frequency distribution. And here we have a lot of numbers, um, but this is just to kind of show you the biomass. So we look at total kilograms and we look at density um, by species for the beach. Um, it's a lot of numbers that you can get. There really is a lot of data that you can pull in um, an early morning and about a half day of digging lots of holes in the mud. Um, so this is an example of what that looks like. We also do age, um, and this is was my razor project, which we just talked about. Um, and I think it's really cool because there's potential to grow this. Um, I think what would be amazing is to start to measure the clams that we've aged and then to come up with a predicted age curve. So in future studies, you wouldn't have to bother with those scales and then getting soaking wet and being inaccurate. 
and you wouldn't have to age your clams. You could just use calipers and based on length, we could get age, weight, and biomass data. That's site specific, which is important because being in the Southeast and in Kodiak, we have huge changes in latitude. And then we really see a lot of different sizes and a lot of different growth rates. Uh, so this would be a site specific tool to really simplify future research. Uh, we're just using calipers and by just identifying and measuring, you could get all the same data we've been collecting. Um, so some super preliminary trends about what we have been seeing or what we might see, um, a shift in hotspot. So here we have a kind of left to right, top to bottom chronological progression um, from Kowak where they've been doing surveys every year. Um, and so we see some changes. We see uh, the hotspot going from really high tide close to that tree line shifting down. We saw the emergence of two hotspots. Um, so a lot of this is gonna vary based on where we are and the full results are gonna be available in the final report that's gonna be published in March. Um, another thing we are seeing and we might continue to see um, are changes on the beach itself. So we experienced this in Sitka and Huna did as well. Um, and the base map doesn't reflect that, but basically there was a high precipitation event and it completely changed the stream and it flooded them out. And so it's really hard to dig a hole and get all the clams out of it when it's underwater. Um, it's actually impossible. Go for it, Jeremy. So we are off the ground with early drop that for the cancer. Essentially, early is not most of it is not really And the same thing with um, echo basically another the same day, it's not the quality about it. And the data is quite cheap and it's working higher than yeah, that's pretty crazy when you're looking at like a three or four foot difference and you're a largely sessile clam that just has one foot to hop around in the mud. Where you are in the mud really makes quite a big difference. Um, and so thinking about climate change and precipitation change and erosion, um, these things could look really different going into the future. So we mentioned the program closing, but I wanted to communicate with you um, very clearly what my timeline is and my expectations for getting you your data and your results. I anticipate it'll be similar to last year um, where I will be soliciting your data sheets right now. Hello, it's me sending your data sheets from 2022. Um, and I'll be reaching out in mid-September to bug you even more. And then I will start working in Excel and doing those allometric growth curves and those histograms and those predicted weights and ages. And then I anticipate getting you those results before Christmas. And then after the new year, I kind of transition into GIS world where I start to make maps um, and I will get you those by March. Um, so with that, I would take questions, comments, or concerns, and then um, we can sit down and chat specifics about your individual beaches, um, about what it is you would like to get out of this program before it closes, um, and how you would like it to look. So any questions before we close? And I'm Mike Draw. I'm not going to do it, but thanks for gassing me up, Jeremy. Um, oh, also, I have some uh, printed prompts, uh, which I passed out to partners already who have results from last year, but I have lots of copies of um, the round robin prompts we're going to be going over, and I also have some hard copy feedback cards. If um, you feel really strongly about something or you don't get to speak today, um, you can fill one of these out and give it to me, and I'll follow up with you. Thanks. Thank you, Aurora. Um, yeah, I think that's anything else. Well, just opening up the, the floor for discussion or any. Uh... Uh,
big circle around the face. It's not too bad. Now is the time to decide if we're going to yell at each other or if we're going to like toss the mic football style. Do we? That'd be nice. Did everyone who um, needed or wanted some prompts in front of them get one? I have a couple nods and a couple blank stares. It's perfect. So I feel all the time. Um, okay, so maybe we just start with like a show of hands. Who's done a sheltered biomass before? <laughs> wow, cool. Who's done two? Who's done three? Who's done four? You want to tell us about your beach? Yeah. <laughs> How many days does it take you? <laughs> um, what like what what kind of species do you see? What's your most prominent species, maybe? Oh, cool. We don't have those. So um, anyone else want to talk about? Yes. You have five years? Whoa. Oh, oh no, no, I ID it. We were like, this is the weirdest looking horse clam I ever saw. And I was like, that's not a horse clam. <laughs> yeah. Do the, do the people in Huna know about? They're all like on the inn on where the clams are. Also, of course, I was very confident. It really had good 
Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Anybody else have big changes like that they've noticed over the years? You want to share? Well, okay, does anyone want to share their favorite memory from a shellfish biomass survey or the craziest thing that you found while doing one? Like 
shit pile, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my favorite one was the smaller heavy one that the easy to eat one. The scale scale has failed on it a couple times, so it doesn't have a very good quality. You have two. I just like to stick up on the wall to see if I can stay up. Maybe if I just find this one that's been away from the scale, that's the few I predicted first. Because now we have like four units of data, five. That's like four people talk on that. I thought I had a year 
going to be better than the children. I could not measure in the way butter is to get focus on measuring in the way that it's better than the cost of it. Yeah, you have to talk about And then we can do some like transitioning things out of my little house into yours, like pull out aging protocol. You know, do you have excess time and like do you want to know how we can plan some of our training on that and protocol? Or like if you ask how we do the witness waiting, anything like that that you are interested in. Well, which is like, we're going to do the same, we're a little different. 
And the state regulations have been on that the officers. The bill brought to the sale across the Any other whisperings of using the data ideas? Yeah. Like, like the cram garden or something like that? Yeah, but a lot of things are a lot of things that we can't do with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it would be useful to get that. Whether even a new garden site for this route would be useful. The lack of the green stuff that our habitat is great. We might want to be able to fill it in people. There was an agriculture push. A lot of it's geared towards commercial and it's just to be doing it. So I think that's another encouragement. Have to monitor the program and do it. Program is dead. It's kind of like, why don't we're not? We had to dig and recheck and see what's going on with the population. It's still pretty visual. Do something like that, just check in to check the building. So I think it's interesting. 
So we can have this as an upper bird habitat that we did the first already, or is that it's correlated back to substrate habitat with the deep water? So then I'll take you guys like, what's the substrate like? Some of you guys have really fancy, some of you have super cobbly, ours is more cobbly, but I'm really surprised that someone could be here. And I see plants on the beaches that look like dead rocks. So, uh, yeah. So crazy. Even collecting the surface of a subsurface substrate that's not like diameter. Okay. Do these mud still gravel sand cobble? And okay. if they do have that species that still is disturbing, if they have not been degraded. But technically, yeah, this study is called the selfish population and habitat. Um, and the habitat portion, I'm like, it is more Yeah, 